So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto left a leaf and became a god like Shinobi. Part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And if you want to part 2. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 1. Luck and fear change the world. One tiny little change. It is often said, for the want of a nail, the battle could be lost. While overly simplistic, this particular nugget of truth was surprisingly accurate. For example, Didori, Rasengan. We have all seen this battle once or 1000 times. Naruto, hopped up on demonic chakra, faces an evil Sasuke with wings. Naruto, not wanting to actually hurt the first one he saw as a brother, aims high, while the crazy Sharingan user aims low seeking a death blow. This perfect moment of understanding between two orphans. Brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? Now, watch what happens if Naruto's aim slips just a little bit. A-R-G-H-H. The pain was incredible. Demonic chakra was tearing him apart, ripping his muscles and organs into shreds. But if he held back, even for an instant, Sasuke's strike would. Would kill him. He couldn't die, he wouldn't die just yet. Suddenly, Naruto's focus, which had been concentrated on the first perfect Rasengan he had ever formed fighting Sasuke's Black Chidori, seemed to expand, causing him to notice the hand-like wings that Sasuke's curse mark had generated. Wings that, if hit, just so, would. Sasuke. Naruto cried out. Aiming high, not for the forehead protector which would have disproved Sasuke's taunts earlier, but for that monstrous left wing. The Rasengan, infused with demonic chakra and Naruto's willpower, shredded the offending appendage, sending the Achiha rocketing downward with the force of a meteor. Dodori, aiming for his center mass, instead nearly took out half the muscles in Naruto's right arm. Crying out in pain, both Jenin fell, their destinies now left in the hands of fate. And a lazy Jonin who happened to be on time for once, if only barely. Seeing his two students, Kakashi nearly wept with joy. They were both still alive. These two were among the first people he had started to care for in years. He couldn't lose them now. Looking over their respective injuries, however, the dog summoner winced. The impact had badly dazed the Achiha, who had a nasty burn festering on his back. The Kakashi's sorrow, the containment seal for the cursed mark was also badly damaged. But Naruto. If it wasn't for his demonic healing and Lady Tsunade, this sort of wound could end a ninja's career. Half of the muscles in his bicep were clearly seared off and the blood was beginning to pool badly. Shaking his head in remorse, Kakashi formed a shadow clone and grabbed his two wayward students, starting back for Konoha. Phasing out of the ground, Zetsu smirked collectively. Isn't that interesting? Kakashi, running as quickly as possible through the trees, was coming upon an uncomfortable conclusion. Naruto might not survive the trip back. Clearly, the battle had drained all of his chakra, but the lack of demonic healing was even more worrisome. The one-eyed ninja had even begun to believe that the kid might become immortal at his current rate of growth. Unfortunately, the lowered blood pressure and body temperature seemed to counteract such claims. How could he look at himself in the mirror as a sensei if his personal technique ended the poor boy's life? Luckily for the brooding man, help had arrived. Yonin Kakashi. What is the status of Jenin's Yuzumaki Naruto and Ichiha Sasuke? Sighing in contentment, Sanadi headed out to inform the interested parties about Joji's survival. That Nara medicine book had been a godsend, saving her precious time and effort in re-stabilizing the poor boy's metabolism and biosystem. Hopefully with a few weeks of recovery and three days of solid bed rest, he'd be fit as a fiddle for active duty. Seeing the nervous Chunin chatting with the Suna wind mistress, a small smirk came to her lips. Ah, young flirting. Humming to attention, Shikamaru started to speak, only to be cut off by the Hokage. Don't worry Shikamaru, Choji will be fine. Kiba and Akamaru are in recovery, and I am waiting to hear from Shizun about Niji. Lady Tsunade. Looking over at her brunette apprentice, the Hokage curled an eyebrow, yes Shizun. Smiling, the exhausted medic ninja gave a weary thumb up. Ayuga Niji is out of surgery. According to our examinations, the cellular graft is holding, and he should make a full recovery. Smiling at the additional good news, Blondie was about to ask for more information when one of the field medics that she had dispatched after the Suna ninja ran over, frantic. Okage-sama, we need you now. A level 3 critical wound, with nearly one and a half hours of duration, is in need of treatment. Eyes widening, Sanadi ran after the man, followed by a weary Shizun, who managed to survive a wound that bad for over an hour. Not even pausing, the man replied Jenin Yuzumaki Naruto in the process of successfully apprehending Jenin Ichiha Sasuke. The man was lucky to dodge out of the way as the two medics suddenly tripled in speed. Seeing the boy in Kakashi's arms, blood seeping out of a makeshift bandage and pooling beneath a man, Sanadi snapped out orders like a machine gun. Get him into her too. 
I want Team Theta and Team Quattro's available for cellular regeneration surgery, stat. Shizun. You have just completed a level 2 regeneration surgery and are unfit for another so soon. Look after the Achiha, patch him up if you can, and get that bastard Jureya down here. I am going to want this punk's chakra sealed within the next two hours. Move it. Running to complete their duties, no one bothered to see the sorrow in Kakashi's lone eye. Abito. I have truly failed you. Now one would think that this would be the beginning of a happy ending, nah? Not if the Council of Advisors had anything to say about it. Amura, Kaharu and Danzu had been a part of the Kanoha infrastructure for a long time and as such, controlled numerous aspects of the military and civilian cultures within the village. And with the third Hokage gone, the one man who knew their methods and minds unlike anyone else, they had been able to gather an unprecedented amount of control. Not that the fifth had realized that just yet. Sighing, Hamura palmed his face in frustration. This development could be cataclysmic for our village. Nodding her head in agreement, Kaharu patted her old friend on the back. We were hoping that the Achiha clan would be removed completely, besides Itachi, and restarted as loyal to the village. Instead, that fool allowed his brother to escape, making the brat the symbol of the Achiha image within Kanoha. This defection will permanently tarnish the clan and might bring Itachi's wrath upon our heads. Anzu smirked, tapping his cane thoughtfully. But the truth is, the container managed to defeat the Achiha, showing that his potential as a weapon is there for the taking. If properly trained, he could be our ace against Itachi's vengeance. Snorting, Kaharu shook her head. That weakling beat Itachi. There is no way that such a loser of a ninja could possibly defeat the strongest Achiha in decades, probably since Madara. Looking over his mission reports and general performance, the Kayubi Chakra is the only thing pushing him forward. Something that the strongest of the Achiha clan counter, which we must assume Itachi qualifies as. Amura looked uncertain. I am not so sure. There are indicators that his education was hindered by elements in the academy. Perhaps with proper tutoring. Glaring at her old comrade, Kahara rebutted easily. That would take time that we do not have. No matter what he has suffered, Yuzumaki Naruto became a necessary scapegoat and sacrifice to appease the masses of Konoha. Making him a scapegoat here might buy us some time. This time Danzu snorted, it won't be that easy. In Yuzuka, Nara, Yamanaka, Akamichi, Hayuga, all of these clans are beginning to show interest in the boy. Not to mention the last two loyal Sanin. If we simply try to make him the scapegoat of the Ichiha's injuries or some rubbish like that the clan heirs might bring him needed political, if not popular, support. That sort of division is not something that Kanoha needs, especially after the attack from Arachimaru. The Haru sighed, spreading her hands in defeat. Then what would you suggest? About to continue the debate, Danzo was interrupted by the appearance of a loyal supporter. What is Sai? Face covered with a blank mask, the young root member held forward a scroll to his master. A missive from the capital, Danzu-sama. Taking the scroll and dismissing the boy, Danzu reviewed its contents. And smirked. Looking at his compatriots, Danzu asked a question that would change the face of Kanoha forever. That last report from Jureya said something about Akatsuki, did it not? She waited in front of the exam room, eyes red from crying. Aruno Sakura was having a major internal struggle. On one hand, she had loved Sasuke for years. Giving up friendship, self-respect and, in some cases, human decency to express this. Luckily, she had started calming down in recent months from training with her crush and fighting difficult odds as a real shinobi. However, her love had disabled her and fled, betraying her and the village. Sasuke had been her focus for so long that Sakura had also offered to betray everything that she had worked for and treasured just to go along with him. On the other hand, she had Naruto. No one had really liked the kid growing up. Parents had told their children or any child really to avoid him since they were young. His constant fighting for her affection had stretched Sakura's last nerve and made her loathe his existence. And yet, Naruto, for all his loud boasts and annoyance, always seemed to protect his friends, fighting for them with everything that he had. Finding out that he had defeated Gara instead of Sasuke really shouldn't have surprised her as much as it did. Naruto loved her, well Sasuke did not, but he was willing to fight with everything he had to ensure the Ichiha's return. And it had nearly gotten him killed. Sakura had been lucky enough to see Naruto and Sasuke being brought into the hospital as she waited for information on the mission. She had seen the damage to Sasuke's back and had nearly screamed. Until she saw Naruto. Cut, bleeding Naruto who wanted to be Hokage with all of his heart, missing a chunk of his right arm. It hurt to know that without his feelings for her, Naruto might not have fought as hard or as long. He might not have defeated Sasuke at such a horrible price. So Sakura sat and wept, waiting for word on her teammates. Wondering what she could say to Naruto to make his sacrifice worth some puppy love for a pathetic fangirl. Sakura. Looking up, she tried to stop her tears, but couldn't quite manage it. Giving up, Sakura smiled ironically. Hey Ino. Are you sure of this? Anzu smirked at Hamura, reveling in the feeling of power. Positive. 
When Jiraiya and the container returned with Sanadi and Shizun, only an idiot would have missed their feelings for the brat. I just took the precaution of planning ahead for this sort of eventuality. The daimyo was kind enough to understand the situation and will support our removal of a ninja from the ranks over Tsunade's protests for the good of Konoha as a whole. Once removed from the protection of the military, we can have him killed without major consequence to the village. Seeing this, Tsunade will be left with no other recourse but to banish him. Nodding her head in agreement, Kaharu smiled lightly. Banishment can be released later if we decide that his power is needed. However, one child wandering the countryside will make a much better target than Konoha proper. We know that the Akatsuki won't need the Kayubi for another three years. But if Yuzumaki leaves the village, that will force them to waste time and resources to find him. Resources that they, and more importantly Itachi, cannot use against us. Amura sighed, although he also shared a small grin. It is too bad about the fact that even if he was accepted back, Yuzumaki would remain simply a genin of Konoha. Advancement in three years without any major training would be nearly impossible and would put him in our power for a long time. It's not like the little fool could maintain a proper training program alone and on the run. Shaking her head in amusement, Kaharu sighed, as if the little idiot was ever actually going to become Hokage. Ha, what a simpleton. Shrugging, Danzu visibly savored the feelings of control. We'll just wait until Tsunade finishes her surgery. By then, her exhaustion and lack of information will ensure the maximum possibility of success. After all, what could she do with no warning and no immediate major political allies? Even the clans will hesitate to reject the will of the daimyo and never for one little boy. Ayuga Hinata ran, concerned about filling her every step and worried about her every thought. Three of the people closest to her had been hurt. Hiba, Niji, and Naruto had all gone on a major retrieval mission, but the reports that father had received worried her greatly. The opposing forces, rumored to have been instrumental in the third Hokage's death, were protecting the Achiha from any attempt at recovery. These were her friends out there, facing ninja of much greater rank and experience. Hinata had to find out if they were okay. Although the crying Sakura being comforted by Ino was not filling her with confidence. Sighing, Sanadi savored her sake while letting her bones settle and relax after a harrowing afternoon. That kid continued to surprise her. The cellular regeneration surgery had been difficult. While in a more vital location, Niji's injury was significantly smaller and cleaner. Naruto's arm was made of fused flesh, burned away with lightning and bleeding from several major arteries. An extremely delicate operation and almost impossible to complete. Luckily, Naruto embodied the impossible. Once he recovered his power, Naruto's own naturally rapid regeneration should make up the difference. Apparently, healing one Chidori to the chest had maxed out most of his reserves. It was the secondary follow-up scan that concerned her. In several places, especially around the skull and neck, blockages appeared to have formed in a uniform pattern. When examined with a surface scan, nothing came up. But a more intrusive deep tissue scan, common in post-operative situations, had better results. It seemed that the stomach was not the only place that Naruto had seals in place. Someone or someone's had, over the course of years it appeared, placed several seals to block the kid's development. Jiraiya was still going over the construction of the Matrix, but several different styles and patterns were in place. Some could easily be broken, others would break down naturally, more would require real effort, but in the end all would be removed. Cataloging them was taking time, but the signatures seemed stable enough to trace. Especially the faint Hayuga style emblem in the left bicep. Or the one that seemed to have Siratobi sensei's signature in the right leg. Staring into the depths of her cup, the Hokage had to wonder. How many people heard you boasting about Naruto and feared instead of laughed? Hokage-sama. Looking up at the chunin that was replacing Shizun for the afternoon until her recovery was complete, Tsunade narrowed her eyes in irritation. Yes, what is it? Bowing quickly to break eye contact, the young man shifted nervously. The honorable counselors are here to see you. Sighing, Sanadi wondered again what she was high on when accepting this job. He was quiet. Sakura, Hinata, and Ino shared that thought in eerie cinch. Naruto was recovering in the hospital bed, bandages wrapped around each limb and torso. His breathing was shallow, his heartbeat was slow, and his eyes were twitching rapidly. The sneaky blonde had been silent and still longer than at any other time within their collective memories. Something that scared the group more than they cared to admit. Sasuke. Sasuke wasn't worth this. Looking at Sakura in surprise, Ino tried to keep her voice down. It seemed wrong to shout right now. Sakura. What are you talking about? Shaking her head, she fraught off her tears once more. Sasuke. Betrayed everyone. Konoha, Kakashi Sensei, Naruto, me. He wasn't worth Naruto getting hurt so badly. Holding her head between her hands in frustration, Sakura suddenly felt drained. Even if I don't love him, Naruto deserves better than this. And if his promise to me resulted in any part of these injuries, how can I forgive myself for asking for his strength? 
looking at the girl in front of her, Hinata knew she should be furious. The little, spoiled brat had begged Naruto to bring Sasuke back and could be considered responsible for a lot of his pain. She had hit him, yelled at him, and used him, but Hinata pulled her into a hug. If she cried for Naruto, Sakura couldn't be all that bad. What is the meaning of this? Glaring down at the two old farts in front of her, Tsunade had to focus her temper carefully. One false move and the honorable counselors would become blood stains on the floor. We are giving you an option, Tsunade. Either banish Yuzumaki Naruto or we will have him eliminated. Eye twitching, Tsunade reminded herself to have the standards of mental health evaluations revised shortly. Clearly, these two had gone senile. On what charge? And I swear if you say injuring that little traitor. Shaking her head at the impertinence, Kaharu decided to cut to the chase. Actually, this is for the good of Konoha. Taking up where his partner had left off, Hamura stared down the angry Sanin calmly, but the successful retrieval of Ichiha Sasuke, we will continue to have resources tied up in countering Orochimaru's efforts to capture the boy. Although killing him would make our lives easier, Sasuke represents too much genetic potential to simply eliminate. Even stripped of his shinobi status, the Sharingan must remain in Konoha. Taking up a slack, Kaharu braved Tsunade's climbing temper. However, with the advent of Akatsuki, a second force that makes Rachimaru seem minor has come forth. They have already successfully infiltrated the village once, and we lack the resources to protect both elements. Clearly, we must take the path of least resistance. Rubbing her head in irritation, Tsunade promised to make that revision soon. And sending Naruto into the jaws of Akatsuki, fulfilling their objectives is better for Konoha, how exactly? Shrugging, Kaharu answered with ease. By dividing our enemies instead of unifying them. Orochimaru will obsess over the Achiha, concentrating his attention here where we can deflect his efforts. However, Akatsuki will not need the Kayubi for nearly three years. Years that they will waste resources searching for one boy in the elemental countries. Orochimaru shouldn't waste effort on Yuzumaki due to fear of Akatsuki reprisal, so Naruto can wander freely, drawing their gaze from our walls. Amura broke in, hoping to leave in one piece. Now we can release the banishment later, but with Yuzumaki out of the village, we have time and energy to rebuild and regroup. It really is for the best. Smash, although stoic, it took their many years of training not to flinch at the atomized remnants of the Hokage's desk. So that's it. We just throw him away and destroy his career because it is convenient is that how Kanoha Ninja treat their comrades. Rolling her eyes at the dramatics, Kaharu sighed. Except that Yuzumaki is not just a ninja, he is a Jinchuriki and as such, he is Kanoha's sacrifice. Maybe we can spare some minor assets to reimburse him later, but Kanoha is worth more than the efforts and issues of one little boy. Seeing that the blonde was about ready to shatter them instead of the furniture, Hamura decided to wrap things up. We have the support of the daimyo. It is either banishment or Naruto is cast out from the ninja program and dealt with permanently. We will give you two days to consider. Of course, we are not without some mercy. Nothing can be done until the boy is somewhat healthier. Good day. Leaving, both of the counselors smiled inside. This power was somewhat liberating. After all, the counselors ordering the Hokage was new and exciting territory. Something to consider for the future. Chapter 2. You want to play? Fine, we'll play. Tsunade stared out upon Konoha, ignoring the remains of her desk and the Chunin secretary's attempts at bringing in more paperwork. What had happened to this place? The advisor's council had opposed Saratobi sensei for years in regards to Naruto. His notes and journals were very detailed in that respect. Yet she has the freaking hat for less than a month, and those two old farts managed to dictate terms to her. Since when has Konoha become a democracy? She was a military dictator and was supposed to order her people and ninja forces. Not the other way around. She didn't know how the council had managed to gain the daimyo's favor so quickly, but this move had been carefully made. Countering it directly could bring the village to its knees. Pausing for a moment, Sanadi thought over that statement again, this time more closely. Bring the village to its knees. She should care, why again? Naruto was the one who had brought her back against all odds. He had protected these ungrateful fools for over a decade, only to be abused and disregarded as trash. Heck, he defeated the Golden after being the dead last of his graduating class, despite massive resistance. Even if his dreams seemed ludicrous and unreal, the kid clearly had the potential to follow in his father's footsteps. Although, Kishina would be proud at the disregard for personal safety he seemed to embody. The village had put block after block in his path to the tower, and he was slowly but surely knocking them down. Listening around town, it was clear that his reputation was growing, moving from fear and anger to respect and awe. The successful completion of this latest mission would only add to that impressive resume. This latest barrier though. This was going too far. Besides, if she let those old fossils get away with such moves now, they would turn her into a figurehead leader within a year. A statement had to be made, showing just why you didn't screw with the Hokage. Now what would be dramatic enough? 
Hmm, she might need help for this one. You. Looking around the fifth stack of paperwork that he had been balancing on the floor, the Chunin sweated at the look in his leader's eye. Yes, Hokage-sama. Nodding in resolution, Sanadi gestured to the door in irritation. Drop that and get Jureya and Shizun to come here at once. I don't care what you have to do, but both of those ninjas must be here within the hour. Yes, Hokage-sama. Rubbing his eyes in irritation, Jureya felt a major headache coming on. Why did he always hang around troublesome blondes? The ceiling matrix on Naruto was only partially translated, but he could guess the gist of the rest of it. Already, he had a mind to smash some of the village to bits with Bunta. The bulk of the seals near the head were suppression seals, clearly made to prevent chakra from reaching the brain. At least three of them were from Yamanaka, and another two looked like advanced Anbu-style designs for prisoners. Overtly, they could be argued as buffers to prevent the Kyubi chakra from reaching the brain and possessing the boy. Of course, since the Kyubi chakra was normally purified before reaching the mind by the existing seal, and the matrices were not calibrated to one another, most of the kid's mental development was consequently stunted. No wonder he only seemed to have natural brilliance when fighting at full power, that was the only time his mind was receiving enough energy to function near normal capacity. Of course, the fact that they had been in place for at least six to eight years each and showed signs of slow degradation was not helping at all. Do more of the seals look like a Chihij and Jutsu suppressors? They could be seared with a simple touch and often prevented any aptitude from being utilized by prisoners. Normally, this was accomplished by screwing with natural chakra control and mental image recognition and retrieval. Someone was obviously worried about the Kyubi granting enhanced illusion abilities, just like the legend spoke of. These were old but powerful and might take at least an hour to fix each. Four seals on the torso seemed fairly amateurish, probably Chunin level, and were a variation of the seals used on chakra weights. They absorbed Naruto's nature chakra and made movement seem limited, as if he was weighted down. However, the worst part of these seals seemed to be the lack of Kyubi chakra infusing them. That seriously weakened the force protection against the Kyubi and Naruto's defense against the fox. This was very bad news, indeed. Most of the other seals were minor, designed to hinder coordination and movement in some way. Individually, they weren't more than nasty pranks really. But together, they could be hazardous to a person's health. If it wasn't for some really impressive muscle memory, he would be shocked that the kid could walk, let alone run and fight in any significant fashion. But the last two. Those were each a piece of work. The Hayuga construct initially seemed like a minor avoidance seal. If Naruto was too close to a Hayuga of the main house, it would probably generate some odd feelings or sensations. Obviously, the old men of the family council didn't want Naruto getting too close to any of the maidens or dealing with the clan in general. Not horribly evil on the face of it. If not for the fact that prolonged exposure to a main house Hayuga could result in pain or death with the right hand seal. It was like a valve, energy would build behind it the closer Naruto and the Hayuga remain near one another. They stop hanging out and the energy bleeds within minutes. But if they stay too close, one motion and the energy bursts the valve, killing him instantly. He was just lucky that the cage bird seal would ground out around something like that or Niji could have ended Naruto in the Chunin exam. The last one though. That was nearly unforgivable for a ninja to carry. The third had placed a seal brand on the kid's leg, probably since he was three years old. It was a locator used sometimes on high-risk prisoners to make tracking their movements easier. With the right knowledge and tools, these ninja could be tracked and observed at any time. No ninja with such a brand should be allowed on the front lines. The possibility of abuse, or worse, an enemy tracking the signal was too high. It was sheer luck that the kid's natural reserves blanked most of the traces at this point. That would be the first to go, if he had anything to say about it. Ureya sighed as he headed towards the tower. Tsunade's summons was a nice break from the moral question this whole fiasco inspired. If he had stayed in to look after Naruto as his godfather, could he have prevented this abuse? Or would he have followed orders to place his own work in that mess? Shizun smiled at the tower in front of her. Long and productive days always put her in a better mood. For too many years, she had been forced to run, protecting the reputation and budget of her mistress as much as possible. Learning what medicine she could between drunken binges and gambling parties. All in all, being proactive and effective in her efforts was a nice change of pace. Plus Kanoha was home, the place where her parents and uncle had lived and died for. What more could she ask for than protecting that special place? Although, taking out some frustration on the bloody little Ichiha had made her day. The patch-up order was simple, keep the subject alive, no more, no less. His back was going to be one massive scar, and a few ribs might have healed a little weak, but the kid would live. It was a shame about the strained hand ligaments damaging his potential to ever shape again though. Not that such action would be possible after the chakra suppressor seals Jureya had placed all over his body. Honestly, Sasuke would be lucky to ever see daylight after this was all settled. 
Normally, a traitor might have gotten a prison stay with potential re-enlistment in the civilian ranks if there were mitigating circumstances. For the last loyal member of a bloodline to seek out an S-class ninja who was a sworn enemy of the village. He was lucky to be breathing and a sperm donor. Smirking as she entered, Shizun wondered what sake she should pick up to celebrate this mission. No one screwed with her little brother figure. Blinking, Jiraiya twisted a finger in his left ear. Pair to repeat that. I could have sworn I had something crazy in my ear. Smiling slightly, Sanadi gestured to the two seats in front of the ruined desk. That was mostly my reaction. Those old idiots are using him as bait to delay the Akatsuki, doing a piss-poor job of it to boot. They're worried about something and I'm not sure what. Sitting down, Shizun barely registered losing control of her legs in shock, but that's it. That's ridiculous. We don't simply throw our ninja away like that. They don't have that kind of authority. Biting her lip, she looked in her master's eyes, terrified. Ah, do they? Shaking her head, Sanadi drank deeply from her sake bottle. On the face of it, no they do not. I'm Hokage, and Naruto is a ninja under my command. All in all, it's fairly straightforward. However, those jerks aren't dumb enough to bluff the authority of the daimyo. Somehow, they are going to use that authority to override my control of the village. We cannot allow this. Snorting, Jiraiya rubbed his chin. Actually, I had an idea that might come in handy. Noting their focus was gained, the Toad Sage smirked. Before this whole fiasco started, I was planning on making the kid my apprentice. That could accomplish the same things that they claim banishment would. He'd be gone from the village, the Akatsuki would still be tracking him and avoiding Konoha, but he would be protected under my wing and retain his ninja status. What do you think? Turning to the window, Sanadi's next question derailed his good mood. Have you finished mapping the secondary seals, their functions, and who placed them? Deflating slightly, Jiraiya shifted in irritation. Yeah, there were at least five or six authors there. Primary purpose of each one was to limit him in some way. Suppressed intelligence, focus, chakra control, ability, you name it, if it makes you a better ninja, they suppressed it. I've identified the Yamanaka, at least two, Captain Level Anbu, one Chunin, the Hayuga, and old man Suratobi. Asping, Shizun looked at Jureya in shock. A third Hokage sealed Naruto. Not a suppressor seal, that would be bad enough. No, he used a tracking seal on a ninja in service. Not one of the smartest moves he ever made, that's for damn sure. Leaning back in her chair, Sanadi still refused to turn around. In your professional opinion, what would happen if these seals were released properly at this time? Looking out the window, Jureya felt slightly hollow. Well, he'd have a bunch more power. The Chunin badly limited his movement, the Yamanaka and Anbu limited his mind, and the Achiha practically removed his ability. Take off those limiters, and his physical and mental reserves, outside of the fox, would increase dramatically. However, he'd pretty much have to learn everything from scratch. All of his muscle memory was screwed up badly, and his control would be shot again. Frankly, even with the Shadow Clone Jutsu, we're talking years of effort to rebuild everything here. Gradual removal wouldn't help much either, because he'd be stuck at the beginning with every lost seal. Honestly, in my opinion the whole Matrix is a major fuber. Turning around, both Shizun and Jurei were shocked by the sad smile the blonde possessed. If it was anyone else, I would recommend they be removed from service. But if there is one thing that Naruto has shown, it's an ability to adapt. Blinking, Shizun looked over at Jureya. Wait, what did the Hayuga do? Hearing the description of that horrible seal, a plot began to form in Sanadi's mind. Well, I have to say Jureya, your plan has serious merit. It accomplishes everything that is necessary and might even be approved by those idiots. However, smacking her palm and fist together, Sanadi grinned. I don't think the message is strong enough. If Amura and Kaharu want to run out the reason I return to this village, I think that they need to realize the consequences of their actions. Compromising this way puts them in a position of power, one that they really just don't have. Shizun suddenly felt a new chill. This wasn't the first time such a reaction had occurred. They usually preceded a loss at the gambling parlor. I want a list of the people who had the authority and the position to accomplish those seals. I then want them in front of torture and interrogation within the next few hours. Well, anyone still alive at least. Ibiki is preferred, but I'll take Anko in a pinch. Then, I want you to evaluate Naruto's physical recovery and remove said seals as defined by such. In the meantime there is much to be done, Shizun. Jumping to her feet, the brunette hugged Tauntin in fear. Yes, Sanadi sama I think it's time for another trip. But first, let's do some. Shopping. Groaning, Naruto tried to grab his head in pain. Only to bite back a curse. What the hell was wrong with his arm? Oh yeah, Sasuke. Naruto. Forcing his eyes open, the normally hyperactive blonde looked into the worried green eyes of his teammate. Sakura. Pairing up for the hundredth time that day, the pinkette grabbed his left hand and sobbed. Naruto, why, why did you have to get so hurt? Wincing at the pressure, he tried to force a grin. Na, na Sakura-chan, I promised, didn't I? 
I brought him back, and that was a promise of a lifetime. Smiling despite herself, Sakura nodded sharply. Looking around, Naruto was surprised by the others in the room. Ino? Hinata-chan. What are you two doing here? Laughing uncomfortably, Ino scratched the back of her head. Well, I heard that Choji and Shikamaru were here after the mission, and... Eyes widening, Naruto tried without success to get up. Choji Shikamaru what happened to everyone? Ah oh, no. Come. Everyone's fine. Looking over at Hinata, he pierced her with a sharp stare. Are you sure, Hinata-chan? Feeling lightheaded from the attention, the Hayuga heiress nodded rapidly. Niji and Kiba were hurt, but they are recovering with no problems. Choji was in bad shape, but recovered thanks to Tsunade-sama. Taking over, Ino flashed a bright smile. Shikamaru's just tired with a broken finger. Apparently, it was too troublesome to die out there. Also, Lee is recovering nicely after not only his operation, but some sort of engagement out there. Oh. And you're never going to believe what happened. The genin came and helped with the mission. Eyes widening, Naruto gaped at his fellow blonde. Wait, Gar is here. Shivering slightly, Sakura nodded. Apparently, Sanadi sama was worried about the mission and requested backup from Suna. They volunteered to help for some reason. Shocking the group, Naruto smiled widely. Mama. I'm glad they came. They really aren't that bad once you get through to them. Shaking her head in exasperation, Sakura quirked an eyebrow. Naruto. What happened out there? Not something that you need to worry about, Haruno. Looking around, the room was shocked at the appearance of Jiraiya, larger than life and twice as imposing. Hey, Hiro Senen. What are you doing here? Glaring at the unwanted title, Jiraiya sighed, smirking slightly. Sanadi sent it to me. There are some things that she wants me to check over. You'll have to talk with your girlfriends later. Seeing his loss of composure, Sakura couldn't help but laugh at Naruto's expression. God she had needed that. Don't worry Naruto. We'll see you after checking in with the others. Leading the blushing Hinata and irritable Ino out of the room, Sakura left to check in on Lee. If Naruto could still be that silly, maybe things would work out in the end. Um, Sanadi sama Browsing through the Jutsu scroll section in the Hokage vault, the blonde quirked an eyebrow, unknowingly mimicking Sakura's earlier action. Yes Shizun. Shuffling under the piles of documents that her mistress seemed to be grabbing at random, the brunette winced. About Naruto's injuries. Picking up a black file, only to add it to the growing pile without looking, Sanadi nodded absently. What about them? How do you think that the seals were imprinted so deeply? That caused all movement to cease. Increasingly nervous, Shizun started to babble, a habit she thought broken at 12. After fighting off 20 mercenaries hired to retrieve a drunk and drugged slug Sanon. I mean, for them to be below the level that a surface scan would notice, they'd have to be practically imprinted on his organs. Shizun. Seeing her superior's cold eyes, she squeaked. I have my suspicions about how those particular injuries were acquired. If I am right though, I will probably end up killing someone. So let's wait until T and I is finished, okay? Gulping, Shizun could practically feel the temperature drop. Hi. Tsunade sama Smirking, she turned to the video depository. Now then, we have a few more files to review, but let's have a gander over here. I want to have a look at some special entertainment. Pausing on her way to the video-filled shelves, Tsunade almost seemed to pick up a black cylinder as an afterthought. Forming a couple of shadow clones to carry out their research, Sanadi and Shizun began to head back to the office. Excuse me, Hokage-sama. Looking over at the bird-faced Anbu in front of the door, she impatiently cracked her neck. I'm in a bit of a hurry, Hawk. I'm sorry, Hokage-sama. But you still need to record your document retrieval before leaving. Security measures from the third. Sighing, Sanadi signed the log, adding a notation for one guest, and signed it with a bloody thumbprint. Looking over the order, you could feel Hawk's frown. I'm sorry Hokage-sama, but you didn't give a listing for. That by the way, is the sound of a male being choked with one hand. Looking at him through the eyes of the mask, Tsunade glared. I'm Hokage, I'm in a rush, these documents are sensitive, and thus their exact existence mustn't be confirmed. Yet you want me to form a paper trail with them? Perhaps that mask has started to cut circulation to your brain. Gulping, the Anbu proved his brilliance with the simple act of getting out of their way. Sauntering off, Tsunade gave him a smirk. Good boy. Hinata smiled happily, practically skipping on her trip home. Everyone was okay. Naruto-kun had talked to her. Someone had said they might be dating. Surely that meant she could talk with him, without fainting. Entering her family's estate, the heiress was shocked by the running branch members, gathering around the hallways. Everyone looked solemn and frightened, whispering harshly to one another. Hayuga tended not to gossip lightly. Something bad must have happened. Spotting a member of her old protection detail, Hinata headed over to find out what had happened. Ah no, Kaori-san. What's going on? Looking down, a tall woman, with blue-black hair, held up and noticed her old charge. For once, the child's nervousness did not irritate her, the emotion was all over the house at the moment. 
Inada sama, where have you been? You were expected back nearly an hour ago. Blushing at the chiding tone, Hinata visibly stopped herself from tapping her fingers. That particular habit always irritated Kaori badly, for some reason. Ah oh, no. Niji's team was only cleared for visitors about two hours ago. Checking in with everyone took more time than I thought. There wasn't an event or dinner tonight was there. Smiling lightly at her attitude, Kaori was thankful about the improved relations between the cousins. When Hinata was sent to the branch house, it would simplify things greatly to have a family member near her own age to explain the situation and lifestyle she would adapt. No Hinata-sama, nothing like that. It's just that, about 20 minutes ago, five Anbu arrived demanding the presence of Shinji-sama. They gave no reason or explanation, but the action has sent the Council of Elders into a rage. Hailing, Hinata thanked Kaori and hurried, Hayuga don't run in their own house, to her room, bolting the door. Ayuga Shinji was 87, one of the most bigoted members of the main house, her personal tormentor since the age of four, and one other important thing. Shinji was the primary seal master of the Hayuga clan. His hand had been branded in the cage bird seal for nearly five decades. Not one of his seals had ever been found to be flawed or imperfect, even by Hayuga standards. His very life was considered a treasure of the whole clan. If he had managed to cause trouble for the village significant enough to be imprisoned or even killed, it would take years for another seal master of his quality to be trained. Years that no one would be forced to bear that accursed seal. Anada prepared to sleep, wondering if the kami would mind if she wished for his misfortune, if only just a little bit. The moon had long since risen in the sky before the quiet of the village was shattered by raucous laughter. Wahahahaha. I can't believe that little brat won the battle with a fart. Oh, that's too rich. Tuckling along with Sanadi, Shizun prepared to change the tape out for the next match, not noticing a blushing Hinata holding Naruto some special salve. Sanadi did though, and her thoughts continued to bubble. Everyone knew that the Chunin exams were a way of building relations between nations and showcasing strength. What most people didn't realize was the fact that all matches and interactions were carefully recorded and filed in the high security vault. These recordings were vital to the continued security and development of the new generations of ninja, and an odd piece of data, once analyzed, could result in significant understanding of a village's strengths and weaknesses. Plus, they made a great diversion from depressing data. The files that Sanadi had seemingly picked up at random were mostly a front to acquire the black file. Compacted with special security and storage seals, it detailed operations that most of the continent was not even allowed to contemplate, let alone acknowledge. These were the dirtiest secrets documented by the Hokages and Anbu captains. The perfect place to find evidence of official sanction for the seals that Jureya had described. The good news was that no official sanction was recorded, meaning that the orders didn't come from Siratobi. The bad news was that either the Anbu were acting independently to a significant degree or someone had a major thumb in the program's pie. Neither was a particularly wonderful prospect. The secondary stuff in the file. Well. At least she had an idea as to who scared the advisor's council so bloody bad. Plus the name of a third conspirator. This was going to get messy. Luckily, she had a plan forming, she just needed some more bodies. However, Jure was still unraveling the secondary seal matrix, so the main project couldn't start for a little bit. That didn't mean that she wouldn't make certain arrangements on her own. Okage-sama. Saratobi Asuma, Yuhi Kurenai and Mido Guy are here as ordered. Sealing up the black file, Tsunade and Shizun to turn off the TV. The next few minutes were going to be awkward with a capital A. Motioning the three in, she sighed deeply. This was going against her sensei's wishes, but she really didn't have a choice. Good evening you three. Hopefully, this will not take too long, but I might be calling upon your services extensively in the near future. So for the moment, prepare for a long stretch of on-site village duty. Nodding, the Jonin stayed calm and professional. Well, as calm as Guy got anyways. Although, they had to admit, the nature of her request was odd, especially considering the current state of the village. Now then, normally this would only require two Jonin level ninja of good standing. However, I wanted to make sure that there is no mistake in this, so everyone in this room will bear witness. Pulling out the black cylinder retrieved from the records vault, she ignored the shocked gazes of Asuma and Shizun. Guy and Kurenai looked clueless, however. Making eye contact with each participant, Tsunade carefully placed the cylinder on the desk. This is a security capsule. They are only used in very extreme situations, when containing documents that must never be lost. The security seals can only be undone by a Hokage and two, high-level ninja. Normally, that would be assumed to be the advisor's council, however, they and I are having some issues at the moment and cannot be trusted with something so delicate, especially a black capsule. Nodding in resignation, Asuma sighed out a line of smoke. Back capsules are exclusive to the security of advanced Hokage documents, especially concerning issues of personal lineage and private techniques, right? So, who set this one up? 
Taking out a pair of scalpels, Sanadi pinned him with a look until the cigarette was gone. The fourth Hokage did. I believe, based upon the security stamp and location that this record capsule was set up on the night of the Kyubi attack. While well, I have theories, I want confirmation before mentioning them. Now, each of you must nick yourselves and add some blood to the top symbol. I'll seal it with my stamp and it should verify the authority. Begin. With practiced ease, each Jonin added a few drops of blood to the cylinder. Acting before the small puddle could dry, Sanadi sealed it with her stamp, activating the authorization. The small cylinder opened, releasing the contents. Most were pictures, with some official documents clipped together. Most prominent, however, was the birth certificate on top of the pile. Uzumaki Naruto's birth certificate, including his parents and an attached marriage certificate. Suddenly, the village pariah had become the legitimate son of the fourth Hokage. The air became rather heavy after that bit of news was confirmed. A knock on the door shattered the atmosphere rather quickly. Gathering the paperwork, the Hokage called out for the person to come in. The grim Ibiki and irritated Anko were not a side anyone was looking forward to facing. Putting down a set of folders, I took a seat without waiting for an invitation. Well, Hokage-sama. You are not going to like this. Sighing in relief, Jiraiya sat back in his chair, wiping the condensation from his forehead. Phew, that makes three down, eight to go. Looking at the prone form of his godson, he squared his shoulders. This was no time to take a break. Opping a soldier pill, Jiraiya began unraveling the second weight seal, picking apart the strands, one by one. Slowly, but surely, the small strokes of chakra-enhanced symbolism faded away, leaving a bloody but clear section of chest. All in all, this project was exhausting. Removing the tracking and Hyuga seals were relatively simple. Each was a foreign presence, designed to be rather unnoticeable and separate from his body. Sort of like a chocolate chip and some ice cream. It's a part of the dish, but easily scooped from the hole. But when you get into the seals attached to his potential, it was closer to removing the vanilla bean flavoring. These seals had been rooted in his chakra pathways for so long that untangling them felt along the lines of balancing an egg on a spoon, delicate, nerve-wracking, and beyond dangerous to the egg. Removing one of the bloody weight seals had already doubled the amount of power flowing through Naruto's chakra network. Another one made his wounds disappear to nothingness. Yureya might not be a medical ninja, but even he knew it was nuts. How the heck was Naruto walking with this much strength sealed up? Sighing, the toad sage cracked his knuckles and began to work again. The sooner he finished here, the sooner he could research at the hot springs. The headache that Sanadi had been nursing all morning had been going down with each proactive effort. The confirmation of Naruto's parentage was just icing on the cake. But the report from T and I was making that headache look like a simple hangover. You are telling me that, as near as you can tell, these idiots didn't coordinate their efforts. Shaking his head, Ibiki had to wonder if Sanadi would be willing to yell at prisoners in her spare time. It certainly was enough to scare him. Not exactly Hokage-sama. Most of the plans appear to have been formed after a meeting during the Kayubi festival nine years ago. The principals were drunk and complaining to one another about Uzumaki's ambitions of being Hokage. Of course, we have no has left to interview who might have known what happened, but those seem unrelated to the Anbu and Yamanaka efforts. Picking up a report, he skimmed the contents again to review the details. The principal figures from the Yamanaka were Kenshin and Jinzo. Kenshin was a Chunin at the time of the Kaiubi attack, while Jinzo was Inoichi's pupil for about a year before joining Black Ops. Jinzo was killed in action against Sound, but Kenshin paints an interesting picture. A few months after the discussion, they were heading home from a bar when the sounds of a fight aroused their suspicions. Looking down an alley, Kenshin realized that a drunken civilian was beating up a child. Jinzo stopped his interference, saying it was the Kayubi brat and that they should enjoy the show. They waited another 10 minutes until the principal attacker left the scene and made contact with Uzumaki. Seeing this as an opportunity, Kenshin knocked him out and put a memory inhibitor on the back of his skull. Not to be outdone, Jinzo put a reaction inhibitor over the first seal. Apparently, they had an argument over what to do next when, thinking about Inoichi's daughter entering the academy with a boy, they put a libido seal on top of that. At this point, an Anbu patrol was seen arriving, and the two of them left quickly. They were never implicated until today. Shaking her head, Anko sighed. Unfortunately, no viable candidates for the Chunin-style weight seals seemed to stick out. The only major possibility was Mizuki, and he was killed months ago. However, the style is not distinct enough yet to determine an author. So, without interviewing the kid, we're pretty much out of luck on those. Flipping through the next transcripts, Ibiki noticed Anko's deepening scowl. She had not appreciated the initiative of the former Anbu captains. The most likely culprit for the first Anbu-style seal was the previous boar. However, he also was killed in action against Sound. His record was fairly clean until he was put on guard detail for Yuzumaki five years ago. 
It was noticed the boar was leading the kid into ambushes, so he was suspended for six months and reassigned to border duty. If there is any time span that the seal was placed, it would be then. The nature of the seal is something that Jurea is better qualified to explain. Tapping a file with a red flag, he calmly continued. However, Lion was fairly easy to find as the second culprit. He was forced to retire nearly two years ago due to stress, but the event occurred while he was in the mask. There are not a lot of seal masters of his caliber in the forces, and this had his fingerprints all over it. All we could get out of him was the seal needed to stop the demon. On the surface, it looked like one of our restraining seals, meant to help break prisoners. However, the values are all off, making it twice as strong as is normally considered safe. He won't be talking again for a while. Rubbing her eyes in irritation, Tsunade really needed something stronger than sake right now. What did you find out from the Hyuga? This time, Anko stepped forward. Obviously, it was taking everything she had to stop from breaking things. Or people. Oh, the little shit was a real piece of work. Seems like he noticed the Tanada chick checking out Yuzumaki while training and got this twisted little idea. Starting to pace, Anko didn't quite notice how her voice was raised and her nostrils were flaring. No one really wanted to call her on it. He caught Yuzumaki a few nights later and knocked him out with a Jukin strike. Then, he inscribed the seal and runs, leaving the kid in the street. His first idea is to make Yuzumaki associate the Hyuga with negative emotions, but his backup idea is the sick part. You see, he figured that if Inada liked the kid, she might get close to him, and if that happened, she'd be in the perfect position to kill him. The silence was deafening. Cracking her neck, Tsunade pinched her nose in irritation. How exactly was she supposed to accomplish this? Grinning hollowly, Anko met the Hokage's gaze, ignoring the worried looks from her fellow. She'd get close, start seducing him, and then, when no one was looking, use the right hand sign to induce a heart attack. Shinji Kun thought that threatening her with the caged bird seal early would be enough to gain her cooperation. Luckily, they never got close enough for him to initiate the plan. Closing her eyes, Tsunade calmly said, No, you don't get to kill him, Anko. Noting the sudden pout, Tsunade let out a small grin. We're going to do something much worse. Seeing that the reports were accepted, both Ibiki and Anko prepared to leave, only to be stopped by one final question. I noticed that no one mentioned any sealing brushes and ink. Was there any particular reason for that? Pausing briefly, Ibiki answered hoarsely. Brushes and ink were not mentioned because they made the seals in his own blood, within the wounds, Hokage-sama. With that, the door shut with an air of finality. Slumping, the blonde felt twice her apparent age. This is why I hate being right. Seeing the advent of rage in her apprentice's eyes, Tsunade decided to focus the emotions into something useful. Shizun, I want the accounts of the Hyuga, the Achiha, the Yamanaka, and both Anbu brought before me. It is my decision that financial restitution will have to be made at this time. Except for Shinji, he's getting something much worse. Nodding dully, the brunette left the room. Looking around at the tired Jonin, it occurred to Tsunade that it had been a very long day and several things still needed to be done tomorrow. But first. Kurinai, I saw your student present some medical cream to Naruto in the Chunin exam recordings. You wouldn't happen to have a sample, would you? Blinking at the sudden change of subject, the Jinjustu mistress reached into a pack and tossed a small bottle to the Hokage. I'm not sure what she uses, but Hinata is actually quite good at this sort of thing. We practically bathe in the stuff after training. Testing a sample between her fingers, the blonde smiled at the quality. The idea that had been forming in the back of Tsunade's mind erupted in full force. I would like you to bring Hinata with you tomorrow at about 8. Try to nab Haruno too, if you can. I think I have a proposition for you. Nodding, Kuran I led the subdued and reflective Asuma and Guy out for the evening. They all agreed, alcohol was needed if any sleep was going to be found. Thinking about what she had learned, Tsunade decided there really wasn't any choice at all. Taking a pen, she began to write a series of orders to be ratified the next day. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Yuzumaki Naruto is made Chunin on my authority. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Yuzumaki Naruto is made my second apprentice on my authority. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Yuzumaki Naruto is to be granted in financial restitution, the sum of 2 million Ryo from the Ichiha account for blatant attacks of violence on his person and attempts to sabotage his career. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Yuzumaki Naruto is to be granted in financial restitution, the sum of 1,500,000 Ryo, from the account of one Yamanaka Kenshin, for conspiracy to physically assault and inducing long-term injury. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Yuzumaki Naruto is to be granted in financial restitution, the sum of 1,500,000 Ryo, from the estate of Yamanaka Jinzo, for conspiracy to physically assault and inducing long-term injury.
I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Uzumaki Naruto is to be granted in financial restitution, the sum of 3 million ryo, from the account of Hayuga Shinji, for conspiracy to commit assault and murder. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that, due to the abuse of authority that Hayuga Shinji has committed, he shall be remanded to the Konoha Mental Health Care Facility for the remainder of his natural life. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that, due to the abuse of authority that Hayuga Shinji has committed, a full review of the caged bird seal be conducted, and a method developed to remove it from the ninja forces, in case this effort is repeated. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Uzumaki Naruto, due to health concerns, be released to the care of myself and Jonin Shizun for medical treatment and rehabilitation. To ensure a maximum focus is given to the problem, both myself, Senju Tsunade and Jonin Shizun, are to be released from all professional, legal, past, present and future obligations for the duration of the treatment, which will be ongoing. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that Jureya will be my replacement and temporary successor for the position of Hokage. He will not have the authority to issue Air Anchor S rank missions for the first six months of my absence. Nor will he be able to modify or establish treaties with foreign powers. If my absence goes beyond six months, he is to be instated as the sixth Hokage with the privileges and responsibilities that entails. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that the genin known as Ichiha Sasuke be permanently stripped of ninja rank and confined to the Anbu cell block, code named the Underworld for the duration of his natural life. Genetic samples may be taken and distributed to a maximum of six Kanoichi candidates and six civilian candidates. Samples will stop upon the completion of 21 successful pregnancies. No sexual intercourse is to be granted to Ichiha Sasuke for security reasons. Candidates will be reviewed by the acting Hokage and suitable clan heads. There would be more tomorrow, and she'd have to be careful of the order of sealing, but now the opening volley was set. Okay you old idiots, you want a war? Well, you sure as hell have got one. Chapter 3. Complex confrontations and difficult decisions. Uruno Sakura really didn't think that the world should start so early today. Yet, forgetting to turn off the alarm, she found herself eating some toast at the bloody hour of 6 a.m. After spending hours outside of operating rooms and being emotionally wrung like a sponge yesterday, she was actually looking forward to some rest and relaxation. Sleep in, visit Naruto and the others in the hospital, see if Ino wanted to get a bite. Shuddering at the sudden chill, Sakura took a sip of tea. Ah oh, and get up the guts to find out if Kakashi-sensei knew what was going to happen to Sasuke. As much as she wanted to, Sakura couldn't really believe that the punishment would be light. Sasuke had broken some major laws, and the actions against a retrieval team wouldn't go over very well. Realistically the Achiha was looking at anything from jail time to execution, something she couldn't decide how she felt about. Snorting into her tea, Sakura took a moment to look at her motivations rather frankly. Back last week I probably would have clocked Naruto over the head for hurting poor Sasuke, cha. She might love Sasuke or believe that she loved Sasuke, but Sakura wasn't just a doll. Despite her lack of original skills, she too saw herself as a Konoha ninja, and Sasuke's actions were difficult to shrug off. Traitors were one of the most vilified elements of the Konoha Academy's history lessons. The names of various traitors were hammered into their minds, along with the horrific deaths and chaos that ended their lives, to the point that it was one of the worst insults a person could use. Heck, the kids on the playground were never, ever cruel enough to use it casually as an insult. Not even against Naruto, and he was one of the most picked upon kids in the entire place. Of course, successful traders like Arachimaru were not mentioned as much for fear of inspiration and corruption. What made it worse was the intensely personal nature of Sasuke's betrayal. He had hurt her, devalued her and spit upon the bonds that they had formed in Team 7. Although she hadn't been thrilled about the team with Naruto there, Sakura had to admit they formed an interesting little pseudo-family. A group of comrades that had taken a very special place in each other's hearts and a bond that tied them all together. Spitting upon the bond hurt more than anything else she could think of, outside of seeing Naruto wrapped up like a mummy. The whole situation made her heartache and head throb. However, you don't simply go from obsessing about someone for years to cursing their name. Sakura's feelings for the Ichiha were still there, tempered by recent events, but still central to her worldview. Without Sasuke. She felt like nothing. The sad truth of it was, Sakura had built her ninja career around her precious Asuke-kun and was now far behind both of her squad mates. Was it even worth it after being let down like that? Would the trials in the Land of Waves, the Chunin exam and the missions in between truly become that worthless to her? A sudden flash of green caught her eyes, bringing Sakura's attention to the orange sun behind the trees outside. Suddenly, she thought of Lee and Naruto, two crazy losers who trained with everything they had to become strong. The image brought a smile to her lips. 
focusing her resolve, Sakura was sure of one thing, she didn't want to quit anymore. What happened with Sasuke would happen, despite what she may or may not want, but she was sighing at the odd sense of loss, Sakura thought about another pot of tea before hearing a light knock on the door. Blinking at the noise, she hurried over to find a slightly haggard Kurinai and Hinata waiting on her doorstep. Good morning Kurinai-sensei, Hinata-san. Was there something I could do for you? Nodding at the greeting, the Jinjutsu mistress left no room for debate. Good morning, Haruno-san. You've been summoned to the Hokage's office with us this morning. We need to leave within the next few minutes to get there on time. Eyes widening in confusion, Sakura shrugged, went back to the kitchen to shut off the stove, and proceeded to lock the door on her way out. With the luck Sakura had been dealing with this week, it wouldn't surprise her if she was supposed to kill Sasuke today. God only knew what else the Hokage would want this early in the morning. At the demon. Monster. Stay away from the freak. Murderer. Filth. Monster. There's a fun side effect about limiting a person's mental growth for nearly a decade. They have trouble with their memory. That might not seem like such a big deal, but our childhoods define us like no other time period in our life. With the limiting seals removed, years of suppressed memories flooded Naruto's dreamscape like a tsunami. Every time he was yelled at, scorned, spit upon, or neglected was revisited in nightmarish technicolor. The plethora of agonies attacked without warning, since Jiraiya had been less than forthcoming about the reasons for his treatment. Under a forced sleep jutsu, Naruto couldn't even cry out in pain. Luckily, physical abuse was fairly unusual, the first couple of villagers caught had been killed by the Anbu. But that didn't stop people from using every other method at their disposal to obliterate his happiness. Shouting was common, along with vile and nasty glares, thrown trash and swearing, not the sort of childhood a well-adjusted kid went through. Surprisingly, though, the darkness couldn't overwhelm him completely, Naruto was stronger than that. For every thrown bottle he'd remember Raymond with a third, every cold look was countered by a hug from A.M., every insult to his dream suddenly seemed minor to Aruka's. A kind smile from Hinata or Sakura, a hand up from Sasuke, acknowledgement from Haku, a pat on the head from Jiraiya, a smirk from Tsunade, all of these events built a barrier that held back the hate and pain in Naruto's mind. Even as the lack of seals opened the floodgates to his darkness, Naruto's will brought forward the goodness in his heart. Although after that night, it would take a lot of effort to sleep properly. Relief finally came when the chakra holding the sleep failed from his struggles. Gasping, the blonde woke with a start, grasping his head in pain. Why the heck did it feel like his brain was on fire? Ah you're awake, Naruto-kun. Looking up, Naruto blinked at the smiling visage of Shizun. Shizuni-chan. What happened? My head is killing me. Holding his forehead in pain, Naruto missed the flash of suppressed rage that flashed through the young woman's eyes. Yesterday's revelations were still too raw and fresh for her to shrug off. Tsunade Sama will be able to explain it better than me, Naruto-kun. Yesterday's treatment just aggravated some old injuries that we had to deal with. It might take some time to adjust. I'm here to check in on your status, as well as the rest of the retrieval team. Tsunade Sama will be by later to look in on you and deal with any questions, okay? Nodding slightly, Naruto then remembered one little detail he had to deal with. There, Shizune-chan. Can it wait until after I go? Blushing slightly, Shizun couldn't keep back a small chuckle. Of course, Naruto-kun, go right ahead. Just let me know if you need any help, okay? Smiling, the blonde tried to get out of bed and fell flat on his face. Blinking in surprise, Shizun hurried over to help him off the floor. Are you okay, Naruto-kun? Naruto's response was slow in coming. After the headache had calmed down, he had realized a distinct lack of pain in his body. Naruto knew that he healed faster than normal, but this was a little ridiculous, even for him. However, every movement felt really weird, if he tried to move his left foot his right arm twitched, his right arm caused his right calf to shift, and so on. It was like his wires were crossed or something. Shizuni-chan, why can't I move right? Sighing, the brunette medic helped him to stand and guided him to the bathroom. That's part of what Sanadi sama will be talking to you about, Naruto-kun. Don't worry though, we'll do our best to help you fix it. After a slightly embarrassing five minutes for everyone involved, Shizun and Naruto returned to the room blushing. Hey, she might be a medic, but she liked the kid. Seeing him this helpless was a little embarrassing and worrisome. Any other feelings were completely inappropriate for the situation and their respective ages. Not to say they didn't happen, but that was an issue for another time. Alright Naruto-kun, let's have a look at your injuries, okay? Nodding rapidly, Naruto tried to put the last few minutes out of his mind. A process that was surprisingly difficult compared to his normal efforts. Shizun activated her healing chakra palm and proceeded to scan all over his body, another action that Naruto was having trouble ignoring for some reason. The results were nothing less than shocking. Naruto's wounds were long gone. Every tear, every scrape, every missing chunk was completely restored, as if the injury was never there. 
All signs of the damage to his arm had disappeared, and she couldn't even tell that there was a graft in place. This sort of cellular regeneration though. Well, Naruto-kun, it's much better than I expected. Leave those bandages on for a few more days, and you'll be right as rain. Now I want you to stay put, okay? No leaving this room for any reason. In the meantime, I'll have some food brought up to help you recover your strength. Leaving the flustered young man, Shizun headed out to check on the others, after talking to the cat-faced Anbu guard at the door of course. They wouldn't want any. Accidents. While well, Naruto was recovering, now would they? Ayuga Hiashi was not a man to be kept waiting. After the abduction of Elder Shinji the night before, he had fully expected a summons to the tower within the hour. However, with no word all evening, the Hyuga clan head was forced to come himself to demand information. That was bad enough. However, the standing orders to deny him entry until the Hokage let him in were downright rude. As the head of the most powerful remaining clan in Kanoha, an audience with the Hokage on clan business was his right and privilege. Being forced to wait like this was a most grievous insult, one he would be explaining in great depth to that blonde witch once they were in the same room. Seeing the form of Shizun, the Hokage's apprentice approaching, Hiashi decided this was the ideal time to act. Everyone knew that her love of the Hokage was only matched by her love of preserving her mistress's image. Surely she could understand how bad it was to alienate a clan as powerful as the Hayuga. Poor, poor Hiashi. Standing abruptly, Hiashi blocked Shizun's way to the office. Shizun, what is the meaning of this? The Hayuga are most displeased by this. This theft of Shinji-sama. I must be allowed to see the Hokage to correct this injustice. Giving him a cold glance, she was uncharacteristically blunt. Hiashi-sama, the Hokage will meet with you once there is room in her schedule. She is, after all, an extremely busy woman. Shifting to the side Shizun bypassed the shocked man completely, locking the door behind her. No one had dared to talk like that to him in years. There would be blood over this outrage. But that was not the end of it. Yonin Kurinai, along with his eldest and the Haruno brat, also proceeded to the door ahead of him. What was this idiocy? Hinata. Stopping at the cold tone, Hinata timidly stopped in front of her father, yes father. Looking down his nose, Hiashi practically growled, why are you going to the Hokage's office? Stepping between the two, Kurinai coolly replied for her charge. Hinata was practically her little sister, and she would be damned if this jerk tore her apart before an important meeting. Judging from yesterday, Sanadi sama was probably still in a bad mood. We were summoned, Hiashi-sama and are responding as loyal ninja to the leaf. If you would excuse us. Guiding the two girls through the door, the click of the lock seemed to echo in the air. Hiashi was not amused. Perhaps a talk with the advisor's council in the next couple of days would beat some sense into that woman. If anyone could manage it, those two could. Poor, poor, stupid Hiashi. Smiling at the small victory, Kurinai turned in relief, only to sweat drop at the sight of Tsunade sleeping on her desk, dead to the world. It was a bit of an adjustment after dealing with the third for so many years. Shizun was already acting to rectify the situation, though. Tsunade sama It's time to wake up. Your appointment with Jonin Kurinai, Hayuga Hinata and Haruno Sakura is about to begin. A small snore was the only response. Tsunade sama Bolting up, the Hokage's head seemed to increase in size by a factor of six, scaring the occupants of the room into submission. Although Sakura noted to ask later if she was the one who taught Aruka sensei that trick. Enough. I'm awake, Shizun. Shrinking back, her apprentice nodded quickly. Ayano. Looking up, Sanadi saw the nervous visage of Hinata, eyes widening slightly. This is the one who Shinji thought could kill Naruto. She looks like she could barely hurt a fly. Gulping, Hinata hated herself for asking, but felt this was her duty. H. Hokage-sama. My father is waiting outside. Should we come back later? Frowning at the sheer terror the child seemed to be suppressing, Sanadi shook her head. No, I summoned you three, not him. In fact, that reminds me of something. Reaching into her desk, Sanadi pulled out some papers for review. Taking a selection of them, she then wrote out two or three new orders and sealed them with the Hokage stamp to make it official. Shizun. Take these to the bank at once. I also want the amounts to be removed from the accounts, not transferred. With his luck, it would get lost in a paper misfiling. Oh, and I want the red form to be processed last. Blinking at the odd requests, Shizun read over the orders with widening eyes, but Sanadi sama these orders. Smirking at the look, she shot the stupefied girl a wink. When I play hardball, I don't kid around. Besides, with Hiashi stuck here for a bit, there is no better time to accomplish such actions. The entire total amount must be removed from the bank before you give them that red order. Let's see the two old farts deal with this little mess. Oh, and feel free to remove your savings for the trip as well. Nodding absently, Shizun fled for the bank as quickly as possible. Smiling at her surprised guests, Sanadi had them take a seat now then, first things first. Sakura. Gulping at the tone, Sakura tried to force a smile past her fear. 
there were only one or two things that the Hokage might want to talk about with her right now. Neither of them was extremely pleasant if brought up over the protests of the Hyuga clan head. I wanted for you to hear about the actions being taken against Ichiha Sasuke and Yuzumaki Naruto from me directly. Kakashi was sent on an S-rank mission after their successful retrieval yesterday, and this is unfortunately a touchy subject. Believe me, as much as I'd like to deny it, I've been there. Confused about the comment concerning Naruto, Sakura squared her shoulders. This was going to hurt, no matter what she thought or did. Ichiha Sasuke, due to his traitorous acts and conspiracy to willfully assault Konoha Ninja with enemy forces, is to be imprisoned without the possibility of parole. Two Jonin and six Genin were put at risk because of his actions, something that cannot be forgiven. He will be granted no visitors and is permanently banned from ever regaining his position. Sakura wanted to cry, but simply looked down in sorrow. Sasuke might have been someone she loved deeply, but even she couldn't help but acknowledge it could have been worse. She could have seen his head falling in the central square. Pinching her nose at the pain in Sakura's eyes, Tsunade continued, as to Naruto. Lifting her head in confusion, Sakura blinked in surprise. What's wrong? I thought that he was going to be alright. Thinking for a minute, Tsunade made a series of hand seals. Kurinai was impressed by the feat that was a very high-level security seal and would have left her gasping for a day or so. Tsunade didn't even look winded. What I am about to reveal to you is a fairly important secret. The level of secrecy involved won't matter in about two days, so you can talk to others about it then. But until 48 hours pass, not one word of this can reach anyone in the village. Not your family, not your friends, not even Kakashi. Do you three understand? Nodding, the three Kanoichi leaned in. They might be ninja, but secrets were also the sort of thing that any group of females wanted to hear. Especially about a boy they knew. Naruto was a mess when he came in. I will not lie, if Kakashi hadn't been met with those medics before returning, Naruto would be dead right now. That brought a chill to everyone's spines. Hearing about how two friends had nearly killed each other was never a pleasant conversation. In the course of his treatment, we discovered that someone had placed limiting seals on Naruto years ago. There are suppressors on everything from his natural memory to muscle movements. We identified numerous people involved in the placement and brought in the suspects for review last night. I'm sure that the Hyuga were most displeased when Shinji was captured for questioning. Starting, Hinata looked at the Hokage in shock as Shinji Sama hurt Naruto kun. Nodding in resignation, Tsunade was almost shocked by the fire in the little Hyuga's eyes. W was it because of me? Did I do something? No, Hinata, not exactly. The nature of the seal appeared to be some sort of failsafe. If triggered correctly, though, it would have caused a heart attack. Seeing the looks of surprise on the two girls' faces, she decided to continue before things got out of hand. Apparently, some people got it into their heads that Naruto's claims at being Hokage couldn't be allowed to occur. Over the course of a couple of years, each group added some different seals. I won't release all the names right now, but they'll be common knowledge by the end of the week. The final result, however, was not something that we were expecting. Shaking her head in shock, Sakura stared at the Hokage, but that makes no sense. Naruto might be a little annoying, but why would anyone do that to a kid? Tsunade sighed in regret, I cannot answer that at the moment, Sakura, although I'm sure you'll find out soon enough. What is important is that Jureya removed the seals last night, resulting in all of that power returning. The result was practically the equivalent of a rapid healing unlike anything I have ever seen before. This being said after I saw Naruto take a lethal strike to the chest when we first met. It is truly astounding. Shaking her head, Sakura smiled lightly, but that's a good thing, isn't it? Naruto actually had a, and now it's fully awakened. No, he had something like a, and his problems are not finished. Because of the damage the seals generated, Naruto's entire muscle memory has to be rewritten. Not to mention, his chakra control is worse than ever. It will make his ninja duties significantly more difficult to facilitate, and rehabilitation will be ongoing. From what I understand, he isn't even coordinated enough at the moment to walk in a straight line. Gulping, Sakura nodded. That did sound very bad, especially for a ninja. A miscoordination in the field could result in dead teammates and failed missions. Not something that Kanoha could risk. Noting the depression, Tsunade decided to get to the heart of the matter. Don't worry Sakura, I'm going to deal with his recovery, along with Shizune, directly. However, to get a better idea of his general abilities, I was hoping that you could explain the training program that Kakashi put you through. After that, I might have a better idea what to do to help Naruto, and yourself for that matter. I don't think the Team 7 can survive the current situation, do you? Nodding in defeat, Sakura began to talk. The head of Kanoha's number one bank had seen many things, but the orders in front of him were more disturbing than Guy's sunset. How much do you need taken out of circulation? Shizune stared down the bureaucrat with ease. Years of Tsunade's antics had made her immune to the manipulations of banks and moneylenders. 
8 million Ryo from the listed accounts, I don't see what the problem is, in all honesty. Eyes tearing in pain, the banker gestured at the numbers in frustration, some of these families are among the most valued in Kanoha. I can't just take 3 million Ryo from the Hyuga without explanation. Not to mention that one of these accounts doesn't exist anymore. Yamanaka Jinzo's account was reabsorbed when he died against sound. Shrugging, she easily countered, then removed the contents from the Yamanaka clan. When they reabsorbed his account, they became liable for his debts. Also, the Hyuga elders don't bother with personal accounts, so the fine will have to come from them directly. Grumbling, the official gathered the necessary funds, finishing piling the last of the money in front of Shizun within an hour. Nodding at the amount, Shizun proceeded to seal the balance into a personal sealing scroll for safekeeping. Now that that has been accomplished, I have been told to present you with this executive order. Eyes narrowing in irritation, he snapped up the paper. I, Senju Tsunade the fifth Hokage, do hereby decree that, until such time that a full review of the accounts is made, all funds and properties of the Namika's estate held in trust be frozen, until an in-depth analysis is made and presented to the Hokage personally. Aping at the order, the banker wanted to cry, this order will tie up nearly 20% of our remaining sources of available revenue. Between the costs of repairing the village and the day-to-day -day missions, this will make running the village practically impossible. Staring down the little man until he flinched, Shizun just smiled pleasantly, then you had better get to work, nah. Oh, and on that note. Handing him the red order, Shizun left, thankful that she had cleared out her account before entering the office. Gulping, he looked it over before crying. The bank was ruined. I, Senju Tsunade, do hereby decree, as executive officer of the Senju Trust, that all facilities, resources, accounts and stocks of the trust be frozen until such time that a full review is performed or a majority vote can be accomplished. Since, of the last three listed account heads, I am the only one still alive, I guess that means no access on Tilly say so, nah. That is, unless you can review 25,000 individual accounts, stocks and properties within less than a decade. Tsunade, Kurinai, and Hinata all stared at Sakura in shock. Feeling self-conscious, she rubbed her arms in irritation. What? Not bothering to keep the disbelief out of her voice, Tsunade listed back the high points of the discussion, Kakashi had you perform various D-rank missions, taught you the basics of tree climbing, held team meditations twice a week, he sent you into the Chunin exams with that much training and only six months of experience. Just how irresponsible is he? Feeling the need to defend her teacher, even if she agreed with the sentiment, Sakura was about to answer when Hinata interrupted her, Ah no, Sakura-san. Kurinai sensei didn't think about giving us access to the Chunin exams until our team mastered tree walking, water walking, and tree walking while performing the leaf balancing exercise for an hour each. Those were just the chakra control exercises she had us do for basic training, not counting recognition and tojutsu practice for at least two hours a day. I think we're just surprised about the lack of similar training you received. Closing her mouth with a snap, Sakura scratched her head in embarrassment, well, Kakashi sensei was always at least two hours late, and we were usually pushed into missions as team training exercises. Plus. Looking down, she continued quietly, plus, I think that he gave Sasuke some extra help every now and then after practice. Hiranai shook her head in exasperation, team development is all well and good, but individual skills are important too. When I saw Naruto's initial fight with Kiba, I thought he was lazy in his combat training, relying on instincts rather than form. Now I suspect that he wasn't given any tojutsu training at all. With the help he clearly needed in the department, that's borderline criminal. Shaking her head in agreement, Tsunade sighed, not just for Naruto, but you as well, Sakura. Judging from your descriptions, Kakashi's reports, and your own fight during the semi-finals, your control is exceptional. However, despite some basic recognition training, he didn't seem to push you as he should have. Weapons training to equalize limited strength, weight training to increase physical development, strategy tutoring to utilize your mental ability, any of these additions to your schedule would have improved your abilities significantly. The only reason that you seemed to survive the Chunin exams in the first place is the absurd balance your team had. But that wasn't enough to ensure your progression and luck more than anything ensured Naruto's. Looking in Sakura's eyes, Tsunade couldn't help but feel a little guilty about tearing the kid apart. She clearly had the talent and some of the necessary drive, Sakura just lacked the practical experience that she should have received by now. Tell me that your training during the month between the second and third exams was more comprehensive at least. Linking past the depression of their analysis, Sakura twitched training during the exam month. Nodding, Tsunade smiled, yeah, I heard that Naruto was picked up by Jiraiya by accident, something about beating Abisu for the chance, but what did Kakashi have you work on during that month? Shaking her head in resignation, Sakura sighed, nothing. Kakashi-sensei left with Sasuke right after the second round. 
I didn't even see him until the finals and didn't receive any sort of word as to what was happening that month. Suddenly, in a land far away, Kakashi felt a chill, as if someone was walking upon his grave. Leaning back, Tsunade squared her shoulders. This was going to be tricky, Haruno Sakura, I have determined the next course of action we are going to take. Since your team is effectively dissolved, I am reassigning you for a period of six months to work under Kurunai Sensei here. After that time period, if you have progressed significantly enough, I will recommend that Shizun take you on as an apprentice. Your stats and skills make you a serious contender for medical ninja training. If you impress Shizun enough, I will supplement your training myself. Is this understood? Saddened by the loss of her team, Sakura tried to keep firm. If she was going to move beyond being a Sasuke fangirl, then this was an excellent first step to take. However. Hokage-sama. Before that. Could I see Naruto, and maybe. Sasuke. Just to say goodbye. Seeing the look in her eye, Tsunade shrugged. It would probably hurt her more than anything, but some closure might help Sakura move on. Very well, after we're done here, Kura and I will take you to see Naruto and Sasuke for a quick visit. Remember, Naruto is still recovering, but is healed up significantly from yesterday. So don't excite him too much. Also, don't mention Sasuke's punishment either, that'll be my job later tonight. Turning, the Hokage smirked at Hinata. Now, what to do with little Hinata-chan, hmm? Blinking, Hinata shivered at the gaze the Hokage directed at her. Why did she suddenly feel disturbed? Smiling, Tsunade shocked them all with her next statement, yes, I think that you might actually have what it takes to be my new apprentice at the moment. Your chakra control is excellent, your Byakugan is a natural healer's tool, and of course there is this. Reaching into her desk, Tsunade threw a small jar in her direction. Seeing some of her special salves, Hinata looked up in confusion. Where did you get this, Hokage-sama? Kurunai gave it to me. Based upon that, your previous training and the fact that the Hayuga have managed to contribute significantly in undermining Naruto's development, you would make a perfect second apprentice. Your skills are sufficient but, more importantly, it would piss off the Hayuga elders to no end for you to help in Naruto's recovery. Hinata twitched at that, but Tsunade was too wrapped up in her rant to notice. In fact, the idea that you would be central in his recovery might give them a heart attack. Now before you say anything, Sakura, I might have normally been willing to take you on as an apprentice if the political situation was not so bad. Lowering her hand, Sakura stared at the Hokage in confusion, a feeling she was getting rather used to in all honesty. Political. Yes, this whole mess has generated political complications that will require me, Naruto and anyone involved in his treatment to leave the village for a bit. I'm appointing a proxy, but a message needs to be sent to certain figures within the village hierarchy. I am actually worried about your field skills at the moment, hence the training under Kurunai. However, if the business takes longer than six months and your skills are sufficient, you will be offered that place under Shizun, okay. Feeling mollified, Sakura sunk in her chair. If she wanted such an opportunity, she honestly should have expected to do more than stomp up to the woman and demand it. That's when everyone else noticed that Hinata had fainted upon hearing the phrase leaving with Naruto. The Almanac and Waichi was not a stupid man. He might be slightly pushy, a little flirty, at least when his wife wasn't around, and spoil his daughter a bit, but he was never stupid. That's why, when he saw the Hayuga clan head sitting on the bench in front of the Hokage's office, he sat down and shut up. This was obviously not going to be a misunderstanding like he thought previously. The door creaking open slowly was also not a good sign. Shizun stared at the two clan heads, then gestured them both in with barely a glance. It didn't take a mind walker of Inoichi's ability to determine that Hiashi was furious with the treatment. Hopefully, they would both leave this meeting intact. The room was empty when they entered, a fact that seemed to surprise Hiashi more than it should have. Hokage-sama, where is Hinata? Looking up from sealing some documents, Sanadi glared at the man with surprising heat. She has been sent on official business, Hiashi. Sit, we have much to talk about. Gulping at her tone, the two men sat. The incident where Tsunade had nearly killed Jureya for peeking at her suddenly flashed before their eyes. Settling in, Tsunade handed two of the papers in front of her to Hiashi. For your information, Hiashi, these orders will be carried out. They are sealed, official, and not going away. Your clan has screwed up for the last time. Reading over the orders, Hiashi fumed in rage. What is the meaning of this? These actions will undermine the safety of our clan and bloodline. Blaring the man into silence, Tsunade spoke with finality, that was before Hayuga Shinji overstepped his bounds. Clan protections only remain when the techniques are applied to clan members, Hiashi. When Shinji decided he was above himself and sealed a civilian of the leaf, that left your entire sealing school open for perusal and attack to prevent repetition. Going deathly quiet, Hiashi looked at his Hokage in an approximation of shock. You are accusing Hayuga Shinji of applying the cage bird seal to a Kanoha civilian. Nodding firmly, Tsunade smirked at his look. 
Even if Naruto is a ninja now, and the seals seem to be a simpler variation than normal, the sealing happened years ago. A full account of the events has already been supplied by Shinji, and his punishment stands. I cannot allow the Hyuga elders to think that it is ever acceptable to seal ordinary Konoha citizens, and even if this current punishment stops some attempts, now that it has been proven possible countermeasures must be developed and used. Seeing that Hiashi was working himself up to a righteous fury, Inoichi decided to step in before things got any worse, Hokage-sama, while Hyuga-sama reviews what I am sure to be troubling news, I wish to inquire about the large withdrawal made from the Yamanaka accounts this morning. The bank was less than forthcoming. Looking at her fellow blonde in disinterest, the Hokage replied ironically, actually, you're here for the same reasons that Hiashi is. Two of your clan members also placed seals upon Yuzumaki Naruto, and an acceptable fine was determined. The Yamanaka clan accounts were simply held liable due to the fact that one of the perpetrators passed in the action against Sound. The other is still in custody, so he probably doesn't realize the damage to his account yet. Aping, Inoichi worked to find his voice, Hokage-sama. I might not particularly like the kid, but I would never condone an attack like this. Surely we can come to some sort of arrangement. Shaking her head, Tsunade refused to give an inch. I have seen too many of these arrangements fall apart once the ink dries on the paper. Putting mentally crippling seals on a child under six is abuse in the worst form, not to mention enjoying said child being attacked for 10 minutes as if it was a play. If you have issues with this or the resulting penalties, then speak to Yamanaka Kenshin when he is released tomorrow into your care. Otherwise the matter is closed. Noting the position of the sun, she decided that they had gotten all she was going to give them for the moment. Now, if you two gentlemen will excuse me, I have another appointment in the hospital. Shaking in rage, Hiashi glared at the woman with as much fire as possible. This isn't over, Sanadi. When I talk with the Council of Advisors, the killing intent nearly caused the two men to pass out. Standing up slowly, a sudden image of a hungry lioness entered Inoichi's mind as the Hokage glared at Hiashi with her full fury. He was lucky it didn't induce a brain aneurysm. If you wear the leaf symbol, you are a soldier under my command. I don't care about clans or privileges or what you seem to think that two dried up old Jonin can grant you, the simple fact of the matter is that I am the commanding officer of Konoha. Now go slink back to your clans, let them know about this punishment and understand this. Reaching down, Sanadi casually snapped the edge of her new desk as if it was tissue paper. Cross me and I can break you. Now leave my sight. The two Jonin, who had each faced armies, assassins and angry wives at one point or another, left with their tails between their legs. Uzumaki Naruto was confused, irritated, and worried beyond all limits. Something very wrong had happened. When the food had come up 20 minutes after Shizune Nichan had left, the lack of Raymond didn't even register. He was starving and felt like he could eat an elephant, or maybe the Kayubi, with enough hot sauce. However, at that point, he was shocked to discover he could barely hold his chopsticks. After three shouts from sticking himself in the eye with eating utensils, the purple-haired Anbu at the door sent in a shadow clone to help. Having a masked but obviously attractive woman feeding him led to emotions and reactions that he really didn't know how to deal with. A second assisted bathroom trip had really not helped matters. Then, after being bored for hours, Sakura-chan came to visit. She tried to stay upbeat, but Naruto had liked her for years. He knew her emotions, thoughts, speech patterns, and methods better than any person besides Eno. That knowledge had only improved as they became teammates and comrades. Every action seemed to scream distress and depression, so he tried to cheer her up as best as he could. Then she hugged him, Haruno Sakura had never initiated physical contact with him in a non-violent manner in their entire association together. Something big had to be up. Then she explained, she couldn't tell him everything because of Bachan, but some changes were being made to the teams. She might not be able to see him for a while, but was planning on getting stronger before they met again. She couldn't tell him about Sasuke, but Bachan would ladder, and she just wanted him to know one thing. I don't think that I am all that impressive and lovable right now, Naruto, but I'm glad that if someone wanted to bother liking me, it was a good guy like you. Find someone better, please. You deserve it more, and I think I would rather be your friend. That's the least I can do. Seeing the tears in her eyes, Naruto couldn't help but agree. It hurt somewhat. He had loved Sakura for years. But not as badly as it could have. Instead of shouting, screaming, or hitting, she said that she wanted him to be happy and to be his friend. Naruto really didn't have enough friends to turn that offer down, and besides, her reaction to Sasuke after Bachan healed him the first time was like a sledgehammer. This just finalized something that hadn't happened yet. It hurt. But it could have been worse. Sakura left after that, saying she had to check on something before going home for the night. Looking out at the setting sun, Naruto sighed. If he could walk without falling from the stupid bed, he would have escaped hours ago to find out what had freaked his teammate out so badly. What was taking Bachan so long? 
Hearing the door open, Naruto was surprised to see Shikamaru walking in. Hey Naruto, how's it going? Smiling at the company, Naruto greeted the lazy Chunin with enthusiasm, Hey Shika. How's everyone else doing? The conversation was light after that. Shikamaru was still reeling slightly from the insanity of completing his first mission successfully and the attention of that crazy Suna Kanoichi. Naruto was still having trouble with his muscle control and concerns about Sakura and Sasuke. However, always the curious one, Shikamaru finally asked about the mission. Leaning back, Naruto sighed, it was awful, Shikamaru. Sasuke actually tried to kill me. Those attacks were not designed to wound or knock me out, they were lethal strikes. How am I supposed to feel about that? Somewhat at a loss, Shikamaru was about to answer when the door opened again. Looking up, the smiling visage of the fifth Hokage greeted them, with Shizune and Hinata both following quickly. Hey there Naruto, let's chat. Chapter 4. The Tactical Withdrawal. Hiraya nearly growled at the paperwork in front of him. Damn it, he was never letting that woman sweet talk him with cleavage again. No amount of flashing was worth this. Betting talked into the position of temporary, Rakudane was very irritating. The Toad Sage had put up with a hyperactive blonde for nearly a month in order to get out of this job. Although, having him pull off a variation of the Rasengan within such a short amount of time was fairly impressive. Not that he would ever admit that, Naruto had enough of an ego as it was. However, Sanadi refused to play fair, while his acceptance of Naruto as an apprentice would have gotten him independent and out of sight as well, Sanadi could do so much more. Granting him Chunin rank to ensure some autonomy was an excellent tactic, and writing the whole thing off as a medical issue gave the busty blonde nearly undisputed control of the case. After all, Sanadi wasn't known as the world's best medical ninja for nothing. Plus, she would be able to more effectively figure out his weaknesses and the needed treatments if they were dealt with in isolation. That didn't mean that things were going to be smooth sailing on the home front. Lacking the ability to issue air rank and S rank missions, Jiraiya would be unable to get more than 60% of the needed revenue for Konoha to be run effectively. In addition, freezing the Namaka's estate in Senju Trust took care of most of the liquid assets in the village. That meant that the missions that Jiraiya would normally be able to assign on behalf of Konoha to maintain its infrastructure and give Genin team something to complain about wouldn't happen. The Great Ninja Village couldn't survive on only C rank and B rank missions alone. Not to mention, the clans were going to be up in arms. The Hyuga were probably going to side with the Advisors Council after the loss of Shinji, while the Yamanaka were going to be tangled up for a few days, trying to figure out what to do with Kenshin. That would, in turn, cause the Nara and Akamichi clans to debate how to present themselves in relation to their longtime allies. The Inuzuka would probably follow Tsum's lead, and the Aburum would stay neutral unless forced to act. That wasn't counting the divided loyalties various ninja groups would feel in relation to the Hokage and her choices. But this instability, spinning the opinions of the collective Kanoha ninja force would be nearly impossible. All this chaos over a threat to one little boy, it was amazing and terrifying at the same time. Hopefully, the generated pressure and chaos would cause the daimyo to remember to keep his nose out of ninja business and acknowledge the strength of the Hokage position. If he played with the power of his authority too much, using the council and Danzo as proxies, it would destabilize the place to the point of civil war. Tsunade was right in trying to fix this mess and removing herself from the equation and leaving her own proxy weakened the bargaining position of the other side significantly. Although, signing out those scrolls as healer's aides was pushing the farce a bit much. Still, there were some things that he could do. Nothing was going to be accomplished tonight because his authority was not to be activated until daybreak. However, since Asuma had been ordered to hang around until needed, it would be a shame not to try a little negotiation. Best to be as upfront as soon as possible before any of the opposition formed counterclaims. Luckily, the third son was finally sober after his binge the night before and should be fine to travel. Sighing, Jiraiya looked over his beloved village, lost in his thoughts. Did she really have to take the hat with her? Wearing that was going to be one of the best parts of this job. Naruto looked around the room, long suppressed danger instincts blaring. He hadn't felt pressure like this since that time he painted the Hokage monument. Shrugging it off as his imagination, the former prankster squinted at the Hokage in anger. Hey botch Ann, it's about time that you showed up. I've been going nuts trying to find out what's going on. What happened to Sasuke? What's up with my body? Why is Sakura so freaked out? Whack. Luckily the light slap on the head calmed him down before real rant momentum could build up. Pulling up a chair, Tsunade gestured for the rest of her subordinates to relax. This conversation was probably going to take a while. Now that I've got your attention, we've got a lot to talk about Brad. First of all, you did great on that last mission, chances of success with the inclusion of the so-called Sound 4 were slim to none. But it still got done, and that's the important thing. Shaking his head, Naruto glared, Sound 5. Linking in confusion at the interruption, Sanadi glared at Naruto. 
what was that brat? Staring definitely right back, Naruto proudly stated, sound 5. That bone guy was fighting me before Sasuke broke out of the barrel. If fuzzy brows hadn't shown up, I wouldn't have been able to continue after that bastard. He was good, Bachan, really good. Taking note of that little bit of data, Tsunade wondered if the corpse had been dealt with yet. Regardless, you managed to bring back Sasuke to Konoha. However, Naruto, this might hurt, but you need to hear it. Sasuke is going to be punished very badly for his actions. Not only for hurting you, but the fact that his defection led to others to be badly injured as well. That's probably what upset Sakura. Gulping at the serious tone, Naruto looked down at his bandaged hands in worry, how badly is bad, Bachan. Letting out an explosive breath, Sanadi looked at the ceiling, not wanting to see the look in his eyes when it came crashing home, Ichiha Sasuke is no longer a ninja, his rank is removed and will never be restored, his chakra is sealed completely, and he will never be removed from prison. For the rest of his limited lifespan, Ichiha Sasuke will remain in Anbu custody, alone and in chains. Gasping, Naruto leaned back in shock. This wasn't what he wanted to have happen. He had a vague idea of Iro Senen fixing that stupid seal, a few weeks of community service, and then the reformation of Team 7. He didn't nearly fall apart, literally, in order to lose the closest thing that he had to a family. However, at the moment, Uzumaki Naruto wasn't a complete moron. Seeing his surrogate brother try to kill him had hurt Naruto badly, both physically and emotionally. Winning that fight at the Valley of the End was probably the high point of his ninja career at the moment. However, after fighting and winning in such a battle, could things really go back to the way they were? Would Sasuke really admit to Naruto's strength or simply see him as a simple stepping stone to Itachi's death? Could they respect each other or would they have to fight forever to see who was the strongest? These were questions that Naruto didn't know the answer to and he wasn't sure if he wanted them. At a total loss, Naruto looked at the others in the room for guidance. Bachan was refusing to meet his gaze, Shizun Nichan was smiling sadly, with Tantan managing a sorrowful look. Shikamaru was looking surprised but was slowly relaxing, clearly he was examining the different paths available and sorting the ideas for the latter. Hinata-chan looked sad for him but also somehow vindicated. It was an odd look on her cute face. Arg. I'm doing it again. Curse you Iro Senen, you're a freaking disease. Confused and hurt, Naruto was at a rare loss for words. Somehow, the silence was more telling than fanfare from the rooftops. It was cold. That was Haruno Sakura's first impression of the Anbu prison. To gain entry to this area without the normal clearance, Kurunai-sensei had blindfolded her and applied a complete sensory deprivation. The 15 minutes that Sakura had spent trapped in her own mind were enough to cause massive amounts of pain and nausea. The sight before them just made her want to throw up. Ichiha Sasuke, beaten, broken and weak, was restrained to the point of paranoia. Each arm was bolted to the wall, his hands encased in unbending steel gloves. Sasuke's eyes had been covered, with his head fixed to the wall with leather straps. Each leg was encased in some sort of steel-lined concrete, spread eagle and sunk into the floor. Every square inch of the restraints in Sasuke's flesh was practically coated in black ink, reinforcing the chakra drain of Jureya's earlier work to extreme levels. The only other additions appeared to be a set of tubes attached to the groin area, items that Sakura really didn't want to think about. However, the sudden appearance of a yellow liquid robbed her of even that small mercy. Hands covering her mouth in horror, it was all that the little cherry blossom could do not to run in and hug the prisoner. Only the strict warnings from Kurunai-sensei and her own confusion about Sasuke's recent behavior prevented Sakura from acting. That did not stop a minor gasp of Sasuke-kun. Though. Suddenly, Sakura was pinned by the blindfolded face of Ichiha Sasuke. What are you doing here, Sakura? Feeling the pain and hate in the boy's voice, she could barely breathe. Have you come to torment me? Beg me for a last kiss. Plead for a date. Sorry Sakura but that's not allowed, I'm going to be indisposed for a while. Gathering her courage, Sakura tried to take control of the situation. Why was it that the person who was standing free couldn't seem to outmatch the chakra-less bound traitor? Sasuke, why did you do it? Why did you leave us? Why did you hurt Naruto? Why did you have to hurt me? The tears were trying to escape again, but after two days she was mostly dry. Sneering at her broken tone, the Achiha lashed out with his only remaining weapon, his words. Why? Why? Why the hell would I leave, you ask? Why would I hurt you and that stupid dead last? Why would I leave for Orochimaru? To get stronger. To kill my brother. You and Naruto and this entire damned village are only going to get in my way. Nothing else matters. Battered by the immense naked rage of her crush, Sakura struggled to stand, but Sasuke. We could have helped you. We could have gotten stronger together. Naruto would have done anything for you. I would have done anything for you. I cared and care so much for you. Obviously biting his tongue, Sasuke coolly replied, so why did you report me? Sakura's jaw clicked shut in shock. 
Seeing an opening, Sasuke stuck as the trained ninja that he was, why did you report me? There were a dozen ways for you to cover for my escape before anything would have happened. I could have been in sound before anyone actually knew I had left. If you really loved me, wouldn't you have let me go, respecting my wishes? So tell me Sakura, why did you turn me in? Looking at the floor, feeling the guilt of all of Sasuke's pain, Sakura tried to answer, because Sasuke, Orochimaru was going to destroy you. He would take everything about you and warp it into something unrecognizable. You would have become his toy, his tool, his puppet. I couldn't let that happen. Grinding his teeth in impotent rage, Sasuke growled out, and what would be better than this? No chakra, no career, no training, no revenge, not even a glimpse of light, just a tube to pee in and a single meal a day all alone. Oh this is a major improvement. Losing control, Sakura was a little glad the boy she once cared for couldn't see her tears. Unfortunately, the sound of falling water seemed to tip him off. Oh, so now you cry. How wonderfully compassionate, you bloody annoying bitch. You know. I almost wish that I had taken you up on that offer to join me now. Sakura felt Kuranai tense behind her, but couldn't find the energy to care. Yeah, it would have been wonderful. I agree, you tag along, and one of the sound four kills you when we reach the meeting place. That way, I get to sound in peace, and you get a whole two minutes of happiness joining the love of your life. I guess that they say hindsight is 20 20s, but what the hell. I learned my lesson if I ever get out of here, kill the weak one quickly, so they can't alert the useless herd. Remember that, you self-absorbed whore, you don't love me, you just want to use me to feel better about your pathetic self. Standing there in shock, Sakura felt the last of her resolve shatter, Sasuke was lost to her forever. Now what was she supposed to do? I think that is quite enough. Her and I had never really cared that much about Haruno Sakura. She had decided on training Hinata years ago, before the academy graduation had ever happened. Therefore, other than a quick glance at Sakura's data sheet and some observations during the Chunin exam, it was safe to say she knew next to nothing about her. That didn't mean that she felt such abuse was deserved by anyone, let alone a 12-year-old girl. Hinata had moved on to bigger and better things, so fixing this mess was now her responsibility. Listen here, Ichiha, and know this, you will remain here for the rest of your life. The Hokage is not budging, the advisor council has washed its hands of you, and soon the populace will know that the Ichihas breed traitors better than any other clan. At least Itachi was able to make his escape, you were handled by the weakest student in your graduating class. So deal with your failure, and reflect on your hate alone. Come Sakura, I think that this is as close to goodbye as you are going to get. Nodding weakly, the girl turned to follow her new sensei and new path. It hurt so badly, but Sakura had to get stronger on her own now. She couldn't only rely on others for happiness anymore. She was going to be all alone. What is the red chakra? The sudden question threw the two Kanoichi off in shock. You said I was beaten by the dope. You call me a traitor and a weakling. Then I'll tell you that anything that has two chakras is a bigger monster than I ever could be. Narrowing her eyes, Kuranai hit a seal matrix near the far end of the room. Lighting coursed across Asuke's limp form, shocking him into painful slumber. Turning to the surprised Genin, Kuranai almost cursed at the confusion on Sakura's face. Having been in some questionable situations before, Kuranai was sure that, if Sakura was as smart as they said, she would puzzle the situation out for days. She couldn't be allowed to come up with theories about the Ichiha's last words. In her state, no one could predict what would happen. This had to be stopped before things got too out of hand. Sakura, I will not be able to answer any questions concerning his last comment, due to village security. However, we will meet tomorrow afternoon to see how you are doing and plan about your integration into teammate, okay? Nodding absently, Sakura was caught off guard when the security was reapplied. Picking up the now silent girl, Kuranai sighed, she was going to have a hell of a day tomorrow. Maybe the new Rocky Dame would have some ideas on how to handle this mess. Sighing at the forlorn look, Tsunade squared her shoulders. They were not out of the woods yet, unfortunately Naruto, you are still in some danger. Once they heard about the result of the mission, the advisor's council started putting pressure on me to have you banished. Staring at her in shock, Naruto's shout almost beat Shikamaru's curse. Standing up, the lazy strategist was surprisingly eloquent, Hokage-sama. I was the one who led the mission, so any issue from the results of that mission is my responsibility. Why is Naruto being punished for that? Nodding in thanks to his friend, Naruto threw his two cents in, yeah, Bachan. Why would those two old farts want to banish me over bringing back their precious Asuke? I didn't make any decisions as to what would happen to him. Looking at the two outraged boys and the confused Hinata, Tsunade pondered. While she was all about breaking the rules when necessary, the law of the Sandane was not generally one of them. However, given that Hinata was going to be traveling with them for some time, and Shikamaru was among the smartest tacticians of his generation, such a secret would not keep for long. Finding the answers underneath the underneath was among the first challenges taught to the average Kanohe Genin. 
Naruto was just particularly bad at that lesson. Speaking of Naruto, there were his feelings on the matter to consider. As far as Tsunade knew, Naruto had never willingly given out the fact that he was a Jinchuriki out to anyone, well, besides possibly Gara. As such, since this secret was so central to who he was, releasing that information to others was a burden that he avoided like the plague. However, having some stable and dependable friends would be central to his survival in the near future. Sakura was still in shock, and no one else from his generation was anywhere near level-headed or close enough to him for releasing the secret to be a good idea. Honestly, the fact that finding someone for him to give that information out to was so difficult was a little sad. But trust had to start somewhere, and it was better if releasing the secret was somewhat Naruto's decision. Looking her fellow blonde in the eyes, Tsunade was as serious as she could manage, Naruto, if you want that answer to be clear and simple, I need to share certain truths with these two. I would strongly recommend that you allow the release of this information, because if my impressions are correct, they can handle the facts. Would you like me to explain, or do you want to give it a go? Shock had given in to fear and resignation, Naruto realized that he should have known those old jerks would use this as an excuse to remove the fox boy. Neither had ever liked him that much, and injuring the last Ichiha was probably just the thing they needed to remove him. Seeing the hurt and confused looks on his friends' faces, Naruto sighed in defeat. Hey, if was going to be banished, he might as well go out with a bang, nah. Are you sure, Bachan? Nodding firmly, Tsunade smiled in encouragement. Don't worry Naruto, this won't get out to others unless we wanted to. But Hinata is going to be involved in some close work with us over the next few months, and Shikamaru is smarter than he lets on. Even if you don't tell them, chances are they'll figure it out on their own anyways. Looking down in defeat, Naruto sighed, you tell them Bachan. I'm no good at this sort of thing. Looking at Shikamaru and Hinata, Sanadi couldn't help but notice that they were extremely curious about all the secrecy surrounding Naruto. Troublemaker and fool he may be, but the kid was also their friend, and this was very concerning. Best to fill them in quickly then. What I am about to tell you cannot be spoken to anyone in your own generation. If this rule is broken, you will be killed with no exception or mercy. Do you understand? Seeing them each nod in the positive, Sanadi started her spiel. Approximately 13 years ago, when the Kaiubi no Kitsune attacked, Nara Shikamaru was a failure for most of his life. His scores in the academy were nearly as low as Naruto, he wouldn't train if he could help it to save his life, and his greatest failure was not getting out of the Chunin exams when he had the chance, because now people actually expected things from him. In all honesty failing at his lifelong goal of being an average ninja by the age of 12 felt like a very troublesome accomplishment. However, failing to realize the truth of the situation concerning Naruto actually left a bad taste in his mouth. Letting the soft voice of the Hokage wash over his awareness, Shikamaru made his infamous thinking pose to concentrate on the facts before him and compare them to those gathered from his own life experiences. After calculating about 347 steps and theories, he made a number of determinations. 1. Naruto was not the Kyubi in human form. 2. Naruto had only found out about this issue recently, probably within the last year. 3. Naruto beat Gara with some help from this power, thus scaring the bastard into sanity. 4. Naruto was the scapegoat of the elder generation because of this. 5. The elder generations took their frustrations out on the kid, thus his bad reputation. 6. His parents and their friends blame Naruto for the Kayubi. 7. Because of 6, he and his generation had been programmed to some degree to hate Naruto. 8. The council's decision was based more upon than simple hatred, they would have simply killed the blonde while he was weakened otherwise. 9. The third was smoking weed if he thought that the parameters of such a limited law would protect Naruto that much. 10. If rejected by those he loved or trusted, Naruto would become a monster worse than the Kayubi. 11. The fifth had a plan, and it was going to be very troublesome for the village. 12. He really didn't care that much about 11 at the moment. Hinata's thoughts were a little simpler. 1. Naruto's a living ceiling scroll. 2. Without Naruto-kun, would the Kayubi kill them all. 3. Kanoha had hurt Naruto-kun. 4. She would help Naruto Kun. Hey, not everyone was born a high level genius. Reaching out nervously, Hinata touched Naruto's hand. Seeing his shocked and nervous expression, she couldn't help but smile. He had given her the courage to fight, it was the least she could do to return the favor. Sensing no hate, malice, or evil intent in that smile, Naruto began to relax. Naruto. Looking over at Shikamaru, he was surprised by the serious look in Chunin's eye. Tell me how you learned about this, please. I think that I need to know. Leaning back, Naruto looked at the boy in front of him. There was no hate or fear, but Shika was smarter than he looked. He was testing for something, looking for something, trying to find the piece of the puzzle that didn't fit. Apparently, he thought that broken piece was in Naruto's mind. Shrugging, Naruto began to retell the story of how he became a ninja. 
the tale was a fairly good one, although the mention of beating the third Hokage with his sexy jutsu caused a few raised eyebrows to twitch and everyone listened with great enthusiasm. Nearly crying at the heartbreaking end where the two lonely orphans bonded over the decimated form of Mizuki the traitor, Hinata gripped his hand tighter. Shikamaru just nodded, okay, well you're loyal and a friend. That's good enough for me. Clearing her throat, Sanadi smirked, now that the drama is out of the way, we can continue. As much fun as this is, we are under a bit of a time constraint. Believe it or not, the council is not throwing the demon around as a reason, not directly anyways. They claim that, because the Ichiha is safely recaptured, Orochimaru will focus his attention at Kanoha once again. At the same time, Akatsuki are mainly a threat because of their interest in you. Their brilliant idea is to exile you, thus drawing the Akatsuki's attention away from Kanoha at the moment while we deal with Orochimaru's interest in Sasuke. Holding up a hand to stop the flow of conversation, Hinata looked at Tsunade in concern. Excuse me, Hokage-sama, but who are the Akatsuki? Smiling at the initiative shown from the normally shy girl, Tsunade calmly explained. They're a group of elite S-class missing nins from across the continent. Jiraiya found out about them because Orochimaru used to be a member. To give you an idea of their strength, Ichiha Itachi is one of their members, and our sources seem to indicate that he is not the strongest member of the group. For some reason, they seem to be unusually interested in the Bijuu, such as Kayubi or Shukaku, for what reason we do not know. That is what the council wants to send Naruto out to face, alone. Frowning, Shikamaru returned to his thinking pose, while Hinata simply looked horrified. Giving them a moment, Sanadi was surprised by Nara's sudden assertion, they're stalling for time. The council is worried about something and that something has to do with Naruto. Some members of Akatsuki have managed to make them worried enough that they're going to dangle Naruto like bait so that his attention is divided. For some reason, the advisor's council is worried about Ichiha Itachi. Looking at the young genius in shock, Tsunade nearly whistled. This kid was going to go far if she had anything to say about it, very good Shikamaru, I have a theory about that but cannot reveal it at this time. Out of curiosity, though, how did you come to that conclusion? Sighing heavily, the lazy genius looked around the room's occupants, troublesome, the way you emphasized Ichiha Itachi was the first clue. The number of effective missing ninja at that level from Kanoha is extremely limited. A foreign ninja would not inspire any direct fear or animosity other than that which his reputation would generate. However, it is fairly clear that this move is motivated by personal fear. Itachi is theoretically the only other missing ninja besides Orochimaru that should inspire such feelings, and they're actually willing to put up with his infiltrations rather than face this Akatsuki. Therefore, the advisor's council is scared of him for some personal reason. Why is beyond me, besides the obvious? Looking at the shock ninja surrounding him, the young Chunin shrugged. It was fairly obvious when you thought about it a bit. Nodding happily, Tsunade decided to drop his name in Jiraiya's lap while they were gone. Needless to say, I would normally ignore those two to the best of my ability. However, they've got the daimyo on their side, and that complicates things horribly. Naruto cocked his head in confusion, but Aruka-sensei always said that our line of command was separate from the daimyo. How could that affect your orders, Bachan? This time, Hinata took over the explanation, politics were actually one of the few heiress lessons that she enjoyed a bit. Our orders might not come from the daimyo, but a lot of our funding and support does. If he started sending jobs to other ninja villages, Kanoha would lose one of its biggest sources of income. Our economy could mimic the situation in Suna within a couple of years if the daimyo wanted it to. That's why he is such a horrible enemy to have in this situation. Nodding at the explanation, Tsunade continued, however, by treating the advisor's council as proxies, he is supporting an agenda that undermines the Hokage's position. After that became apparent, I decided to make some decisions to teach those meddling old idiots a lesson in respect. Because kid, if the reason I decided to come back to this village is removed, then I am joining in the fun. Looking at her like she was nuts, Naruto blurted out, how the hell are you going to manage that, Bachan? Instead of a witty comeback, the woman looked like she had smelled something foul. Unfortunately, the damage done to you had the fun side effect of outlining some long-term problems. Mainly, the fact that several concerned citizens decided to put limiting seals on you years ago. When we removed them, a bunch of power was released, but it severely screwed with your various ninja skills. I simply wrote the whole thing off as a medical leave, giving myself and my apprentices free reign to move around in isolation to ensure the effectiveness of the treatment. I already determined the punishments and withdrew the appropriate fines from the identified accounts. Jiray will be covering while we're gone. Shocked into silence by the fact that he had more seals on him he didn't ask for, Naruto was left gaping like a fish. Shikamaru wasn't quite so passive, apprentices. I thought that Shizun was your only apprentice at the moment. Snapping, Sanadi ruffled Naruto's hair, almost forgot about it. Congratulations Naruto. You and Hinata are now the newest Chunin of Kanoha and apprentices of yours truly.
Savoring the silence, Sanadi realized this was probably the last time Naruto was going to be so badly shocked for a while. Shikamaru had an unusually thoughtful look on his face when heading home that night. After some screaming, yelling, and various other expressions of surprise, Naruto was fully convinced that his promotion was real. Apparently, being a Chunin on medical leave had more rights than a genin, especially those without families. Although Shikamaru knew that Hinata was mostly alone to screw with the Hyuga elders, he wondered what Sanadi would do if those two actually started to develop feelings for each other. So troublesome. Having been sworn to secrecy for the next day or so and given special orders while the group was gone, Shikamaru was ready to head for bed for some well-deserved shut-eye. However, it seemed that fate had decided he wasn't done yet. Boy, Shikamaru. Looking up, he rolled his eyes, his father and friends were back from drinking. Squinting, Shikamaru nodded at the trio and headed towards his room. Sleep was the only thing that he really wanted right now. Plus dealing with those three whining after hearing everything that had happened to Naruto was not on the agenda. Sadly, Shikaku knew him too well for that kind of dodge to work. Grabbing his troublesome son by the shirt, the original Ino Shikacho combination dragged him into the parlor. Sitting Shikamaru down rather forcefully, Shikaku broke out the shogi board while his friend settled in for the show. Shikaku only started a game like this when in a very bad mood. Shikamaru was not in the mood for this. His father was normally a good opponent in shogi, he hadn't managed to win anyways. However, whenever he got drunk and felt like crap, Shikaku would insist upon a match against his son. Mostly, it was a way to vent without killing someone, and Shikamaru was the only one who would put up with his anger when he was wasted. In return, Shikaku was usually willing to help deflect his wife from tormenting his son for a few days. However, when the rest of the Ino Shikacho group joined in, they usually were in need of entertainment. That only happened when they all felt horrible about something and thought that a drunken shogi game would be amusing. The last time this happened was after Sandame's funeral, so just walking away would not go over too well. Parents were so troublesome. Looking at the board, the Chunin suddenly had an odd feeling, before his eyes each of his pieces seemed to take on the visage of one of the new Konoha Genin, while his father's took on the look of an older ninja. Blinking, Shikamaru couldn't drive the image from his mind, so he didn't bother. It might have been a little disconcerting, but the image felt strangely appropriate for the moment. This game was going to be played out in real life, sooner or later, with the way things were going. He might as well prepare for the battle to come. Moving to a faceless village called Chunin, Shikaku started to talk, slurring his words only slightly. I wanted to congratulate you on your successful mission. You managed to complete the objective and bring your friends home. It's a good start to your career. Thinking, Shikamaru moved a pawn that looked a bit like Kinohimaru, troublesome. I just hope that I am able to keep my friends from getting so badly hurt next time. If it wasn't for Tsunade-sama, I don't want to think of what would have happened to Chaoji or Niji. Noting the flinching Akimichi, Shikamaru almost felt badly about the dig, almost being the key word. Taking a moment, the red-faced Nara shifted to a knight that looked oddly like Kakashi-sensei. Getting hurt is a part of the job. The important thing was that your leadership brought them the greatest chance of victory possible with the information available. Remember this in the future, and the missions will seem easier, even as the danger increases. Letting out a small sigh of irritation, Shikamaru moved an angry Sakura to block the advancement. For some reason, the patterns he would normally rely upon were not coming. Hundreds of mathematical strategies formed around normal shogi pieces. But he just couldn't manage to dehumanize his troops tonight. However, Shikamaru couldn't help but feel that his campaign was still equal. It was almost as if this was not a battle of pieces or tactics, but of will. Although the elder Nara seemed to be immune to the tension in his son's shoulders or the thoughts running through his head. This was simply a game of shogi to help him focus a bit after Inoichi was censured by the Hokage, an issue that none of them knew how to deal with yet. Noticing the twitching that was controlling Inoichi's arm, Shikamaru raised an eye. The Yamanaka Patriarch was normally better than that. Countering Inuzuka Tsum with a stoic Shino, Shikamaru glanced at the old family friend. What's wrong, Yamanaka-san? You seem tense for some reason, is Ino giving you crap again or something? Flinching at the tone, Inoichi met the young man's eyes with some difficulty, just some clan business. One of our family members broke some important laws and we have to decide on how to punish him. We've actually been debating the issue most of the evening. Noting the reddened faces and alcohol fumes wafting in the breeze, Shikamaru translated that as. Got drunk off our asses trying to figure out how much this was going to hurt their image or honor. Shifting a glaring Niji in front of Hiyashi, Shikamaru suddenly got a cold feeling in the pit of his stomach. The timing was just too neat for the issue to be a coincidence. But the question was, how to make sure of their guilt. Looking over the trio, he decided some dirty pool was in order, hmm, you know. I really wouldn't want to be the Ichiha right now. Cracking his neck, Shikaku smirked at the flow of gameplay, Shikamaru must not be on the ball tonight. 
idly moving a grinning tsum to block the chip munching Chaoji, he returned easily, oh, and why would that be, hmm? Smiling, Soom was countered by an enraged Akimaru. Well, the Hokage likes Naruto a lot, and out of everyone on the team he was injured the worst. I mean, they were talking of injuries that could take months to heal. For someone like Naruto, that has to be pretty severe. The Inoshika Cho team was legendary in their abilities and precision. The Yamanaka flair, the Nara brilliance, and the Akimichi strength were fearsome both on and off the battlefield. Yet that one little statement shook them more than the sound invasion. Seeing the doubt and fear on their faces, Shikamaru gave a smirk worthy of his favorite blonde. They had answered a number of questions that hadn't been asked and helped to confirm a troublesome decision. Old people were such useful teachers. Shifting the last piece, a knight with oddly gravity-defying hair, against a wrinkled old queen, he sighed, I concede. Standing, Shikamaru prepared for the future, confident in his chances for the first time in hours. As his son left without a word, Shikaku was forced to stare speechless at the board. The strategy was lacking, the methods were limited, and the defense was splintered, however, while Shikamaru's board screamed weakness, the chaos of the plays had put the seemingly weaker pieces in a perfect position to assassinate the stronger ones. Suddenly, as he sat there, reviewing the last few moves, the nature of their epic struggle became somewhat clearer to his buzzing mind. This game had a purpose, one that he had missed in his state of inebriation. Simply put, it said, I concede. For now. As stated previously, Yamanaka and Moichi was not stupid. That included times where he was drunk. Turning white as a sheet, he looked over his oldest friends, changing history with two little words, he knows. The finality of that statement shook all three of them to their cores. Chaozu looked down in shame, Inoichi blushed in embarrassment, and Shikaku stared at the game, willing it to change in some way. Nara Shikamaru had somehow discovered their involvement with making Naruto's life that much more unpleasant. It wasn't really guaranteed that he knew the ultimate secret, but one thing was clear. He was taking Naruto's side over theirs. Hovering his face, Shikaku was surprised by the moisture there. Children, they can be so. Troublesome. Chapter 5. The Explosive Reaction. Izumo and Kitetsu leaned back, watching the early morning traffic with ease. Honestly, gate guard duty was so relaxing that it was surprising that more people didn't request it. You check for a few changes, look over passports, and direct customers towards the Hokage Tower, simplest C rank in the village. Plus, with the stories you could collect about the weirdos hanging around, getting free drinks was sickeningly easy, especially when the events of the day became known to the general population. Looking up, the two ninja were shocked by the appearance of a departing group containing their boss, the fifth Hokage. They'd know that bust anywhere. Eyes narrowing, Izumo moved to block the departing travelers. Something fishy was going on here. Stop. State your business and intentions. Looking down her nose at the Chunin, the blonde leader called a halt to the group. Hinata tried to look unassuming, while Shizun shifted a sleeping Naruto in her arms. Each was clearly weighed down with backpacks bursting with ceiling scrolls. All in all, they painted a very suspicious picture. Gulping, Izumo refused to back down, if these ninja were impersonating the Hokage and her apprentice and he let them leave unchallenged, it would be prison guard duty for the next three months. Those freaking Baka brothers would either squash him or drive him insane within that kind of time span. Trying to sound authoritative, the nervous Chunin plastered a smile on his face, papers and reason for leaving. Rolling her eyes, Sanadi gripped the Chunin by the neck. I don't have time for this, Izumo. We are leaving for the land of waves for a period of extended medical treatment. Any delays could significantly hinder our efforts, so you might want to get out of the way. Rushing to his friend's defense, Kitetsu tried to defuse the situation before he needed a new drinking buddy, so sorry, Hokage-sama, but we are simply doing our jobs. Any mission below S rank has to be verified if the departure is made through the main gate. We're simply following safety protocols, so if you could provide the needed paperwork for authorization. Dropping the gasping Izumo, Sanadi sighed, she really couldn't get angry at two honest working ninja. That sort of dedication was commendable, but the sooner they left Kanoha the better. However, if she wanted to make a statement before leaving, this was as good a place to start as any. Blinking at a sudden idea, the Hokage smirked, causing the two Chunin to shiver in fear. That sort of look was never good when shown by a strong Kanoichi, Anko was proof enough of that. Taking a single finger, Sanadi tapped the ground in front of the group with the slightest of pressure. The resulting 10-foot deep crater was almost magical in its sudden appearance, and the shockwave was just plain impressive. Izumo and Kitetsu could attest to that, finding themselves knocked off their feet with the carefully directed force. Looking at the two shocked ninja, Sanadi queried an eyebrow. Do you still doubt my identity? Rapidly shaking their heads, the Izumo gulped while Kitetsu sweated, that could have been their heads, or worse. Are you going to continue to stop us? Stuttering out a negative, it took all of the two guards' willpower not to grab each other in fear. 
Smiling lightly at the change of attitude, Tsunade nodded, gesturing for the rest of the group to follow her. Not making a sound, they were out of sight within minutes. Wiping his face Azuma looked over at his oldest friend as he tried to get his feet working again, Kitetsu. Working his eyebrow, Kitetsu nodded, trying to get his shivering under control after getting vertical. Yeah, Azumo. Collapsing behind the sentry post, the Chunin smirked, I am so calling the first round we get for this story. That statement led to an argument for the remainder of the morning. Amura and Kaharu walked down the path to the tower, heads held high and proud. They had protected the village of Kanoha for so long that it felt like a part of them, and today they would finally establish that claim. Once Tsunade was forced to banish Uzumaki, other key agendas could be brought forth for approval or disapproval. However, with the threat of Uzumaki's future constantly in the balance, advice would become dictation, and there was nothing that the blonde bimbo could do about it. Soon, Kanoha would grow stronger than at any point in history, and the threat of Ichiha Itachi would be a thing of the past. Their pleasant daydreams were shattered by the cry of a messenger hawk. Looking at each other in worry, the advisor's council increased their speed to maximum. Tsunade was calling for a full muster of the Jonin, Anbu and Chunin commanders, that was usually only done in time of war. What could have possibly happened in the two days they had left her to stew in her issues? Rushing to the Hokage's office, the advisors headed to the front, unmindful of the rapidly assembling ninja forces filling the room, Tsunade. What is the meaning of this? Sitting behind the desk and flanked by a stony-faced Jiraiya, Tsunade didn't even deem them important enough to look at Hamura, Kaharu, your questions will be answered in due time. Now wait with the others. Ready to put this child in her place, Kaharu was restrained by the wary Hamura, hold on, Kaharu. Such a display would undermine our authority within the ninja ranks. Such discussions are best suited to a private forum. Seeing the frowns from the younger generation in their tone, the old woman held her peace. However, that did not mean she would forget this outrage. Treating the advisor's council like simple average ninja, it was appalling. Within about 20 minutes, all of the on-duty ninja of significant rank within the village were assembled. They would, in turn, provide information to their subordinates and key elements of the Kanoha civilian population. The news provided here would soon spread among the entirety of the village within hours. Smirking at the thought, Sanadi wondered how many heart attacks would be generated by her latest orders. Thank you for coming here. I wish to take this opportunity to share some recent decisions and declarations that will significantly impact Kanoha in the months to come. Would you, Jonin Shiranyu Genma, please come here? The recently healed ninja, in his mouth, came to the front before his Hokage. Taking a series of orders, she held them up for the Jonin to look at. Can you verify that these are sealed and are thus legal orders of the Hokage? Glancing at the papers, Genma felt the metal twig fall from his lips in shock. All he could do was nod weakly. Having reviewed these orders and determined them as genuine, will you please present a summary of them to the assembled forces? Looking at the curious ninja, the pissed-off counselors, and the widening smirk on the blonde leader's face, Genma suddenly wished he was back in the hospital. Clearing his throat, Genma faced a horde as best as he could, well, you seem to have stripped the Ichiha of all of his power and position, withdrawn a large sum of money from the bank in retaliation to crimes committed, and taken two additional apprentices after promoting them to Chunin on your authority. This news caused a rapid number of questions to fly between the gathered forces. The decommissioning of the Ichiha was not well received, he had become their symbol for the future of the clan within Kanoha. The loss of that support was very cruelly felt. However, fines significant enough to warrant a Hokage authorization must have resulted from crimes against the country itself, another thing to be concerned about, especially so soon after the invasion. The apprenticeship notice was a surprise, but not an unwelcome one. At least Kanoha would soon have two additional medical ninjas of Shizun's level to boast about. Say, where was Shizun, anyways? Nodding at the angry mutters, having expected such a response, Sanadi stood, Ichiha Sasuke was declared a traitor, having conspired with sound forces to defect. He was successfully recaptured by a team led by Nara Shikamaru, aided by the head genin of Suna, and personally subdued by Yuzumaki Naruto. Over the course of the mission, the heirs of three clans and two jonin level ninja were placed in significant danger by his actions. He has been imprisoned and will remain within a holding cell for the remainder of his life. What that means for the revival of the Sharingan will be discussed with the appropriate parties in due time. That caused a stillness to envelop the ninja ranks, no matter what sort of authority the Ichiha clan might have welded, traitors could never be tolerated. The fact that Sasuke had attempted to work with Sound, led by Orochimaru, murderer of the third Hokage, was unforgivable. It was regrettable, but the loss of the Ichiha clan appeared to be complete. Nodding at the response Tsunade continued once order was restored, now, as to the issue of those fines. It has come to my attention that several elements within the Kanoha ninja forces intentionally acted to subdue and limit the talents of a prospective ninja during their tenure at the academy. 
since the subject was still a civilian at the time of the attacks, this is a very serious issue, not even counting the mitigating circumstances surrounding him. Elements of the Amanaka, Hyuga, Ichiha, and Anbu have been identified as illegally subjecting this child to a series of uncoordinated sealings that nearly destroyed his chances of joining the ninja ranks. While there appear to be more as of yet unidentified assailants, these groups contributed the most severely to his injuries. With this discovery, each identified subject and clan has been appropriately fined and punished to reflect the severity of the crime. That statement froze everyone in their tracks. Intimidation and abuse of the civilian population was very strongly frowned upon in Kanoha. Each relied upon the other in order to survive and as such, respected a boundary to ensure that awe did not become forced intimidation. However, for an event to garner the notice of the Hokage's office, the victim must have been very highly placed within their society. Who in the village could possibly justify that kind of attention? Buffing her nails a bit, Tsunade smirked, I'm sure that Naruto will feel privileged by your concern for him. That caused the room to explode again, as a vocal minority started bemoaning the fact that Naruto was awarded any sort of compensation for the crimes against him. Surprisingly, the majority of the ninjas present kept their heads, with a smaller group looking outraged at the information. Recently, Yuzumaki had been gaining some admiration and respect, especially after his surprising upset victory against Hayuga Niji and the rumored victory against the Sunage and Shuriki Gara. Therefore, hearing about a fellow ninja of belief being abused in such a fashion set more people's teeth on edge than you might think. Amura and Kaharu were shocked into silence, this might complicate their plan somewhat. Tired of the bickering, Jiraiya stomped forward to regain control, enough. You will stop this now. The following killing intent managed to capture everyone's attention. Staring at the gathered ninjas of Konoha, he proceeded to rip the detractors into little pieces, do you have any idea how insulting you are towards my old student? The fourth was a master of seals unlike any before him, the cage of the Kaiubi is perfect as it is designed. There is no way that the fox can escape from its prison. But to be clear about the seriousness of these actions, let me ask you something. I know that some of you fancy yourselves as sealers, so tell me what would happen to a matrix that had several unplanned and unrelated seals objected to its construction. The scattered, shocked states were his only response. On average, that sort of question came up in such studies within about a month. The answer was ingrained upon the heart of any ninja who studied seals for more than a cheap way to make exploding tags. Nodding, Jiraiya continued with a traditional response, adding random seals to an existing matrix can destabilize or even undo its construction. These self-righteous idiots would have brought the Kaiubi down upon our heads if Minato wasn't a fantastic genius. Even if you don't like the kid, you have to admit the intentional damaging of a Jinchuriki seal is a serious offense. We are very lucky that the main seal held throughout all of this tampering. Having undone the illegal additions, I'm sure that you will all be happy to know that the seal is stronger than ever and reinforced to a greater degree than I ever believed possible. Breathing out sighs of relief, the various students of sealing relaxed, their fears comforted. That sort of elementary mistake should never have been made, no matter how much hate the kid was the focus of, it was just plain unprofessional. Noting that her old teammate had finally run out of steam, Tsunade retook control of the conversation. Yes, thank you Jiraiya. Unfortunately, due to the nature of these crimes and injuries, Naruto will need extensive rehabilitation and isolation to facilitate his recovery. Oh, on that note, Genma if you would be so kind as to verify this last order. Looking at the piece of paper as if it were a python, he glanced over the document, then, believing that his eyes must be going, he reviewed it again. Looking at the Hokage in horror, Genma couldn't even mumble more than a small affirmative. Enjoying the gobsmacked expression, Tsunade stood to finalize her address. Well then, I guess it is official. During the next few months, myself and my three apprentices will be moving into seclusion to check upon and redevelop the mental, physical and spiritual well-being of Chunin Yuzumaki Naruto. Upon my authority, Jirei will be temporarily with limited personal power for six months. If the treatment takes longer, he will assume the position with all of the attached privileges and powers therein. Shouts of outrage and shock filled the office, headed by the Furious Advisors Council. That little twit had significantly damaged all of their goals. She could not get away with this. Pushing his glasses back in irritation, Hamura growled, you do not have the right to do this, Tsunade. We gave you the options available, and you violated those terms. Yuzumaki Naruto will be removed permanently for this. Noting the shock and irritation of various factions, Tsunade stuck her tongue out at the two old bats. I am the Hokage, and you two are simply Jonin, thus under my command. You can threaten, bluster, advise and demand all you bloody want, but no one determines what happens to the ninja under my command besides me. Jiraiya is my proxy, while I go to fix the massive issues you have generated for a hero of this village, as declared by the fourth Hokage. Huffing in anger, Kaharu snapped, no one child is worth as much attention, especially a clan less cretin like Yuzumaki. 
while I agree some punishment is merited, this sort of misappropriation of resources is dangerously close to abuse of power. The strongest ninja of the village are here before you. Do you honestly think that you can stop them all from subduing you before leaving with that thing? Noting the faces of those few willing to follow that illegal action, Sanadi nodded to Jiraiya, dealing with those factions would be his responsibility while she was gone. First of all Kaharu, you just admitted to a level of treason right there. Not only are you contradicting the Hokage, but you are seeking to injure and assassinate a ninja under my command without jurisdiction. Even if you could keep me here, would you try to order my troops against me? Remember your place. As to preventing me from leaving. Smirking at the disgruntled expression, Tsunade brought her hands to form a seal. What makes you think that I am still here? But the poof of smoke Tsunade, the fifth Hokage disappeared from Kanoha for a very long time. Tsunade grinned as the memories of the dispersed shadow clone returned to her. The look on the faces of Hamura and Kaharu were priceless. Running through the trees, Tsunade led her apprentices down a familiar path, one taken by several proud and loyal genin of the leaf scant days before. Tsunade normally would be heading towards their first stop in the rehabilitation, but Naruto's comment from the night before had caught her attention. Reviewing the fight with an enthusiastic Lee and later Gara, she had come to the conclusion that Orochimaru somehow brainwashed the last Kagaya of Mist. Since the medics and Kakashi hadn't mentioned a single thing about this bone guy on their way back, there was a fairly good shot that he was still out there to be collected. Humming out into a clearing, Tsunade whistled at the sight, that was a lot of very big bones. It was like a combination of forest and gaping maw, dozens of white spears spread out across the plains, angrily attacking the sky. However, that really wasn't what she was interested in. Holy. What the heck happened to him? He looks like a dinosaur. Smiling at the sight of a slightly worn out corpse, Tsunade grabbed a scroll. Well Naruto, it looks like he had a second stage cursed seal form like you said Sasuke developed. The fact that he is still in this state is actually very useful to us. Turning from the sight, Hinata tried to remain strong, this was one of the first times that she had seen a dead enemy up close and personal. However, if she was going to help Naruto deal with enemies such as S-Class Missing Ninja, such things would probably become more common than she liked. Shizune placed Naruto on the ground, handing him Tauntin for the moment. Stretching after the invigorating run, she headed over to help her mistress, so, what do you think he can tell us? Winding up, Tsunade punched the base of the bone pillar. The fact that he remained in cursed form after death is interesting, all of the other retrieved corpses reverted to normal after passing. Something about his release appears to have frozen him in this state, which will make studying the curse seal and Kagaya abilities more effective. Turning green at the scientific talk for slicing someone up and playing with his innards, Naruto gave Tauntin a particularly hard pat. Is that really necessary, Bachan? I mean, he's dead, he can't hurt anyone anymore, right? Sighing at her new apprentice's naivety, Tsunade prepared a sealing scroll to preserve the body until they could set up base somewhere. Actually, given Orochimaru's love of the bloody curse seal, studying him could lead to hurting the snake if nothing else. Don't worry about it Naruto, you two won't have to help with this sort of thing yet. Gulping, Hinata looked at her new master, why why? Yet, Tsunade-sama. Shizune hummed as she traced preservation seals all over the corpse. As distasteful as it might seem, Hinata-chan, studying dead enemy ninja, is often done by medic nin to learn anatomy and uncover secret techniques left in the body. It's one of the reasons that hunter nin are so important, if an enemy managed to learn Kanoha secrets from our dead or missing nins, we'd have to develop new and complicated defenses against our own methods. However, all the hidden villages do it to some degree, the Sharingan just made us a little lazy. It is actually among the strongest in the field. Trailing off at the sudden dark vibe, Shizune winced at the gloom surrounding her two junior apprentices, she obviously needed to choose her words with more care with these two. Finishing the sealing of not only the body, but several samples of bone, Tsunade frowned at the atmosphere. That's enough of that, now. We have to make tracks if we're going to make it to our first stop within the next three days. Shaking off the depression, both Chunin nodded firmly. Now was not the time to worry about such things. They had a goal and a responsibility, moping could wait until later. Pausing, Tsunade sighed, oh, and before I forget, I need you. The fewer people who notice the symbol of the leaf, the longer our cover will last, na. Blinking, Hinata handed over her badge with minimal complaint. Naruto, on the other hand, looked like someone had kicked his puppy, hard. You'd better hold on to that, Bachan. Iruka sensei gave it to me, and I earned it with blood and tears. Smiling at the gusto that had been lacking recently from the blonde, Tsunade carefully sealed the important symbol in front of the fretting Naruto. There, all done. Let's head out then, we still have a lot of ground to cover. Taking her turn in carrying Naruto and ignoring the resulting blush she sported at the action, Tsunade hopped through the trees, each apprentice following easily at their current pace. I wonder what Jureya is doing to those idiots now. Upon the dispersal of smoke, the advisor's council was quick to act. 
Turning to the Anbu captains, Hamura barked, start tracing the paths of departure, starting from Uzumaki's hospital room. She couldn't have gotten too far without anyone noticing. Glaring at the assembled Jonin, Kaharu gritted out, start interviewing the other rookie Genin teams. Perhaps we can determine if Uzumaki leaked out information through conversations or odd comments. We must stop Sanadi before she brings shame down upon Konoha. Noting the tensing of muscles, both began preparing mentally for the needed damage control. Summoning Jutsu. Not only to be wrapped in giant toad tongues. Sitting behind the desk of the Hokage, Jirei released a fraction of his killing intent. Everyone pretty much stopped breathing at that point. Cracking his knuckles for emphasis, Jirei frowned, I believe that you are going to disregard those orders. They are, after all, without authorization. Shrugging off the oppressive feeling of doom, Kaharu felt like screaming. It was only the years of experience and focus that kept her response somewhat civil, Jiraiya. What the hell do you think you are doing? We cannot allow Tsunade to abandon Konoha in its hour of need. Release us at once. Well, more or less civil, all things considered. Leaning back in the nice comfy chair, the toad sage quirked an eyebrow, abandoned. So evaluating the physical, mental and spiritual damage that a secondary faulty sea Larey accomplished when applied to Konoha's Jinchuriki is somehow abandoning her role in Konoha. To protect her ninja from all enemies, including internal ones. I think that you need a checkup when she gets back. Bristling at the dig being made about them, it was all the two elders could do not to try to kill Jiraiya right then and there. Slamming a fist down upon the desk for emphasis, Jiraiya addressed the crowd, mindful that most hadn't moved since his demonstration of power. Listen up, maggots. Sanadi has left me as her proxy, so my word is currently her word. As authenticated by a jonin of good standing within Konoha, her orders stand. Anbu and Chunin commanders are hereby ordered to disseminate the necessary facts to the various factions within Konoha. Jonin with Jenin and Junior Chunin are to provide the necessary details to their subordinates. Any remaining ninja who is also ahead of their respective clan is to remain, the rest are dismissed. The vast majority of the ninja forces couldn't leave fast enough. Nodding to the remaining Jonin and Special Jonin who helped to lead the major ninja clans, Jiraiya stood resolute. Before dispersing his toads to release the elders from five feet in the air. No problem for an active ninja. Repositioning themselves as quickly as possible, Hamura and Kaharu tried to forget the sensation of falling on their backsides. Not for a jury after a couple of retirees. Not so much. Now for those of you who remain, one of the last decrees that Tsunade issued needs to be addressed. Grunting, soon cocked her head. What the hell could match the rest of those freaking orders? Shibi patted his old friend on the shoulder, relaxed soon. Jiraiya is not so foolish as to aggravate the clan heads further. Although, I think that a discussion with Sanadi is in order upon her return. Clearing his throat, Jiraiya hoped the shock would buy him some more time. He was just lucky that Sanadi's idea was such an attractive bone. It actually has to do with the Achiha clan. That brought everyone's focus directly upon his head. Snorting in irritation, Hiashi stared Jiraiya down coolly. What are you speaking of? The last Achiha has already been imprisoned for life. A resurrection of the Sharingan is impossible now. Shaking his head, Jiraiya sighed, before leaving, Sanadi recognized the necessity of the Sharingan for our future forces. Therefore, she has authorized the extraction of genetic samples for a set number of pregnancies. This news was almost as shocking as Sanadi leaving in the first place. Ordering the forced dissemination of genetic material from a was nearly taboo within Konoha. In a village that honored such clans so religiously, such an order was the equivalent of raping a corpse. To ensure the sanctity of their various abilities, ninja bodies were always burned within hours of their recovery or death before entombment. This was actually one of the major reasons that a dozen Kakashis hadn't sprung up after the Achiha massacre, despite what some had suggested. Seeing the looks of shock turning to outrage, the old pervert smirked, Achiha Sasuke, was responsible for the continuation of his, but through his own acts, has become unsuitable for the job. Since the Sharingan was one of the major reasons that the kid got whatever he wanted for the last few years, some compensation seems to be in order. The ninja clans are ordered to evaluate any possible candidates within their households for impregnation after compatibility issues are examined. Since we are looking to recoup our losses within the next few years, let's start with subjects around 17 to 24. In addition, every single, fertile and unattached Kanoichi of the appropriate age group will be evaluated as backups in case insufficient numbers can be drawn from the clans. Turning to the sputtering elders, he continued with barely a pause, your job is to find a selection of civilian candidates who are well placed enough to raise the kids in an appropriate fashion. We need a plan in place in case the Ichiha bloodline is recessive and is thus dominated by the stronger traits of another established ninja clan. Oh, and if it is unclear to anyone, this is all being done with a test tube. That kid is getting no sex or any form of visitation for the rest of his life. Tsunade was fairly strict about that. 
Restraining her outrage at the horrific treatment, Kaharu snarled, this isn't over Jiraiya. We'll find those candidates, but mark my words, there will be consequences for these actions. When certain parties hear about this, you will beg for mercy. Smile turning grim, Jiraiya looked her straight in the eye, you'd better believe it you old geezer. In fact, I have already planned to deal with his concerns as we speak. Saratobi Asuma had seen and done many things within his life, but the times in the capital were among his brightest memories. While there, he had escaped the intricate power plays of his youth and felt like he was actually accomplishing something concrete. He would protect the fire daimyo and ensure the peace of the fire country as a member of the Twelve Elite Guardians. It seemed so simple back then, and that innocence was one of the recollections that kept him sane. However, he did not rise to Jonin rank with just his good looks, connections were everything at the higher levels of politics, and Jurea was smart enough to capitalize upon that. Thus, it was after a mere two-hour waiting period that Asuma was shown into the daimyo's personal reception area to present Sanadi's final orders. Kneeling a mere five to Tommy lengths from the raised dais, a sign of personal trust and honor, Asuma watched the face of his old commander. Although his lined face gave nothing away, Daimyo's eyes betrayed irritation, a sign of great anger for one such as him. I am not pleased with this turn of events, Asuma Kun. Keeping his eyes lowered, Jonin had to fight the urge to scratch his head in embarrassment. I apologize, Daimyo Sama, but Sanadi Sama is strong in her convictions. She saw the insinuations of the advisor's council as a threat to her power and acted accordingly. Glancing over the reports, justifications and arguments attached to the copies of Tsunade's decrees, it was all the aged statesman could do not to snort in irritation. These excuses were cover for her real agenda, a temper tantrum because someone had given her advice she did not like. As admirable as I find her compassion, such actions on the behalf of one Kanohe Genin, no matter what his circumstances, does appear excessive. Although, I have to admit that the secondary seals concern me somewhat. That sort of abuse can lead to copycats if not carefully monitored or contained. Thinking quickly, Asuma jumped upon the slide opening. What he was about to do was outside his primary orders, but somehow, he didn't think that Jureya would mind that much. While I assure you that Kanoha is in capable hands with Jureya as proxy, the situation was aggravated because key elements within the Kanoha hierarchy were granted extraordinary powers above their station. If that endorsement was limited or removed, I am sure that the situation could be brought under control in an expedited fashion. This was a direct challenge, one that the daimyo couldn't miss, by removing his protection from the advisor's council and danzo, the situation could be fixed easily. Smiling lightly at the simple yet effective tactic, the leader of the fire country couldn't help but sigh. While I lack the authority to directly alter or impede orders made by the Hokage within the Konoha military structure, I believe that those endorsements should remain in place for the moment. There is much more that you have yet to learn, Asuma-kun. Standing, the daimyo turned towards the wall, where a picture of the elemental countries was placed. Staring at the borders that could shift daily, and alliances that had often changed hourly in the past, the daimyo spoke as the old man he felt like, I am in a somewhat difficult situation here, Asuma Kun. While I admired the fire and brilliance of your father, elements of the government have called his competence into question. Given that the recent action of Sound and Suna was driven by Arachimaru, one of the infamous Anan and students of the Sandane, there is much apathy towards the other holders of the title. I do not believe that Sanadi or Jureya have as many friends in high places as they might think. Fighting to keep the frustration out of his voice, Asuma tried to reason with the leader, but Daimyo Sama. They are the strongest of our village, with their help Kanoha will grow and prosper. Smiling lightly, Daimyo turned to face his old subordinate once again. How, may I ask, is drinking across the country and writing pornography a way of strengthening the village? An uncomfortable stretched between the two for minutes after that declaration. The smoking Jonin could not find an answer for that. Breaking the stalemate, the daimyo tried to reason with his old friend, the sooner someone in power realized this, the better off everyone would be in the end. The Hokage must be strong in both reputation and willpower. However, the position is mostly a young man's sport. Sandane was negligent in his failure to appoint a successor, and that has led to the current problem. Tsunade is acceptable as a holder of the title, however many do not trust her with the power of the position. Reseating himself, the daimyo smirked, thus a compromise has been reached that everyone can agree to. By leaving those elements with my support in place to balance the Hokage influence for the current generation, to ensure Kanoha's survival until the next generation takes root. Admittedly, their agenda against the poor boy is somewhat disturbing, but as you well know, sacrifices must sometimes be made. Stiffening at the knowledge revealed to him that fateful night two days ago, Asuma had to fight the urge to yell in anger. He might not have treated the kid badly or anything, but the insult against the fourth's only son now stung badly. However, such knowledge shouldn't be brandied about with reckless abandon, everything has its time and place, Daimyo-sama, I beg you to reconsider, attacking Yuzumaki Naruto will not gain the country anything. 
he is but an innocent child who acts as our protector from great evil and wrath. Staring at the young man who he trusted with his life, the leader of the country shook his head sadly, yet to protect the millions of innocents from the threat of Akatsuki and Orochimaru, the loss of one is an unpleasant yet necessary reality. I am sorry Asuma-kun, but Jurei will be dealing with the elders for some time. Until a strong and capable Hokage comes to power, his influence must be checked. Otherwise, I will be dealing with anarchy within the month. Please give my regards to your leader. Down low, the young Jonin cringed on the inside, he was never going to hear the end of this when he got back. Chapter 6. The Awkward Method to My Madness They had been traveling for hours, and as the sun began its descent Hanada was feeling winded. Being in Yuzuka Kiba's teammate, she was used to constant hyperactivity. But teammate had never traveled for more than three hours without a break, and Tsunade had been pushing them full throttle for nearly five. Even with most of their camping supplies sealed by Jiraiya, the constant use of chakra and physical exertion was wearing her down. While no one else seemed tired, although since Naruto was being carried, he didn't really count, and she hated being seen as weak, if Hinata didn't get a chance to rest soon, she'd fall right from the trees. Clearing her throat, the shy Kinoichi was about to ask when they would be stopping, when Tsunade and Shizun seemed to stumble mid-step. Since this occurred while they were leaping through the branches, it was almost a disaster. The young brunette was able to catch herself and Tauntin at the last minute, holding her head in pain. Tsunade, however, grabbed a branch on her way to the forest floor, incidentally squeezing Naruto in a rather uncomfortable position, one that Jiraiya would have given his fortune for to trade places with the hyperactive blonde. Coming to a stop, Hinata felt mortified, I I. I'm sorry. I dd didn't mean to distract you. Is everybody alright? Dropping to the ground, Tsunade carefully dislodged Naruto's skull, noting the dazed expression and concern. Don't worry about it Hinata. We just got a little backlash from that from earlier, and it caught us off guard. It's about time to rest for the night anyways. Reaching into her medical pack for some aspirin, Shizun smiled, if you could find firewood, Hinata-chan, we can get started on setting up camp. We've made good time, and probably should confer a bit before continuing. Nodding, Hinata quickly activated her and prepared to track the needed dry twigs and sticks. The only person better than her at finding fire starting materials on teammate was Shino, and that was because he could talk to termites. Reassured that Naruto was alright, Tsunade left him to confer with Shizun, she had another evil plan to concoct. Although carrying the kid like a sack of rice wasn't so bad yet, they had a lot of parties who were interested in the boy. Not to mention, it was clear that his invalid status was wearing Naruto down badly. There had hardly been a peep or whisper from him during the entire trip. Naruto was used to leading and doing, so relying on others this much must have been excruciating. Therefore, the sooner that Naruto could be made independently mobile the better for everyone involved. A normal patient with comparable trauma would take months to recover. However, Naruto did not have months, and they couldn't watch over him 24-7. So, she would have to rely upon his absurd regenerative abilities, insane natural muscle memory, and sheer inhuman stubbornness to accelerate the process. It might be a little degrading, but all in all, who was around to complain? Besides, the look on his face would be priceless. Looking at the determined Hinata, Tsunade made a point to remember to have Shizun work with the girl lunch acra control and dodging exercises. Starting slow was always the best when dealing with nervous students. Why, her first apprentice had been so scared by the great and powerful Tsunade Sama when she started training that fainting spells were not uncommon. Those two would work well together to get Hinata up to speed while she treated Naruto. Plus, if the girl's scores were any indication, she would make a good tutor, probably the best place for her until all of that stuttering and blushing died down a bit. Young puppy love was so cute. Tapping the ground to make a fire pit, Tsunade began to mentally review the supplies in their packs, as well as the training methods to be used over the next few months. If Naruto was going to survive, she would do her damn best to make sure that was possible. The training scrolls from the Hokage vault would accomplish most of that, but he would need some guidance in order to shine. Hinata was honestly a nice surprise, and if she showed some backbone the little Hyuga would become quite the Kinoichi. A little confidence, some ninjutsu variety, and herbal lore, and she would go far. How far was up to her, but that was a bridge to cross when they got to it. Blinking, she turned around, with all of the preparations to make, Tsunade had almost forgotten. Oh by the way Naruto Tanzania says hi. That spectacle was outrageous. Amura and Danzu were quiet as Kahara vented in their secret conference room, deep within the bowels of Konoha. This area had been carefully constructed with a route in mind, and most of the ninja population was unaware of its existence. Access was through invitation only, and with their recently solidified alliance, the advisors' council had gladly joined Danzo here to plot. It was secure from Jurea's agents, and there were no young impressionable ninja ranks to maintain their facade for. Everyone here had known one another for too long for that. Shaking in rage, the ancient, by ninja standards, Kinoichi continued to fume. 
I cannot believe the level of arrogance that little brat has shown, abandoning Kanoha using legal loopholes when the village is in such desperate need of her protection. Then, she left Yureya in charge. With no warning or notice she leaves to go traipsing off to God knows where. Rubbing his eyes in irritation, Hamura shook his head in agreement, while well, I can admire her tactics and drive, this is a disaster waiting to happen. When word gets out that the Hokage is running around without any guards or backup, I will begin a manhunt of epic proportions. When it becomes known that an unsealed Hayuga is wandering around the elemental nations with such a meager support network, Kumo will start sending hordes of missing nins to retrieve the Byakugan. Who knows what the factions in Kiri will do once they see that much potential out there ripe for the taking. Tsunade must be returned before a major confrontation occurs. Humming slightly, Danzo couldn't help but allow a grin to form, however, despite this setback, we have gained more than it appears. Turning towards the old cripple, their disbelief was tangible. What are you talking about, Danzo? What have we gained from this disaster, besides humiliation and an increased danger level for Konoha? Tapping his cane, a nervous gesture that only happened when he was particularly agitated, it was all Danzo could do not to laugh. The issue of the limiting seals opens entirely new avenues of opportunity to examine. After reviewing this matrix, it is clear to see that Yuzumaki will become a warrior of unmatched potential. The only reason we did not wish to use him as a weapon was concern over his real abilities, concerns that will no longer apply once he is reclaimed. If we allow Tsunade to get him patched up, we will have a resource of exceptional strength to use against Itachi and Orochimaru. All we have to do is bring him under our control, and he might even become a potential puppet Hokage in the future. Although Kahara looked like she had swallowed a lemon, neither could argue with the statement. The depth of limitation that Yuzumaki had fought under was a little nerve-wracking, all things considered, if he was able to manage a performance of mid-level Chunin while so incapacitated, what could he do with his full potential? He was young, unrefined, and surprisingly inspiring, an excellent puppet to control the next generation. That is, if they could gain control of him. Practically rubbing his hands together in glee, Danzu felt alive for the first time in years. Not only that, while the prestige of the Achiha clan has taken a major hit, many of the civilian population will still idolize the power that the Sharingan possesses. By using that as bait, you can influence the key members of the civilian population with actual power, shoring up support and control of the village. Looking like the bandaged man was an idiot, Hamura snapped, of course we realize that, Danzo. The potential gains from winnowing key applicants for the revitalization of the Achiha clan were obvious. However, no matter how much potential Yuzumaki might have or what concessions we might be able to gain from the civilian population, that doesn't change the fact that Tsunade is gone. Without her, we are in a significantly weakened position. Waving off the concerns with his cane, Danzu sighed, as irritating as it might sound, with Jiraiya as the Hokage's proxy, most foreign powers will hesitate to attack us. They will not see a divided village, they'll see one of the Sanin ready to defend. In fact, this proxy issue makes things a little easier for us, since Jurei will not be able to speak with his own voice. That will weaken his position within the village enough for us to gain some significant control. In fact, if we are careful, we might even capture some samples of the Achiha for personal independent use. Snorting at the old ally's obsession with breeding programs, Kaharu glared, we will not be able to do much until the safety and security protocols are established. Jurei will be careful in case Kabuto or another sound spy attempts to infiltrate again. Well, it might be possible, we cannot rely upon it as fact just yet. Weary of all the harping, Danzu stood, I think that we have covered everything that can be discussed this evening, none of us are quite as spry as we used to be. I will send a team to the capital to appraise the daimyo of the situation, and another to track Tsunade. Let us retire for the evening to discuss the tactics concerning the issue tomorrow. Nodding in agreement, the advisor's council stood to be escorted from the barracks. They might be allies, but Danzu was never foolish enough to share everything with anybody. It was honestly one of the things that they admired about him, only the Kasha survive in the world of ninja after all. Dogs might not be bloodhounds, but they can follow pheromones just as well as the next animal. Asu clung to the ceiling, thankful that the old but still wily ninja had left without noticing him. He had truly struck pay dirt with this sort of information. If not for the stink of marking slime coming from Himura and Kaharu, he might never have found this path into Root's base. He still had to map out the pathways, major exits and entrances, and track potential collaborators for the next few days, but if all goes well, Jurei would be able to pluck Root out at the base, removing one of the major threats to Naruto bro. Gamma Kichi and Gamma Tatsu wouldn't shut up about the guy, and the boss Gamma Bunta had acknowledged him as a true henchman of the Toads. Thus, if these guys were going to mess with him, it was up to Kasuk to show them who was boss. Leaping silently to the ground, the Purple Toad proceeded to sneak into the hidden base. Despite what Tsunade might believe, Naruto wasn't quite out of frustration. He hadn't been raising a stink because he was more confused now than at any other point in his life. 
Ever since he had woken up in the hospital, Naruto had been noticing more and more things seemed different. The stress of Tsunade's news and his recent promotion to Chunin had successfully distracted him for a while. But now that he was spending hours being carried, the normally hyperactive ninja didn't have anything to do except think. What was normally an exercise in pain now came clearly and without issue. He wasn't sure if that was an improvement or not. Every touch, sight and smell seemed a hundred times stronger, the world was more real than anything else. Normally, unless something was moving or threatening him, Naruto couldn't really be bothered to notice it. However, everything nearby was screaming for his attention, from the sound of Hinata's sandal hitting the ground to the warmth from Tsunade Bachan's hug from earlier. It was almost like the world was missing some color or outline, and it was suddenly fixed. Naruto was feeling completely overloaded and didn't know how to deal with the sensation. Another confusing thing was the reaction to all of the physical interaction. First there was Sakura's hug, then Hinata holding his hand, Shizu Nichan carrying him to Tsunade Bachan accidentally suffocating him in her chest. All of these events within the last two days made up more physical attention and affection than he had received at any point in his entire life. Not sure how to deal with the resulting emotions, years of conditioning from Sakura came to the forefront as he kept his mouth shut so they wouldn't hit him for being a pervert. But if he couldn't manage a bathroom trip on his own soon, the blonde might just stab himself in the brain to save himself from a heart attack. Boy, Naruto. Stiffening, Naruto turned to the smiling Tsunade gulping, that sort of tone never meant anything good for him. Yeah, Tsunade Bachan. What's up? Smile widening at the nervous ninja, it was all the blonde Hokage could do not to cackle, this was going to be so much fun. Since we've got some downtime, I thought we could do some basic training to get you into a bit of shape. You're physically healed, but you need some time to readjust to your regrown muscles. Herking up, Naruto grinned, this was just the sort of thing to get his mind focused. Training always made everything better. Trying to act cocky, despite his uncoordinated limbs and confused mind, Naruto made a peace sign, bring it, Bachan. Cracking her knuckles, Sanadi crouched down. The point of this exercise is simple, get to the other side of the clearing and back. I will follow you, and for every time that I think that you are slacking, I will tickle you to tears. Noting the shocked look on the blonde's face, Shizun giggled while holding up a camera, plus, every time that she catches you, I'm going to take pictures until you escape. Gulping, Naruto was beginning to wish that Iro Senen had taken him as an apprentice instead. Ready? Start. What is the red chakra? Waiting for Kurenai sensei to pick her up, Sakura couldn't stop thinking about the confrontation with Sasuke yesterday. The meeting had stirred up so many emotions and issues that it was all she could do to wake up this morning. Questions about her devotion to Sasuke, her complex feelings of love and jealousy when dealing with him consumed Sakura's mind. The raw anger that being dismissed like that sparked deep within her soul, to the loss of confidence that his comments generated, all of these facts ran around her brain until practically early morning. If it wasn't for some very strong tea, Sakura would probably still be passed out or a zombie. Yet after all of that thinking, the one question that came to mind was, ironically, from Sasuke-kun's own mouth about Naruto. They had been teammates for months, and thinking back, Sakura had begun to notice certain things that didn't add up. Moments of great danger where Naruto began to show anger or aggressive behavior, wounds that healed within minutes that should have taken days, eyes that slit or shifted color, these clues churned through Sakura's mind, trying to find a pattern. It made no sense that the idiot who she had begun to like a bit as a friend could have such a huge secret. As far as she knew, since being on Team 7, she was the closest to Naruto that anyone ever had been before. When all of the parents told their children to stay away. Browning, Sakura tried to remember why she had been told to stay away from Naruto for so many years. Thinking about it, no reason was ever given or suggested, just the simple fact that Naruto was trouble. As funny as some of his pranks were throughout the academy, it only encouraged his isolation. But the warning started years before the pranks, almost as soon as she had seen him on the street. Why tell everybody to stay away from a little kid like that? It was just so confusing. Then there were the suppression seals Tsunade Sama had talked about. What could people be scared of enough to hurt a little kid like that? Some paint bombs didn't equate mental and physical trauma of that level. She might have started seeing Naruto as a friend, but hearing something like that made her wonder who Yuzumaki Naruto really was. At least the ban on talking with her peers was over, so she could pick Ino's brain for ideas. Despite her flighty appearance, the loud blonde was smart and was hooked up to the greatest gossip network in the village. If anyone could figure out why this had been done to Naruto, she could. Or you could always get up off your butt and ask him. Cha. Shaking her head at the inner Sakura's sudden intervention, Sakura chugged the rest of her tea. No, I can't do that. He's going to be in rehabilitation for months. I won't distract Naruto while he's recovering. Common, it wouldn't take that long. Besides, we're among his precious people, aren't we? One little question won't change that. 
rubbing her temples in irritation, Sakura was about to answer before hearing a pounding on the door. Getting a feeling of deja vu, she proceeded to the door, assuming that Kurenai-sensei was here to begin working on the revision to Team 8. Opening it, Sakura had to suppress the urge to dispel the obvious, this couldn't be right. Standing on her front walkway, with a sake bottle and bag of dango in hand, stood the second examiner from the Chunin exam, Mitarashi Anko. She cut a very imposing figure, and despite the slight reddish tinge in her cheeks, Anko was clearly still a scary, creepy and dangerous ninja. Someone who licked blood for fun was definitely not a person to piss off. However, the look she was pinning the gen in with didn't help Sakura's state of mind at all. It was almost like a mouse facing the glare of a hawk. Taking a swig from her bottle, the snake Kinoichi was her normal charming self. Are you that Haruno Brad? Seemingly ignoring the frantic nodding, she grabbed the pink-haired Jenin's little shoulder, Kuranai's tied up with a debriefing in the hospital. She called in a favor to have me talk with you for a bit. Afterwards, you are going to head out to meet her at Ichiraku's for a meal, that is, if you can stomach anything after we chat. Licking her lips, Anko gave the terrified Jenin her best, I'm the scariest bitch you'll ever meet smirk. As always, it worked like a charm. Shuddering at the look, Sakura barely managed to close the door before being away. Yamanaka Enoichi was deep in thought. Over the years, he had not given the Kaiubi Jinchuriki much attention, other than warning his little girl to avoid the brat. It wasn't that he distrusted the fourth, but anything associated with the fox had very negative connotations in Konoha. Being linked with Naruto could be very damaging socially and could result in an attack on her person. So even if it was a little cruel, Enoichi had acted to protect his princess. It hadn't taken much to persuade Ino that Naruto was bad news and the rumor mill was soon buzzing with her input. Making the kid a pariah might have been a little extreme, but if it protected their children, no harm no foul, right? Wrong. Walking down the main street, he could already see that the various factions were reeling in shock. Merchants and ninja alike were chatting on the streets like gossiping housewives, spreading the tale of Tsunade's leave of absence and the crimes committed against Yuzumaki. There were undertones of fear, from possible attack to Jureya's changing the decency laws for his own amusement, anger from the decommissioning of Sasuke to excitement for the possible repopulation of the clan with volunteers, and then there were the responses from his fellow Kanoha citizens as he walked down the street. Many of the ninja were neutral, especially until the clan's personal reaction to Jinzo and Kenshin's actions was determined, but the civilians. Nodding at another cheerful greeting, Inoichi felt each step become heavier and heavier. Thought the civilian population was practically giddy. It was as if the criminals who brutalized a little boy were heroes. Everywhere he looked, no matter how dangerous the seals were for the safety of Kanoha, another civilian was beaming at the guts of the Amanaka clan. That heroic group who, along with the Ichiha and the Hayuga, acted to protect Kanoha from the manipulations of the Kaiubi, weakening him to be taken out later. This sort of reaction was sickening. The Noichi had done things during the war that woke him up late at night, actions of such horror were common in brutal times. However, the one way that he went back to sleep was the understanding that every atrocity, every death or torture, was for the good of Kanoha. They were not acts that he enjoyed or celebrated, but each was needed to protect his home. Under no normal circumstances could he condone such actions, yet his family was considered heroes because of assault and abuse. This was not what he wanted at all. Luckily the adoration wasn't universal, or he would have had to question the necessity of saving Kanoha. That Raymond girl had given a cold look, a couple of the store owners were less than friendly, and the weapon store clerk refused to look him in the face. Some of the civilian women who had seen the Chunin exam had glared as he walked by, and academy students had tried to chuck an egg at him. But the majority of Kanoha, most of whom had never even seen Naruto, was ecstatic. This had to be corrected before he decided to puke at the horror of it all. His friends were no help this time. Chaozo was still reeling at the fact he had called for Yuzumaki's death, the same Yuzumaki who brought Tsunade sama back to heal his son. Shikaku had spent hours staring at that shogi board, contemplating the game with Shikamaru, before going to bed. No one really knew how to talk about the fact that, as a group, the original Ino Shikacho had been complicit in a case of child abuse. Realizing that Naruto was truly a human child was nearly the most traumatic event of the week, right behind their children nearly dying at the hands of sound. Shuddering, Inoichi didn't even want to contemplate the younger generation's reactions. Despite their best efforts, many of the children now saw Naruto as a friend, as such, when they found out about the abuse, if they didn't know already. Seeing the smiling face of his kinsman, ragged and without a but alive, Inoichi squared his shoulders. If he was ever going to be able to view the Yamanaka clan with pride again, something extreme would have to be done. Asping for breath, Naruto cursed the new enhanced senses with his entire being. If those pictures ever got out, he'd never be made Hokage. Running had not been possible for the young ninja, so he had been forced to crawl. It seemed that, every time he stopped to rest, Sanadi Bachan would swoop down to attack, with Shizun gleefully recording the abuse. 
it looked so pathetic that even Hinata, nice sweet Hinata, had started giggling at him. Naruto had never felt more humiliated in his life. Throughout the entire raging monologue, he steadfastly refused to acknowledge the part of him that not only enjoyed the attention, but had fun while doing it. Surprisingly, Sanadi's hunch proved to be correct. Not having any time to think about the situation, Naruto had instinctively acted to flee as quickly as possible. Since he wasn't thinking during the process, his body automatically started to move more efficiently. The work of a couple of months was done in two hours, it was somewhat terrifying how strong Naruto was. But the little training, he'd be punching craters in no time. Of course at the moment, all he could do was walk with a limp, but it was a major improvement. Stirring the stew, Shizun hummed in consideration, say, Sanadi sama Perhaps now would be a good time for Hinata-chan to help with the training. Dinner is going to be about an hour from now, so we have some time. Looking over the shy little Hayuga, Sanadi had to agree, everyone had to get used to one another for them to remain safe. While Hinata's crush was cute, some desensitization was in order. Otherwise, an ambush could grab the fainting girl and put the entire group at risk. Besides, Shizun was making dinner and she needed a break. This little exercise shouldn't take too long and was well within their respective abilities. Anyway, Naruto wasn't crass enough to lash out at such a sweet girl, it probably went against his man code or something. Helping the stumbling but stable ninja closer to the fire, Sanadi handed him a book. Alright, Naruto, I want you to look over this text and have Hinata help you if you have any trouble with it, okay? Glancing at the title, Naruto felt his hair bristle, this wasn't a book of cool just to. Bachan. What the hell? This is. Humming over at Shizun's request, Hinata blinked at the title, AA, isn't that the first year academy review text? Nodding at the two shocked teenagers, Sanadi smiled sadly, Naruto, those seals hindered your ability to learn. We're going to start from the ground up and review everything to make sure you can understand it. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time continuing on to advance jutsu. Don't worry though, if you pick it up quickly enough, we should finish the texts before the end of the week. Wilting at the reminder of the suppression seals, Naruto grumbled as he opened the text at the beginning. Hesitant, Hinata placed a reassuring hand on his shoulder, hoping to encourage him. Getting so close without fainting was difficult, but Hinata needed to help Naruto, he had already done so much for her, it would be horrible of her not to try. Glancing up at the touch, Naruto gave a wry grin which painted Hinata's face scarlet in short order. The rapid stream of questions kept her focus though, and the two began to slowly review the text together. It was a little painful to need help on such basic stuff, but Naruto was glad he had a friend there to aid him this time. Grinning at the sight, Sanadi started pulling out her own reading material, confident that the proximity seal Shizun had placed earlier would alert them of any danger. She had some special materials with her, and now was the perfect time to review them. Some of these techniques had never left the village archives before, so she wanted to be fully trained in their use before proceeding. What are you talking about, Kurinai-sensei? Hiba, despite his wounded side and injured partner, looked ready to tear out somebody's throat. Shino had come by after his earlier mission, and the two were chatting, i.e., Kiba was chatting, while Shino was occasionally nodding, when Kurinai-sensei had entered with a skinny Choji, a nervous Ino, and a slouching Shikamaru. Lining up the younger Kanoha ninja, she had explained that, while their mission was a success, certain things had happened because of it. Naruto had almost died capturing the Achiha, and the healing scans had shown some troubling things. Because of this, Lady Tsunade had taken Naruto from the village to heal him in private, taking Shizun and Hinata with her. That, you see, was the part that the Inuzuka was having trouble with. Hinata was a sweet girl who obviously had a crush on Naruto to some degree. She was part of his pack and hadn't even told them she was leaving. While Hinata was like a sister to him, Kiba did like the girl and was confused by the declaration that she had to follow Naruto into seclusion. It didn't make any sense. Based upon the look some of the other genin were throwing around, he wasn't the only one confused by this turn of events. Pinching her nose in irritation, Kurinai sighed, Kiba, these injuries were suppression seals, placed on Naruto years ago. Do you have any idea how horrible that kind of action is? It's like whole sections of Naruto's potential were cut out with a rusty kunai, limiting him to a fraction of what he could be. That sort of treatment is criminal, and it was perpetuated by ninjas within Konoha. Of course the Hokage doesn't want him anywhere near here while he's recovering, I think that she's worried she'll kill someone in retaliation. Sliding his sunglasses up, Shino started the frustrated Jonin down as best as he could, nevertheless, Sensei, you have failed to answer the question. Why was Hinata dragged off to aid in his recovery? Smiling sadly, Kurinai shrugged her shoulders, Hokage-sama reviewed Hinata's information, battled at the Chunin exams, and tested her special healing salve, based upon that she decided to take Hinata on as an apprentice. Judging from the speed that they left, I just don't think that she had time to say goodbye. The shocked silence was golden to her ears. Shaking her head in denial, Ino grasped for straws, but Kurinai-sensei. 
this whole thing doesn't make any sense. Naruto might be a little stupid and silly, but that's no reason to abuse him like that. What sort of jerk seal up a little kid? Before she could answer Inoichi entered the room, his face a stone mask, you know, you need to come home now. There is a clan judgment that requires everyone to attend. Shocked by the tone, Ino tried the puppy dog eye technique, it hadn't failed her since she was three. But daddy. I'm trying to find out about Naruto. Some freaks hurt him, and I need to find out who to help beat up. Toking at the word freak, Inoichi glared down at his daughter, now, Ino. This cannot wait. Gulping, the young Kanoichi followed with a quick nod to her friends. This sort of behavior was very troubling and weird, so something big must have happened. Humming his face, Shikamaru could guess what it was about. Things are going to get very troublesome in the near future. Turning to the remaining Genin and one Chunin, Kurinai calmly continued, now, with Sasuke imprisoned, Team 7 is effectively dissolved. While Naruto is in recuperation, Sakura will be taking over for Hinata during a trial period of approximately six months. Since you are grounded for a bit, Kiba, Shino and I will be bringing her up to speed. Apparently, Kakashi dropped the ball with her Kanoichi training, so it's going to take time for her to be battle ready. Heal up, and in about two or three months, we'll start missions as a group again, okay. Now Shino, if you'll come with me, we're going to meet with Sakura for some team bonding over dinner. Sit tight Kiba and I'll come by tomorrow to answer any more questions that I can. As the group dispersed, Kiba punched his pillow in anger, if Naruto was fighting under a handicap the whole time, how strong would he become? Or how weak were he and Akamaru if they still had that much trouble? Sleep was a long time coming for the irritated Inuzuka. Beating her stew slowly, Hinata was close to tears, this was more horrible than she could have believed. Proceeding through the text, it was clear that Naruto had originally retained perhaps one word in fifty from his school days. Altogether, besides the basics on traps and poison recognition, he really had no clue on the majority of the material. She could understand the interest in traps for pranking, but when Hinata had asked why he was so good with poisoning, Naruto had looked down, mumbling something about having some practice. For Hayuga, reading between the lines was as simple as breathing. Just how much had Naruto endured at the hands of those he had sworn to protect. But the heartbreaking thing was realizing that the majority of his issues with the text stemmed from not knowing how to read. He could pick out general ideas and a few key symbols, but the vast majority of his knowledge in literature was either incomplete or just plain wrong. If no one had tried to teach him properly before, it was a wonder that Naruto's marks were as high as he managed. Also, once she started showing him the meanings and tutoring him on specifics, the young ninja absorbed data like a sponge. By the time dinner rolled around, Naruto had a better retention of the material than she did and had apparently memorized over half the text verbatim. This level of intelligence was downright intimidating and forced her to wonder how much of the real Naruto had been hidden by the seals and his poor upbringing and would this new Naruto still want or need Hinata as a friend. Seeing the boy in question looking at her, Hinata forced a smile to her lips. She would not cause him further worry. On Naruto's end, he was shocked at how good a teacher Hinata-chan was. He had looked over this text for hours growing up, but despite his best efforts, most of it he couldn't understand. The academy teachers hadn't been of much help since none of them had time for the little brat. Recently, any time that Sakura-chan tried to lecture him on stuff, maybe half of it stuck. But here, sitting next to this nice girl who would explain things to him, the information suddenly made sense. Man, whoever got Hinata-chan as a Jonin instructor was going to be super lucky. If the rest of the review went like this, he'd be learning awesome jutsu by the end of the next day, never mind a whole week. Looking over at the girl, he tried to give her the strongest smile that he could manage in thanks. She looked like she was about to faint, but for once Naruto wasn't worried. With Botch Anne here, maybe Hinata could be cured of her fainting and constant fever. It couldn't be good for her. Finishing off her stew, Tsunade smiled at the progress that Naruto and Hinata had made. As she suspected, without the seals hindering him, Naruto's only barrier to learning was his lack of an attention span. With Hinata there to calm him down, the rate of progress was truly astounding. On the flip side, with her concern for Naruto covering her face plain as day, Hinata was too busy helping him to feign to get nervous. If this could be maintained, perhaps the two of them could even have a conversation one day soon. It really was a win-win situation all things considered. Now, to move on to the next training exercise. Ha ha ha. All right now, we have maybe an hour before it's time to rest, plenty of time for some quick practice before bed. Naruto, your hand seal coordination is probably going to be all over the place for a bit, so it's up to us to bring your dexterity to appropriate levels. There are a lot of methods for doing this, but, lucky for you, I happen to be the best at the fastest one. Reaching into her coat, Tsunade pulled out a deck of cards. Eyebrow twitching, Naruto gave the Hokage a flat look. You just want to gamble, don't you Bachan? Straightening her back, Tsunade affected the strongest innocent look she could manage. 
I'll have you know that card shuffling and handling results in excellent dexterity. Why, it was one of my favorite training exercises growing up. Saratobi sensei showed me himself. Still wary, Naruto hesitantly picked up the deck. You sure, Bachan? Smiling reassuringly, Tsunade ignored her oldest apprentice, sighing in frustration. Of course, Naruto. Would I lie about something like that? Once you're good enough, we might even try to make it a little more interesting. Absently trying to flip through the cards, Naruto mumbled, what do you mean? Rubbing his shoulder, much to Hinata's dismay, Tsunade gave her infamous shit-eating grin, tell me Naruto, have you ever heard about a game called poker? Anko, Sakura decided, was the undisputed scariest Kanoichi that she had ever met. After leaving her house, Anko had dragged her to the edge of training ground 44, the forest of death. Nervous from the memories that the place inspired, Sakura had edged as far from the fence as possible. However, unmindful of her concern, Anko had dragged her into the area, dropping into a clearing about five minutes from the fence. Then, for the next 10 minutes, any time that something tried to bother the two of them, she blasted out killing intent while calmly eating some dango. After seeing giant tigers, carnivorous slugs and birds of prey flee from her, Sakura was about ready to faint. It might not be much compared to Orochimaru, but this was the longest that she had endured this sort of pressure. It was insane. Seeing that her victim was softened up enough, Anko decided that it was time to start their talk. Do you know who I am, girl? Struggling under the weight of her fear, Sakura tried to meet the special Jonin in the eye. You're that examiner from the second part of the Chunin exam, Midarashi Anko, right? Shrugging at the little bit of data, Anko threw another bamboo stick at the tree across the clearing. That's my name, but not really who I am. The name's Midarashi Anko, special Jonin and second in command under Marino Ibiki, in fact some say I might succeed the lug. That would make me the second best active interrogation ninja in Konoha and one of the primary assassins. That, Pinky, is who I am. Taking a handful of hair, Anko proceeded to force Akura to stare into her unblinking gaze. That means that, when we deal with traitors or threats to Konoha, I am one of those who gets to break them, you got that. Releasing the genin, she watched the spasms of pain without comment or reaction, the snake bitch had seen much worse. Pushing the little girl into a rough seat, Anko started to twirl a kunai around her little finger, enjoying the flinching her temporary charge indulged in, it was just so cute. Kurinai filled me in on Ichiha's little tantrum. Seeing him was stupid, and I don't know why Tsunade let you go. Those kids are a goddamn menace. No one sane or worth your time will try to kill a teammate, it's just an incident waiting to happen. So why, after all of the shit that little prick put you and your friends through, did you need to see him that badly? What could possibly be worth it? Trying to find her breath, Sakura gathered her thoughts. I just needed to see him, to try to understand why he did it. Gripping the kunai, Anko spit another stick out, this time drawing blood from the young Jenin's face, wrong. You knew why he did it, little prick told you before knocking you out. He was a power-hungry nut job who decided offing a few Kanoha ninja was worth his revenge. That kind of person doesn't need anyone checking up on them. They need a poison pill slipped into their food. Once he became a traitor, Ichiha Sasuke officially was not worth your time. What has that idiot Kakashi been teaching you? Thinking back to her early Jenin days, Sakura automatically slipped out. Those who abandon the mission are trash, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than trash. I guess it felt like I was abandoning him. Slamming her kunai into the branch next to her, Anko glared at the little child in front of her, wrong. He abandoned you, by your own teachings that makes him less than the lowest trash. Sasuke decided to not only abandon his comrades, but attack them as well. You cannot get any lower than that. Seeing the slump of her shoulders, Anko pressed on, tell you what, Pinky, let's try a little exercise, I want you to repeat after me, Sasuke is a jerk. Trembling, Sakura wondered if this is what Hinata felt when trying to talk about Naruto, as Sasuke is a jerk. Nodding, Anko smirked, Sasuke is not worth my time. Straightening her back, Sakura tried to grab the anger from earlier, as Sasuke is not worth my tea time. Smiling, Anko nodded almost giddily, now then, say that Sasuke needs to die. Forcing a smile Sakura tried to continue the exercise, fearful for her safety, Sasuke needed to. Needs to. Looking into the crazy eyes of Anko, Sakura couldn't seem to say it, no matter how scared she was, a fact that rapidly began to piss the special Jonin off. What's wrong Pinky? You were doing so well, all you've got to say is Sasuke needs to die, and everything will feel so much better. Terrified, Sakura tried to back away from the angry woman, only to be held back by her hair. Where's your hate? This little bastard tried to kill your teammate. His allies tried to kill your friends. What is it going to take to get through to you? Uruno Sakura was normally a fairly collected young girl. In fact, to the majority of Kanoha citizens, she was a nice girl next door type. However, what many never saw was the true root of rage and pain buried within her heart. 
while it was recessive and didn't show up often, Ino and Naruto could attest to its potency. Therefore after being pushed, pulled and prodded for days, the result should have been obvious. Unfortunately, Anko-chan didn't know Sakura well enough to anticipate a reaction. Forming her fist, Sakura lashed out in anger, shattering the trunk behind them, Cha. I don't know you crazy bitch. Surprised by the sudden attack, Anko released a seemingly mild-mannered Jenin's hair in shock. Not even noticing, Sakura stood with fire in her eyes, Sasuke, Sasuke, Sasuke. All you've done is tear him down. Sure he had problems, and I cannot agree with his choices. Heck. I can never forgive him for what he has done. But don't you stand there and say I need to wish for his death, what do you know about what I feel? Her pent-up rage drained, Sakura collapsed, suddenly feeling powerless, you don't know what it's like. To love someone and be thrown away like trash. I can't just cut him out of my heart. It's not some sort of switch I can throw at will. Not so soon or so fast. Anko wasn't the comforting sort, and that wasn't going to change now. This little brat had no idea what button she was pushing, and it was only because of Kurinai's intervention that she wasn't gutting the little slut like a fish. No one was allowed to throw accusations like that around her without consequence. She had a much more difficult situation, and this little brat was crying that a crush had turned traitor, it was sickening. But a little perspective couldn't hurt. Calmly grabbing that red atrocity of a dress, Anko grabbed her kunai and pinned Sakura like an insect specimen. Alright, you little idiot, it's time for a tiny history lesson. Settle in and don't make a sound, otherwise I might leave you here for the kitties. You understand. Swallowing, Sakura nodded. Leaning back, Anko drained the rest of her sake, remembering as much as she could from the painful past. Once, there was a little girl who loved a famous ninja with all of her heart. She wasn't like you, this girl achieved the top place in the academy by the age of 10 and became a chunin by the age of 12. When she was your age, she had already spilled blood, tortured, and seduced Konoha, but more importantly for her love. That man took her as an apprentice, teaching the little girl techniques, and that would turn your hair white. She was his favorite pet and couldn't be happier for that fact. Staying quiet, Sakura narrowed her eyes, this story seemed kind of familiar. Fixing the genin with a look, Anko bit out, however, no matter how powerful or well-respected her master became, it was never enough for him. Soon, tired of the limits and lack of position, her master left Konoha, bringing the trusting foolish girl with him for some fun. She was confused but loved her master and thought that would be enough from now on. Suddenly angry, Anko grabbed the terrified Sakura by the face, however, Orochimaru wasn't that nice, he just needed a good test subject. So when he tried out the original curse seal on me and nine other children, my purpose was complete. When I survived, while well, the others died, I became the hope for the future of that wretched technique. But no matter how much I loved him, I would never be able to forgive Orochimaru. To this day, I still curse the moment that I agreed to follow him long enough to be his guinea pig. Even now, I want to kill that bastard with my entire heart and soul. Releasing Sakura's head, the snake bitch glared at the child with cold fury, so before you start mouthing off to your betters, make damn sure that you know what you're talking about. You have no idea how good you have it for being left behind, and if I even suspect that you are going to correct your mistake. Twirling another kunai, her message was as clear as daylight. Sakura nodded dumbly, realizing how close she had come to death in that moment of arrogance. It was not a mistake she was going to make again anytime soon. Grabbing the kunai holding her temporary charge to the tree, Anko unpinned her abruptly, letting the child fall to her knees. If Kurinai and Tsunade sama didn't think you were worth saving, I would kill you right now. As it is, you should be under observation for years for even contemplating joining that bastard. But, since you were young, foolish, and unsuccessful, you get a chance to show your loyalty with practically no strings attached. Me. It took nearly three years of probation before I could even leave the village again, and another four before I could test for a jonin rank. Do yourself a favor though, forget about loving the Achiha or defending the Achiha right now. Otherwise, you'll travel a path that will lead to your death, probably at my own hands. Get stronger, or you're never going to be able to face yourself in the mirror again, I know I wouldn't have been able to. Drained from the constant fear, Sakura could only eke out an affirmative. Stretching after the dramatic conversation, Anko smiled a semi-normal smile, well then, let's get you to Ichirakus. Kurinai should be waiting for us with Shino soon, then you can start bonding as a team. Won't that be a blast? Standing, Sakura had a sudden thought, Anko-san was rather lost with the details in her story. Some of those facts had to have been restricted information. Perhaps she would. Ah no, Anko-san. Glancing over her shoulder, the special Joan inside, what is Pinky? Firming her resolve, Sakura blurted out, do you know what the red chakra is? Stiffening, Anko's grin became etched in stone, maybe the blonde brat will tell you himself when they get back. Mouth dry, Sakura stared at the snake bitch in shock, get back. Shrugging her shoulders, thus doing very interesting things to her upper torso, Anko sighed, where the hell have you been? 
Sanadi, Shizun, Hinata and Naruto left the village sometime within the last 24 hours. No one knows where they are or when they're coming back. Jumping from the branch, Anko proceeded to the edge of the forest. Following in a daze, Sakura could only think, well I guess I won't be asking Naruto anything for a while. Stretching, Naruto blinked in confusion, did any of you guys hear something? Eyebrows twitching at the sight of the giant pile of chips in front of the rube, Sanadi barked, it's just your imagination. Now deal the damn cards. So it continued for the next two days. Sanadi would constantly focus on conditioning Naruto's body to crawl, then walk, then run whenever they took a break. Sometimes Shizun would join in, gathering years worth of blackmail material to use against the kid. Tauntin, when bored, would chase Naruto around for fun, jumping up and down on his belly whenever he happened to trip. With all of this constant movement, Naruto was almost able to fake a civilian's coordination by the second day, a mind-numbing achievement. He was still carried while they were traveling though, due to a lack of needed chakra control for tree hopping. Inada would continue to help around the camp with standard chores and scanning for potential enemies. However, her most important duty became the tutoring sessions with Naruto, pushing his mind more as the material progressed. By the second day, Naruto's theoretical knowledge was about the level of a third-year academy student. Since they were constantly moving and only stopped to review maybe twice a day, the jump was significant. In fact, they were so focused during these sessions that Hinata only fainted when Naruto was especially enthusiastic about thanking her for being such a kick-ass teacher. Of course, Naruto still couldn't figure out why the others laughed at that, Hinata could be seriously sick. Finally, though, they found a path to a large and well-kept castle, causing both Tsunade and Shizun to relax. The first leg of their journey was over, and they could rest and train in peace. Turning to her younger charges, Tsunade smiled, welcome to the land of vegetables. Chapter 7. Making time, moving pieces. As the group of ninja traveled across the valley towards the castle, Tsunade whispered under her breath, Hinata, check the area for observers. Lowering her gaze, the shy Hyuga managed to activate her with a minimum of hand seals. There are a few guards around the castle, but no signs of ninja activity, focused on us or otherwise. Sighing in relief, the slug sang and led them off the main pathway, checking occasionally for markers. Seeing Naruto and Hinata's confusion, Shizun helpfully supplied Tsunade Sama with old friends as the leader of this country. The land of vegetables is not the richest or the most powerful of places, but they are fairly friendly here and are a bit out of the way. It's a perfect place to stay while we concentrate on accelerating your training under the radar. Bazing fondly at a familiar branch, Tsunade continued the talk, traveling around to hide from any enemy or friendly pursuit, is all well and good. But we need some time in one place to concentrate on developing your skills. Quite frankly, training while we're traveling is just too dangerous for the two of you with your current level of ability. If I can talk the daimyo of vegetable into letting us crash here for a few weeks, things will go a lot smoother. Luckily, he's one of the friends I never borrowed money from. Ah, here we go. Going up a narrow path hidden from the main road, Tsunade wrapped a quick pattern on a random tree knot. In response, a narrow band of light stretched overhead, lighting the way. The group followed the newly marked trail for about five minutes before stopping. Before them was an unassuming older man, covered from head to foot in camouflage. What business do you seek with the sprouting vine? Clearing her throat, Tsunade responded in a respectfully ritualistic tone, the yellow rose returned to join the vine, seeking shelter in the shade. Hilting his head, the man replied in confusion, such a rose has long since fled, to find new roots in firmer soil. Why return to the lowly shade? Coloring slightly, even as Shizun rubbed her temples in irritation, Tsunade fought to keep the tone civil. The rose will never find the shade slowly, especially in the brightness of the day. Sharing sweet nectar and simple lodgings is far superior to the cold finality of a crystal vase. Twitching at the tone, the man waved them forward, parting the bushes beside him. Beyond the path was a small hut, well kept and surrounded by flowers and a small lake, they were directed to enter with hand signs, only to be left to their own devices. Noticing how the blonde Hokage was glaring at the wall, Naruto looked at Shizun in confusion, Shizun Ni Chan, what was with all that talk about flowers and vines back there? It sounded like a bunch of weird poetry. Sighing in worry at their initial treatment, Shizun tried to explain, Naruto that it was a set of code phrases used by the personal attendants of the daimyo. The ninja of the land of vegetables are few in number and are solely focused upon protection of the royal family. This is a screening area to prevent impostors from trying to sneak in and assassinate the leader or his court. Some of the wording of his responses though. Gulping at the nervous tone, Hinata gathered Tauntin into her chest for a hug, WW. What's wrong with the code? Grumbling, Tsunade answered before the situation could be sugar-coated. The fact that I'm using secret phrases and sneaking around apparently set off some warning bells. If this was an official visit, it would have been planned months in advance with a full escort. If it was something secret, the normal procedure would be to send a representative, most likely Shizun herself. 
A group like this is very suspicious apparently. The guy might like me, but he would be hesitant if his forces thought that we were exiled or running away from responsibility. Hopefully, I'll get a chance to explain the situation before we're asked to leave. Blinking in shock, Naruto tried to jump up, only to fall backwards, what? But I thought this guy was your friend. Shouldn't that mean that he'd try to help us for a little bit, at least? Grumbling, Sanadi picked Naruto up by the scruff of the neck like a disobedient cat. Daimyo might be my friend, but he's also the leader of his entire country. Since he's a good leader, he's willing to put them first before anything. Heck, to ensure peace, he sent his only daughter into exile as a hostage, hoping to preserve ties with foreign allies. That is just the sort of decision that a leader has to make sometimes. Patting the boy on the head, Shizum smiled at his pout. Oh, don't worry Naruto-kun, things will probably be alright. The very fact that we got here without any trouble indicates we should get an audience at least. Just try to be a little patient, this isn't the only place we can go if things get difficult. Before any more concerns could be aired, the door opened, admitting the same man from earlier, the vine would like to meet the rose to dine this evening, beneath the moonlight. You're granted safety and security here for three days unless the vine wishes otherwise. Please, rest under the shade while food and drink are brought. This will be your home while in the land of vegetables, so settle as you wish. Bowing deeply, the attendant left a much more relaxed group than he entered. They had time, and Sanadi had a chance to explain, best to make the most of the situation. So, who's up for another round of cards while we wait? The new Amaru had fine hands, though they will take some time to adjust to. Arachimaru, newly implanted within his current vessel, was sitting quietly, wrapping his fingers. It was a constant, soothing pattern that helped calm his anger. While recovering from surgery, the snake Sanon was far from his normal level of ability, thus, he had to make himself scarce. That normally wouldn't be much of a problem, but this disastrous mission had cost him his best underlings. But the sound spymaster off investigating the status of poor Sasuke-kun, he had little to do except sit and wait, imbuing an IV of drugs and nutrients to aid his recovery. The situation was, admittedly, far from ideal. Twitching, stolen eyes tracked the sudden appearance of a cloaked figure. There was no tenseness in Orochimaru's movement though, and momentarily Kabuto came into view. Although the infiltrator was a master of hiding his emotions, the eyes do not often lie. Orochimaru was almost prepared for bad news at this point. Depending upon its severity, he might even consider letting his subjects live a while longer as he recovered. Venting on the help was such bad manners. Forcing himself to focus past the pain medication, Orochimaru hissed, Kabuto. What has happened to Sasuke-kun? Swallowing slightly, the silver-haired medic forced himself to show no fear, that would only encourage further torture. Arachimaru sama Sasuke was successfully recaptured by a team of leaf ninja. The whole village is buzzing about it, apparently that lazy Nara led a group of his classmates to capture him and did so successfully. Twitching, the snake's anger bubbled, shimmering beneath the surface, are you telling me that the Sound Five were defeated and killed by a bunch of genin? Flinching back out of reflex, Kabuto quickly tried to cover his own actions. They had been weakened by two returning Jonin, and three required the intervention of Gara's Jonin team, but yes they were killed. However, Orochimaru could no longer hear him. All of his hopes, plans and dreams were now ashes, thanks to some pathetic brats. This could not stand. Deep from the back of his throat, a thunderous primal howl started to form. When the sound started, walls shook, ninjas scattered, and Kabuto nearly wet himself in fear. Orochimaru Sama rarely lost his head like this, he personified the snake in mannerism and morals. He rarely got mad, preferring to get even, and any rage burned colder than ice. This, though, was like standing next to a volcano of killing intent, it was almost unbearable. Stopping as his throat began to bleed, Orochimaru fixed his last and most loyal subordinate with a bloodshot glare, where is Sasuke-kun now? Wiping some sweat from his brow, the spy sighed, it is not generally known, but there are approximately five possible locations they could be keeping him. I would need weeks to locate the specific holding ground and even more time to leave without tipping off anyone that the location was known. What is known is that Sasuke was stripped of any ninja status and was only healed enough to ensure his survival. Taking him as a host body might very well be impossible now. Feeling the building rage, Kabuto decided another person should get some of the fun or Rachimaru's anger. Unfortunately, Naruto-kun was not very gentle when handling his former friend. As expected, all motion from his master ceased. Pinning the now smiling subordinate with a massive glare, the elder ninja growled out, give me a full report, Kabuto. I need to know what I am working with. Straightening himself out, Kabuto began. The details of Naruto's restraining seals, Sanadi's decrees, the movements within the clans, all was outlined clearly and explicitly. Watching his now silent master, the spy began to get nervous, Orochimaru-sama was shaking. If he didn't know any better, he'd almost think that he was. Ahahahahahaha. <laughs> Thus Kabuto was treated to the first ever Rachimaru belly laugh. 
wiping a tear away, Hirachimaru sighed in contentment, he had needed that. This had to be the most unrealistically idealized method of pissing on Konoha he had ever heard. As expected from one with Tsunade's will. Oh the places he could go with this. Now then Kabuto, it appears that we have plans to make. Suddenly, Tsunade is out in the open along with the Kyubi brat. That opens up some interesting opportunities for our cause. Straightening his glasses, Kabuto smirked, do you wish to put out a kill on side order? Surprisingly, the snake Sanon shook his head. Our organization has taken some serious damage recently. With the loss of the Sound 5 and the battles to determine the identity of my new host, we are significantly underpowered. Any major action against that group would damage our already depleted forces, and I will need some time to adjust before trying to attack Tsunade. In addition, if Naruto Kun is killed on my order, Akatsuki will probably launch a retaliatory strike against us. That cannot happen at the moment. Leaning back in contemplation, he smiled under his bandages. That does not mean, however, that we cannot make life more difficult for them. Offering a bounty on a Hokage level ninja or Jinchuriki is one thing. However, no matter what she does or tries to be, Tsunade is too soft hearted. Therefore, we will put a bounty out on ninja healers and healing techniques. No matter what disguises Tsunade uses, this will flush out some scum to attack her. Someone might get lucky and kill one of them, but that's not the point. Seeing the picture that his master was painting, Kabuto smiled, since they will be constantly targeted by foreign powers, the group should try to keep a low profile. However, if they have to run every time they use a healing technique in public, Tsunade will lack a base of operations. If Naruto-kun's supposed reactions to the suppressor seals are accurate, that lack of downtime will significantly hinder their efforts at rehabilitation. Plus, it will highlight any new and powerful healers when they enter an area, making the group more easily identified. Thus, the likelihood of Naruto-kun or one of his allies dying at the hands of a foreign power increases with each passing day. Rubbing his hands together, Orochimaru let out a pleased hiss, yes. And none of this can truly be blamed upon us. The idiot who attacks Naruto-kun will be targeted by Akatsuki, but by then their major plans will be undermined. Without the Kaiubi, Akatsuki's efforts will be weakened, making them less of a threat in the future. Once I regain my strength, the power balance will shift significantly in our favor. Either way, Konoha will also be out of Jinchuriki and probably a Hokage, making a second attack more likely to succeed, something to consider for the future at least. Standing, Orochimaru prepared to retire for the evening, devious ideas brewing in his new and dangerous mind, Kabuto, begin letting our agents know of the new bounties being offered. In addition, use your knowledge of Konoha to begin calculations of possible choices for their little breeding program. If I cannot have Sasuke, I might have to settle for genetic material for experimentation. Some abductions might be in order. However, it would please me greatly to retrieve Sasuke for myself. As Kamimuro has shown us, even a broken tool can have its uses. Bowing, the now relaxed sound spymaster smirked, as you wish, Arachimaru sama Tsunade prevented herself from shifting nervously, she was a sanin and medical genius, not some nervous schoolgirl. The attendant from earlier had approached at sunset, providing a set of clean, simple robes. Some would see this as a generous and friendly gesture, but in all frankness it was another security measure. Unfamiliar clothes prevented a majority of familiar hidden weapons from being utilized properly, especially with the time limits being provided. Of course, when you could tear castles down with your bare fists, this concern was a little silly. Entering the smaller room, Sanadi smiled at the simple yet healthy spread. The land of vegetables rarely raised livestock, and that was mostly limited to small groups of chickens. The meal before her was thus vegetarian, filled with numerous local specialties. It might seem simple and plain to others, but she recognized this sort of arrangement. The daimyo only shared local cuisine with those who he felt close to. Normally, strange foreigners were treated with attempts at their own cuisine to put them at ease. The land of vegetables might be small, but their traditions were simple and heartfelt. It was almost like coming home. The bottle of high-quality sake didn't hurt either. Smiling at his old friend, Daimyo gestured to his attendant, we shall eat alone tonight. Stiffening an unspoken protest, the older ninja faded into the background. Sensing the foreign chakra signal leave, Sanadi relaxed on a basic level. Despite her concerns and the treatment so far, one thing was clear, she had not lost her friend to politics just yet. Making light conversation, the two began their meal. Each dish was of high quality and, despite the lack of meat and certain spices, held a comfort all of its own. Memories and stories were shared, from their first meeting to Shizun's lack of a love life. For a few, isolated moments, the two of them were not rulers but old friends sharing a pleasant dinner. However, as the moon rose in the sky, they opened the sake bottle and got down to business. Friendship was all well and good, but both were leaders and knew when things needed to be spelled out. Taking a sip, the daimyo began, you have garnered quite the reputation over the years, Sanadi-sama. 
I'm glad that you're less prone to changing the countryside with your fists, but still the gambling habit is a little infamous. Getting a nickname like the legendary sucker simply has the wrong connotations for a noble woman such as yourself. Passing her own cup, Sanadi sighed, I admit, Daimyo-san, I may like to gamble a bit much. Plus, if I ever discover the individual who coined that stupid nickname, he or she will receive the fullness of my rage. Rolling his eyes, the daimyo sighed, again with this daimyo-san inflection, I have a proper name you know, one which you are free to use in private. Smirking Tsunadi poured some more brew into their cups, but daimyo-san, far be it from me to insult one of such a position as yourself. After all, I am just a lowly and stubborn ninja maiden, am I not? Crowning at her mirth, he sighed, still not letting that incident go, are you? Smirking, Sanadi gazed at the moon in appreciation, oh, let me have my fun, besides, these days I focus towards the future more than the past. It is less painful and more optimistic than I remember it being. Joining her in the lunar appreciation, the daimyo frowned slightly. Yes, I think that a discussion of current events is necessary, Hokage-sama. Dancing at the tone, Sanadi had the grace to look somewhat sheepish, I suppose so, daimyo-sama. The story was long and complex, but this was no simple man. He had been raised as a leader for decades, grasping the political implications and methodologies fairly quickly. The daimyo knew that she held things back, and while he was saddened by the necessity, he understood. Besides, the picture that Sanadi painted was enough to occupy his mind as it was. By the end of the tale, the sake was nearly gone, but he was cold stone sober. You are playing a dangerous game, Sanadi. While the advisor's counsel needs to be restrained somewhat, the fire daimyo can make life very difficult for you and your people. Was there no better way to make your statement? This could blow up in your face with little effort. Looking at her empty sake glass, the blonde medic sighed, Daimyo-san, when I took the title of Hokage, there was a secret reason I accepted the post. As rude, clumsy and silly as he might be at times, I hoped to hand the position over to Naruto when he was trained up a bit. Then I discovered this great kid, who only tried to help his people and protect those precious to him, was hurt so badly by those who should have been there for him. This was not only an attack against my authority, it was an attack against someone I would hope to have as a son, if things had gone differently with Dan. I was actually worried that I might bring Kanoha down to its knees in anger. I had to get away, if only to spare them my direct wrath, and Jurei will keep the place running in the meantime. Shocked by the sincerity of her words, the daimyo smiled, you've changed, Tsunade sama I remember it like yesterday, an angry blonde medic running into my valley a mere three years after my appointment. You started screaming for special local herbs to treat Shizun for a mild virus she picked up when helping you heal a small village for pocket money. You refused to listen to reason, fought anyone who stood in your way, and ignored all protests when locating the needed medicines. However, even when protecting someone you loved you could be so cold to others. Now I see someone who would fight and protect because it is the right thing to do. This Naruto character must be someone very special to encourage such feelings. Rising to his feet, he offered the young-looking woman his hand. While the land of vegetables might be small and weak, we do not forget our friends. I doubt that anyone will connect you with us anyways. You may continue to use your current residence for the next few weeks until your group decides to leave. All I ask is not to bring attention to yourself as best as you can. Accepting his hand up, it was all Tsunade could do not to jump in joy, she had done it. They had sanctuary. Smirking, the daimyo cleared his throat, as to payment. Well no one has seen the crone of the seat in far too long. Seeing the mighty slug Sanin's face fall like a three-year-old child's at his pronouncement, the leader of Vegetable Country could not help but laugh out loud. The cave was damp and unremarkable, a simple blip of geography that no one cared to explore. It was dark, vast and completely underground, stalactites and stalagmites silently chomping the empty air. In fact there was only one somewhat unique aspect to this cave, despite its natural appearance. This cave was covered in discrete seals that could be used as a focal point in emergencies. Thus, the perfect meeting place for Akatsuki to send their shades. Nine solitary shadows formed from the darkness, eyes focused and wary. They did not often meet like this, and nothing good ever came of it. Each had their own secrets and abilities that could shatter countries. Yet, they were silent, waiting for their leaders to leave. Finally, piercing Rinnegan eyes focused upon the shade of their master spy, Zetsu, report your observations. Smiling, the halves of Zetsu began their description of the battle at the Valley of the End, causing the higher strung members to chuckle nervously. However, the follow-up report about rumors of secondary seals and possible removed limiters were more concerning for their plans. Smirking, Kissum grinned, so poor little Orochimaru doesn't get the Sharingan, how sad for him, eh Itachi. Withholding comment, the last free Ichiha of Kanoha simply pinned him with a look. This defeat lowered his opinion of Sasuke even more than their confrontation over the Kyubi brat. Perhaps saving his life was simply not worth it. Turning to the leader, Sasori grumbled, should we accelerate our collection schedule? 
if the Kaiubi vessel is simply wandering with such a limited escort, now is a perfect time to strike. Shaking his head, Payne calmly rebutted, at the moment, our ability to seal the Kaiubi effectively is slightly limited. With the strain that the statue has taken from recent sealing, coupled with redesigning the technique to not require Rachimaru's ring, it is unlikely that normal containment is possible. Our best bet is to wait, sealing lesser beasts into the matrix to support the extraction at a later date. Three years should be long enough to accomplish that. In the meantime, the goal of Akatsuki will be concentrated upon building our monetary stockpile. If we do not have a large enough cash reserve, underpricing the great ninja villages might not be possible. Therefore, financially our organization needs more capital in order to implement the master plan. Turning a translucent head towards the missing grass ninja, Payne issued his orders calmly and with precision, Zetsu, you are now tasked with tracking the Kaiubi. I am somewhat concerned with how these rumored limiter seals affected the beast's prison. We shall track his movements and efforts and only intervene if necessary. The rest of you are expected to gather the heads on your respective bounty lists and transfer the funds through Kakuzu's broker. That is all for now, return to your tasks. One by one, the shades began to disperse until only Itachi was left standing. Glancing around the cavern, he slumped with an inaudible sigh. Foolish little brother, now who will end my torment? Although it was late, no one really felt like sleeping just yet. Inada tried to interest Naruto in some studying to distract them, but their rate of progression had outstripped the available reading material. Although she felt less prone to fainting spells after the last few days, the shy Hayuga was not confident enough to try lectures or running scenarios like Kurenai sensei did in their training. So the two young ninjas sat together in awkward silence, trying to find something to say. Shizun fed Tauntin, running through possibilities in her head. A lifetime of running around the continent had given her near-perfect recognition of possible hideaways and limited friendly territories. So if things didn't work out here, they would have a backup plan. However, when Sanadi came through the door with a smile on her face, everyone let out a sigh of relief. Swaying slightly, the Hokage held up her thumb in success, we have sanctuary. For the next few weeks, this will be our home and base of operations. While here, I plan on putting you two through the ringer, so you'd better get ready. Answering smiles of relief, Hyper and Shy respectively, met her declaration. Leaning back, Shizun sighed in relief, it is truly lucky that Daimyo likes you so much. Imagine, allowing a foreign leader sanctuary simply as a favor. Twitching while removing her sandals, Sanadi tried to act nonchalant, however, Shizun had known her for too long for that tactic to work. Narrowing her eyes, Shizun stood abruptly. This is a simple favor, isn't it Sanadi-sama? While the slug Sanon was known for her alcohol tolerance, the drunken blush and sheepish expression almost appeared to belong to Naruto. Scratching her head in embarrassment, she replied air. Not exactly. He did ask for a couple of minor concessions. Shivering at the tone, Shizun asked fearfully, what did you promise this time? Looking between the two medics, Naruto and Hinata showed every fiber of their true potential and kept their traps shut. Waving off her first disciple's concerns, Sanadi forced a smile. Now, Shizun, it's really not that bad. Firstly, we have to stay here and avoid attracting attention. He's willing to protect us, but doesn't want to gain the wrong kind of notice. Honestly, it's mostly what we were going to do anyway. Knowing her mistress better than that, Shizun pinned the blonde with a glare. What else did you agree to? Looking down, Sanadi grumbled, the daimyo wants the crone of the seed to make an appearance, says that she's been gone for too long. Looking at the pouting face of Sanadi, Shizun tried to hold it in, but could find the will. Wahahahaha. <laughs> oh, the crone of the seed. That brings me back. Blazing at the laughing brunette, Sanadi snapped, just for that, we're trading off the cloak. Scratching his head in confusion, Naruto finally burst out, what the hell are you two talking about? Looking sheepish, Sanadi sighed, well, Naruto it's like this. Looking down upon his village, the wreckage pondered the latest intel from Konoha. Sanadi of the Sanin and Fifth Hokage had left the village to treat a ninja personally, along with her apprentices. However, the blonde bimbo leaving Kanoha was nowhere near as interesting as the identity of her newest apprentice, Hayuga Hinata. She was the eldest child of the main branch Hayuga and thus the only unsealed member of the bloodline currently freelance. This could either become a grand opportunity or blow up in their faces. Had long searched for a clan for their own use. Despite their excellent sword traditions and intentional adaptation of Jinchuriki, the acquisition of such a resource was seen as a necessary step on the road to further greatness. However, with the Kiri purges and the lowered fertility rates they favored, unaffiliated were extremely hard to acquire. Thus, being the pragmatic sorts that they were, the Kumo Ninja decided to obtain a current membership for their own use. The Byakugan was considered the most powerful and reliable among possible known candidates, so the abduction mission had been carried out. In the end, that had been an unmitigated disaster. 
In the end, all Kumo had gained from the whole attempt was a useless corpse, significant international hostility, and the perpetual hatred of the Hyuga branch house. Perhaps if they had approached a sealed member for defection and safety as opposed to stealing a highly placed heiress, things would have gone smoother. As it stood, Kumo had only avoided war out of the soft-hearted nature of the third Hokage and the weakened position Kanoha was recovering from after the Kyubi incident. However, here was a second chance, just wandering around the fire country without backup. Honestly, what was wanted to Jinshuriki? Turning to his assembled Jonin forces, freshly briefed upon the situation, the muscular man curled an eyebrow. Tell me, who here thinks that a Hyuga hunt is in order? The chorus of cheers and shouts were music to his ears. Breakage sama I don't think that would be a good idea. Piercing the shapely blonde with a look, he ground out, why not Samui? What possible reason is there not to gain the power of the Byakugan that is right there in the open? Head held high, the Jonin did not even flinch at the tone, after Killer B's rapping, this was nothing. Rakage sama with all due respect, the Hyuga is under Tsunade's protection. Even if Yujito or Sensei were able to defeat her, the resulting battle would alert Kanoha with little trouble. In addition, we have insufficient information on the patient that they are treating, he has to be something special if he warrants the personal attention of the Hokage. For all we know, Kanoha might be on the verge of gaining a new identity. Smiling at the firm tone, the rakage sighed, if only he had a hundred like Samui. Then Kumo would not need some simple accidents of birth to feel strong. Excellent points, Samui, although you forgot Jurea's reaction if we invaded his sovereign borders. Honestly. I don't think that one little girl is worth starting a war over, again. Do you? Looking down, the previously cheering forces looked abashed, they had again failed one of their leader's tests of character. That got old after a while. Leaning back, he hummed, well these were excellent points as to why extraction was currently a bad idea, it never paid to seem weak to the troops. Look at what the old monkey had gone through over the last few years with his advisor's counsel, what foolishness. Alright, I will issue a wait-and-see order in the meantime. Kumo Jonin is authorized to evaluate the condition of Tsunade's group and extract if at all possible. This is strictly black bag though, no one can link this to us again. Now get out of my sight. In a gust of wind, the rakage was left alone with his secretary and Samui. Smiling at one of the most promising of his troops, he gave his secondary orders, check on my brother, and inform him of the situation. I might want him to take you, Kerry and Amoy to finish that old hag if this is a trick. Although, I think that you brought up a very good point. If the patient does have an emergency, it might be a good idea to take him as well as the Hyuga. After all, if no one has seen it before, it must be ours, na? Nah. Saluting, the busty Jonin left to carry out her orders. Eyebrow twitching, the bulky form of the Tsuchikage glared at his advisors, you want me to go to war without cause or motivation, just because that Kanoha bitch is out of the village for a bit. Are you insane, we are still recovering from the last ninja war and can barely match their forces. Let them tear themselves apart with internal strife for a while, Iwa will retain our current stance of neutrality. Seeing their mulish stances, the leader of Iwa's side, before grabbing their necks. Stuffing exploding clay down their throats, the two senior jonin were thrown from the tower. Flying towards the border of the village, they had a mere moment to contemplate their stupidity before becoming fireworks. Settling down in his chair, the Tsuchikid sighed, now he needed another set of advisors. That was the fifth pair this month. In the long and sordid past of Tsunade, certain things were often discussed and laughed about behind closed doors. The horrible luck, the chronic drinking problems, constantly fleeing creditors, her vanity at maintaining a permanent henge, all were publicized flaws that dogged the slug Sanin at every turn. As proud as Kanoha was of her medical accomplishments and massive strength, they couldn't help but poke fun at these flaws like everyone else. At least, as long as she was out of earshot. However, for such a legendary figure, most had no idea about Tsunade the person. Things like her favorite food or horrible Karaik voice did not get discussed with the same fervor. Details like that were never as interesting as the general rumors, so even the general ninja population refused to see underneath the underneath when confronted with them. Therefore, when asked about how Tsunade had escaped detection for so long, most would simply suggest a simple henge and forget about it. The truth, on the other hand, was significantly more complex. Coughing into her hand, Shizun sighed at her mistress's sudden awkward silence. You see, Naruto, the crone of the seed was a disguise that Tsunade-sama used to help me learn medical techniques. Hocking his head to the side, Naruto looked at her in confusion. How the heck is a disguise used to teach healing stuff? Making herself comfortable Tsunade continued in resignation, Naruto, I did train Shizun while we were traveling. However, due to certain circumstances, i.e., money lenders trying to track them down, we often couldn't stick around looking like ourselves. So, while we were staying in the land of vegetables, I created the disguise of the crone of the seed, a mystic healer who would help the common man. 
Shizum posed as my bumbling apprentice, gaining hands-on experience with patience as we went along. Smirking, Shizum sighed fondly. We actually did that a lot in the early days, whenever we needed some money or a place to stay, we'd create some sort of healer persona and hide in plain sight. I think that there are maybe 20 crones or various medicine people that locals across the elemental nation still talk about who were really us. But the crone of the seed was the first time we tried it and things didn't quite go as planned. Seeing the confused looks, Shizun clarified, we made her too good, the crone of the seed has a mystical reputation around here now as being able to cure the worst ailments. It was the biggest tactical error that Tsunadi ever made undercover. We had to flee quickly before forces from Kanoha came to investigate a mysterious woman who knew their most secret ninja healing arts. Snorting, Tsunadi pouted. I think that Saratobi sensei actually knew it was me, he just wanted to get me back to the village against my wishes. Ignoring the sulking Sanin, Shizun sighed, honestly, it's still a good disguise. We're just going to have to be careful not to appear too good at our jobs. No sudden revival of the dead and wetnet. Sanadi just doesn't like the fact that the disguise makes her look old instead of 20. Grinning, Naruto blurted out, finally. You're going to be honest about your age, Bachan. It's about time. Suddenly feeling like death warmed over, he looked upon the monstrous image of Tsunadi and wondered if that comment might not have been a tactical error on his part. Growling in frustration, the Kaiubi slammed its claws into the cage once again, what had that little meat puppet done? A few days before, its chakra had flowed freely, weakening its containment with every breath this foolish child had taken. Now though, after some sort of odd surge, things were completely different. Looking around the once damp tunnel, it was all the millennia old creature could do not to cry. Puddles of residue and corruption from its presence had been burned away, leaving a clean and unblemished hallway. The thin and simple paper of the seal had sunken into the cage door, reinforcing the whole thing by an order of magnitude. Each bar was now lined with bluish chains that cast an additional barrier against its influence, and every attempt to overpower them with its power resulted in a backlash and loss of energy. If the seal had been irritating before, these additions made the situation 20 times worse. But above all else, the lassitude was the most dangerous. Every day, it was all the demonic fox could do not to return to its sleep. Instinctively, it knew that sleeping now would ensure that it never woke up. This parasitic monkey would drain its power for years without notice until it ceased to exist. That was not how this demon was going out. Drawing into itself, the Kaiubi focused on its own mind. If it was awake, the chances of possible escape and revenge were much higher than its chances of being knocked out again. However, being alive for centuries gave you a rather pragmatic view of the harsh realities of existence. It would wait for the opportune moment and when that happened, it would flood the corridor and hopefully kill that brat. If it couldn't use its power, then no one else would. Chapter 8. The paths to greatness, the roads to ruin. Sakura collapsed, breathing in short gasps, this is what Kakashi should have shown her already, what the hell. After being under Kurunai sensei for about a week, the pink-haired Kinoichi was nearly at her breaking point. A fact that Sakura found she wasn't very proud of. The training was a constant stream of laps, tree climbing, tojutsu forms, dodging practice, and full contact sparring. Apparently she was so far behind Hinata in all regards that teammate couldn't even be trusted with D-rank missions at the moment. If she was too tired to move, Kurunai-sensei would sit both her and Shino down to go over various mental exercises. The memorization of information was rather easy, but the way that Kurunai-sensei forced them to use it was a new experience. Best cases, simulations and battle plans had to be drawn up within minutes, examined and torn apart for flaws. By the end of each day, it was all Sakura could do to drag herself home. It was humiliating, this was the part of the team dynamic that Sasuke and even Naruto had always taken care of. Sasuke had a good balance of knowledge and physical power, while Naruto had endless stamina and bursts of creativity. Finding that she had allowed them to cover her own flaws for so long left a bitter taste in young Kinoichi's mouth. She had to move beyond their shadows. Heading to her feet, Sakura grabbed the leaf and after placing it on her forehead, proceeded to climb again. Tsunade Sama's rejection made so much more sense now, but she would become a proud ninja and get strong for her own merits. Not because she loved it. Ja. We'll show them all. Haruno Sakura will be no one's doormat. Observing her new student, Kurunai leaned against a tree and thought. Molding Sakura into a proper Kanoichi had appeared to be very difficult at first. While she had some major intelligence hidden away in that mind, Sakura had gotten into the habit of allowing others to lead her. Thus, her practical and adaptive abilities had somewhat atrophied. Also, after hearing about what exactly Kakashi had been teaching his genin squad, she had decided to take anything she had heard before about their abilities with a grain of salt. If not for a comment from Anko, the red-eyed Jonin might have felt hopeless about the situation. I'm telling you Kurunai, the kid shattered a four-foot-wide tree trunk on instinct. Honestly. 
it looked like a bastardized version of Tsunade Sama's strength technique. Either her muscles are really compact, or the girl has great potential in chakra control. The little twit might not be a lost cause after all. Remembering the state that Sakura had entered Ichirakus after her talk with the snake Jonin, Kurinai decided to take that comment with a grain of salt as well. However, after a week of tests, she had begun to think that maybe the girl would make it. The biggest thing holding her back before was her attitude. The confrontation with Sasuke, combined with the chat with Anko, had the genin showing her true potential when focused. Her physical abilities were still atrocious, and her tajutsu was just weak, but the important thing was Sakura's signs of real improvement. If she had undergone this sort of training from the beginning, Ino might not have lasted during the Chunin exams. Unfortunately, they were running out of time to get her into shape. Sakura had to prove she was capable before the team reformed or they would have major trouble functioning, let alone advancing. More importantly, there were her new teammates to consider. Shino had been logically accepting about the chain of events, more or less, just like any good Aviram. Akiba was going to be rejoining the team in another few weeks and was still angry about Hinata's reassignment. Unless the Jonin was careful, the Inuzuka might take his frustration out on their new female teammate, damaging the teammate dynamic irreparably. Therefore, if she had to put Sakura through hell to prevent this, Kurinai would do so with a smile on her lips. However, a burnout was not going to help anyone. Alright, Sakura, that's enough. Seeing the pink-haired girl collapse into a puddle, Kurinai winced. Walking over to the child, the sensei shook her student on the shoulder. Now, Sakura, that was a clear improvement. I'll tell you what, stretch out, go home and eat, take a long shower and come back here the day after tomorrow. I think you have earned a break, nah. Too tired to talk, Sakura ran through the cool down automatically before bowing and heading for home. There was a salad and hot water with her name on it. Watching her go, Kurinai did not bother to turn around, so Shino, what do you think? Stepping out from behind a tree, the bug using ninja gave the impression of a frown. Although her control is excellent, Sakura is not currently a logical choice for teammate in terms of our primary function. Her stamina, strength and speed would make her a hindrance for our scouting missions, and her fighting technique is pedestrian. While her rate of improvement is notable, getting her up to speed will be time-consuming, a fact that will most likely anger Kiba upon his recovery. Either our function will have to change, or she will have to demonstrate more specialized ability in order to be useful. Sighing at the cold and precise attack upon their new member, Kurinai shrugged, we won't be taking major missions for a while, regardless. I'll get her into better shape, but just remember that Sakura is not Hanada. She will progress at her own rate of speed and develop skills that suit her style. We will just have to see how that goes and proceed from there, alright. Living a resigned nod, Shino proceeded to return home. The sound attack had damaged some of Aburam's equipment and he was needed to aid in the repairs. Shaking her head in mild frustration, Kurinai decided to see if Asuma was available. After today, she could really use a drink. The first day of training started off so innocently, it was criminal. Shizun met with her two fellow apprentices at daybreak, smiling as she explained that Tsunade Sama was handling her cover as the crone of the seed. Therefore, they would be working under her for most of the morning. Remembering how crazy Tsunade Bachan had been so far, Naruto took this moment to relax a bit. Shizun Nichan was so nice that anything that she put them through couldn't be that bad. He and Hinata Chan could take on anything she came up with, you got that unfortunately for the two Chunin that fit the phrase famous last words. Apparently, once you've been Slug Sanin's loyal apprentice for over a decade, you pick up some of her sadism. Shizun had them run through physical exercise after exercise, push-ups, jumping jacks, squats, running in place, and running laps around the clearing. This treatment continued for three hours, leaving even the energetic Naruto drained and wiped out. Every time that he stumbled or tripped, Shizun had him start from the beginning of the exerciser set, forcing his muscles into greater coordination. But after the warm-up, Shizun noticed Hanada's exhaustion and decided to play dirty. Flustering kids was so much fun. Anada, we are going for another two hours, if you keep the jacket on, you'll die of heat stroke. Lose it, stretch out, and get ready to continue. Too tired to care about modesty, Hinata shucked the jacket and tried to stretch out. Luckily, this left Shizun in the perfect position to see Naruto's reaction. The young ninja's eyes seemed to triple in dimension as he was treated to the side of Hayuga Hinata, the most physically developed Kanoichi of their generation stretching in form-fitting, sweat-dampened clothes. Apparently getting his second wind, Naruto seemed completely focused for the rest of the session. Shizun might have been confused by the reaction if she hadn't heard about Sakura's mood swings. Clearly, Naruto was worried that he would pass out from a nosebleed and get beaten up by a group of angry Kinoichi. Given his present company, that actually demonstrated a reasonable level of survival instinct. Tsunade Sama's anger the previous night had been truly terrifying, which could only enforce this sort of behavior. 
Having worked them into the ground, Shizun prepared a simple lunch, allowing the two Chunin to cool off. After they had eaten, she began to outline the academic requirements for their apprenticeships. Each was expected to know basic first aid, name the major organ groups and their individual components, and the identity and position of each hand bone by the end of the week. However, studying would be done between their other training and in the evenings before dinner. Most of the initial lessons would be physical and advanced chakra control. That was what Sanadi planned on working with them on. Hocking her head to the side, Shizun frowned as she continued, although, Naruto-kun, in your case, it will be more along the lines of relearning chakra control. Once Tsunade Sama returns this afternoon, there are a few tests that we can run, which will give us a greater understanding of what specifically you need to work on. Rummaging through her pack, Shizun handed Hinata a scroll on the organs, while Naruto got a basic text of first aid maneuvers. Hunkering down with her own text, Shizun smiled as both students began to study immediately. However, within a few minutes Naruto was closing the text in surprise. Arg. What the heck is this? Looking up in shock, Hinata closed her own scroll in confusion. What is in? Naruto-kun. Gulping, the blonde Chunin threw the scroll at her, like it was on fire. Opening it, Hinata was treated to the side of a basic manual resuscitation technique, used to conserve chakra whenever possible. Of course, it included diagrams of the practitioner compressing the patient's chest and breathing into their mouth. Although if you didn't actually read the description, it might be mistaken for kissing. Hinata-chan. Oh man, stay with me Hinata-chan. Shizuni-chan. Your study guide knocked her out again. Walking towards the Yamanaka residence, Sakura had a smile on her face and a spring in her step. Finally, a day with no training. She might want to get stronger, but only the obsessed or the brainless could go for months on end without a break. Today, she would act like a normal girl, meet with Ino, and even go shopping. With all of the additional work she had been doing, Sakura was completely out of touch. Therefore, she was looking forward to hanging out with her old rival and gossiping like a schoolgirl again. Maybe she could even ask the blonde's opinion about what the red chakra might be. Truly, it was a day of grand possibilities. However, as a trained Kanoichi, it was not hard to feel the aura of gloom surrounding the Yamanaka house when she got there. Something big must have happened. Feeling a cold lump settle in her stomach, Sakura knocked on the door hesitantly. Even with all the bad vibes surrounding the house, she had to at least see if Ino was alright. When Mrs. Yamanaka opened the door, the combination of anger and depression on her face were mildly alarming. Her features seemed to soften upon realizing the identity of the caller. Sakura-chan, it's been so long. How can I help you today? Straightening out her shoulders, Sakura met her gaze squarely, I was hoping to talk with Ino, is she in? Wincing, the elder Yamanaka sighed, Ino-chan's in, but she hasn't left her room for most of the week. She didn't take the family meeting very well. Blinking in confusion, Sakura was about to ask what meeting she was talking about, but her train of thought was interrupted by the appearance of Ino's dad in the doorway. Despite his clear lack of sleep, the man was still a jonin and could be very intimidating when he chose to be. Reaching for his wife's shoulder to silence her, he looked into the young jonin's eyes. Please, Sakura-chan, try talking with her. She won't listen to us and we're getting very worried. Gulping, Sakura entered the house, pausing to remove her sandals. The aura of gloom only intensified when she climbed the stairs, setting off alarms in her mind. Something bad had happened. What was wrong with Hino? Sakura couldn't help but ask herself if she was going to lose someone else so soon. Running the rest of the way to Ino's bedroom, Sakura could feel the intense sorrow emanating from behind the door. Knocking quickly she almost yelled, Ino. Ino pig. Are you there? Please, answer me. Her own genius intellect, reawakened by Kurinai's rigorous training, kept coming up with reasons for the silence, each one worse than the last. Therefore, when the door cracked open after five minutes of frantic pounding, it was all she could do not to collapse in relief. Then she had a good look at her friend and wanted to cry. What was going on? Ino looked horrible. Her hair was a mess, her face was covered in tear tracks, and it looked like she hadn't taken a bath or shower in days. Her clothes obviously had not been changed, and the bandages across her arms and legs were turning slightly yellow. Ino would never let herself look this bad, even if someone was dying. Whatever had happened had to be epic. Pulling the girl back into the room, Sakura sat her on the bed. Ino. Ino, talk to me, what's wrong? Looking at her old friend with haunted eyes, Ino cracked out, am I a good person, Sakura? I mean, if I was a bad person, you tell me right. Confused, Sakura shrugged helplessly. You might be annoying, but you're not a bad person, Ino. Now tell me what happened. Please. Sakura could barely hear the downcast Ino whisper, I'm related to monsters. About an hour after reviving Hinata, Sanadi rejoined them, careful to remove her disguise before appearing. Doing a quick scan to check their physical status, she nodded to herself, you're both in good shape, all things considered. 
Hinata, Shizun is going to help you with advanced water walking this afternoon. Naruto, you are going to come with me. Leading the young Chunin into another part of the flower field, Sanadi started going through a series of hand seals. Circling around Naruto, she formed three circles around her fellow blonde. Finishing the sequence, Sanadi shouted out, medical chakra measure jutsu. Forming a series of yellowish barriers around her favorite blonde. Wiping her forehead, she smiled, okay Naruto. This technique allows us to check the intensity and volume of your chakra. I want to get a feel for where your reserves are before we proceed. Simply channel some chakra, and the barriers will measure your current potential, okay? Apparently enthusiastic that he could start training in ninjutsu again, Naruto began to channel his power with a simple ram seal. Imagine his surprise when nothing happened. Tapping her foot, Tsunade responded to his efforts with a single raised eyebrow. Blinking, Naruto began to focus with all of his might, trying to picture the chakra within him rising to the surface. Every ounce of his improved focus was put into finding his power. Sanadi stood there calmly, watching as his face appeared more and more constipated. Buffing her nails, the Hokage sighed, she was afraid of this. Finally, after nearly ten minutes, a flash of chakra boiled off of Naruto's skin. Although it was brief, all but the last barrier surrounding him was shattered. The remaining one, meanwhile, turned a deep purple while cracking. Exhausted, he collapsed on the ground, looking like he had run a marathon. Matching gazes with her fellow blonde, Sanadi would see the question simmering in his eyes. What the heck was going on? Dispelling the remainder of the, Sanadi walked over to join her fellow blonde on the ground. Well Naruto, I thought that might happen. Your recovery is going to take longer than I thought. Groaning, Naruto fixed her with a look, clearly worried. Bachan, what's wrong with my chakra? I've never had that much trouble controlling it before. Closing her eyes in concentration, Sanadi started to explain, Naruto, you know how chakra is the combination of both physical and mental energies, right? Hearing his clothes rustle with a nod, she continued, each of the different seals placed on you limited both your physical and mental development rather severely. While those seals have been undone, they appear to have resulted in a massive destabilization between these two forces in you. Thus, you can't channel chakra effectively right now. Opening her eyes, Sanadi sighed at the confusion in his expression, okay, how about this, imagine two glass pitchers, one filled with blue liquid and one filled with yellow liquid. The blue liquid represents your physical energy and the yellow liquid your mental energy. Are you with me so far? Seeing his nod, she continued, now, to get chakra, you take the two pitchers and pour them into a large glass bowl, representing your chakra pathways. Taking both hands, you lift the different pitchers and pour them into the bowl. The two liquids mix, forming a new green-colored liquid which represents chakra. That's the simple version on how a person generates chakra in order to power the various ninja techniques. The more even the mix, the better the quality of chakra and the easier your techniques are to execute. Holding his chin as if in deep thought, Naruto's eyes lit up, it's kind of like cooking them. If you add too much water or too much spice to a batch of ramen, it doesn't taste that good. Therefore, you need to be careful that the quality of the mix is just right for the perfect flavor. Sweat dripping at the metaphor, Sanadi smiled nervously. Right Naruto, exactly like that. Now here's the problem, when the limiting seals were removed, each pitcher and the glass bowl increased in size significantly, therefore they're heavier and more difficult to move. Now, with your physical development normalizing, you can sort of lift the blue pitcher, although it's a bit unstable, and can pour it in no problem. However, you can't manage to lift the yellow jug at all, as a result you end up scooping out small ladlefuls of the yellow liquid. Then, you fling those tiny amounts at the stream of blue liquid entering the bowl. Thus, while you can channel chakra, it is very unbalanced. Seeing his downturned face, she tried to encourage him a bit. Don't worry, Naruto. I have some training that will help you develop your mental energy. Plus the small amount of chakra that you did channel was extremely dense. I have never seen that level of potential in a person before, and once it's more under control, you will be a lot stronger. Sighing, Naruto looked at Tsunade with his gaze filled with uncharacteristic depression, but, Bachan, you just said that I was too stupid to channel chakra. How am I supposed to get smarter? I'm not exactly the best with studying. Frowning at this, Tsunade shook her head in denial, I said no such thing. You have been showing excellent memorization and retention while we were traveling for the last few days. The thing that is important now is training your mind to apply knowledge rather than absorb it. Knowing the names of every country on the continent doesn't make you smarter. However, knowing how they relate to one another and applying that knowledge, does. So, until we can stabilize your mental development and focus, you will be going through some special training. Squaring his shoulders, Naruto nodded firmly, his face an open book of previous trials already accomplished. Smirking at the look of determination, Sanadi reached into her pack. Tell me, Naruto, have you ever heard of a game called Chinese Checkers? Looking down at her hands, Ino felt the story flow from her mouth. 
tragically, the only thing keeping Sakura silent was the blonde's pleading gaze. After leaving the hospital a few days ago, Daddy and I went to the old Yamanaka meeting hall. There used to be a larger main house for the clan, but with all of the deaths during the Kaiubi attack, it was deemed too wasteful to maintain. The clan just cleans up the outside every two months with a genin team and keeps it locked down most of the time. But there is this chamber down there designed for family gatherings where important matters are to be discussed. The clan isn't that large anymore, but every member was in there, waiting for us. It was a full clan judgment, those are only done for the worst kind of criminals or betrayals of the clan. As far as I know, there hasn't been one for nearly 20 years, and that was for the mental assault of a civilian over the course of two months. The Yamanaka clan only makes judgments of this nature when the Hokage is unable to intercede due to politics or other complications. No one is brought before such a judgment without guilt already confirmed through the most stringent and effective means. Squeezing Sakura's hand for comfort, Ino struggled to maintain her calm. She was a Kanoichi and couldn't let this overwhelm her anymore. But Sakura, it was my cousin Kenshin. He's been nice to me my entire life, always finding time to play with me and my younger relatives. He was the one who would sneak us treats at family gatherings, tell us stories, and protect us when we were napping. I couldn't believe that he was being charged in a clan judgment. It was so confusing, and I kept hoping that it was some kind of mistake. But it only got worse. Taking a shuddering breath, the hurt Yamanaka forced herself to keep going. Each word was torture, but she refused to hide from what had happened. That would make her no better than them. He was one of the people who sealed Naruto. He went up to Naruto after someone beat him up and inscribed seals to limit his mind. Someone in my family, who I trusted since I was a kid, watched a little boy get assaulted for 10 minutes for fun. Then he and Uncle Jinzo, who used to bring me dolls before the academy, went up to his bleeding form, took his blood, and scribbled into his wounds. The pain must have been excruciating. I've seen descriptions of those seals in my family training. The combination those two used would turn any normal person into a drooling moron. It's amazing that Naruto functioned as well as he did. Daddy was really angry, he said that their actions were an affront to the clan and all it stood for. Such crimes had already cost Kenshin his ninja position and a lot of his savings. Jinzo's involvement meant that the primary funds of the Amanaka clan had been hurt as well. Daddy wanted to make an example of Kenshin to show that the family was not filled with those who enjoy assaulting or torturing children. Then. Then. Rubbing her eyes, Ino looked at Sakura in despair, Sakura, most of the family defended what they had done. A lot of them thought that Kenshin and Jinzo should be seen as heroes. Many were only angry that they couldn't have done more before an Anbu patrol had intervened. I had to sit there for nearly 20 minutes while my family said Naruto didn't have the right to live. Clearly agitated, Sakura tried rubbing the small of her friend's back, coaxing a small sigh of relief from the blonde. It was a trick Ino herself used to do when other kids would pick on the bookworm back in school. Luckily, it was still fairly effective. Ino. What did you do next? Stiffening, Ino whispered, I yelled at them, asked relatives that I had loved and adored for years why they were doing this. Did the Yamanaka family have a thing for children? Should I feel lucky that I never got into pranks because it would make it open season on my brain? They were pissed, but daddy wouldn't let them answer. Said that I made an excellent point about how this could not happen again. He managed to get Kenshin punished by sealing all of his knowledge and memories before removing them from his mind. He was just a mindless husk then and would be set up with a private caregiver as an invalid. Afterwards they tried to justify themselves to me, explaining that Naruto was no good and needed to be punished. It went on for hours. Sniffing, Ino pulled a shock Sakura into a hug. How can I face Naruto, Sakura? I might not have been close friends with him, but I never hated him. I feel so guilty now, like it's my fault that he was the dead last in the academy. Plus, how can I trust I know right from wrong after people I trusted to show me the difference acted like that? Sighing, Sakura tried to work out a reply to the nearly frantic girl. You know, you're not your family. The fact that you feel bad about the situation demonstrates that. All you are doing now is punishing yourself, and believe it or not, Naruto would not like that at all. He hates it when people suffer, so you are going to get a shower, get dressed, and come with me to eat. You cannot stay here for the rest of your life. But Sakura. Blaring, Sakura forced her friend to meet her eyes, now, Ino. Besides, I think that we have some other things to talk about, and you look like a stiff wind could blow you over. I can't have my old rival in ninjutsu and love be seen out looking like this, now can I? Snorting despite herself, Ino headed into the bathroom to clean up. Nervous, Hinata joined Shizun by the edge of the lake near their temporary home. Smiling at the shy girl, Shizun calmly explained the next exercise. Now Hinata-chan, Kurinai said that you had mastered the water walking exercise, correct? Giving a hesitant nod, the Hayuga was directed to the middle of the water. Please demonstrate the technique for me. 
Calming her breath, Hinata channeled chakra to the soles of her feet and proceeded to walk to the center of the lake. After observing her flow of chakra, Shizun clapped her hands together. That's very good Hinata-chan, you have a real affinity for this exercise. When we test elemental chakra types, I'll bet you are a classic water user. Blushing under the praise, Hinata was careful to continue the constant flow of power to her feet. Straightening her back, Shizun assumed a serious expression. Now, I think, is the best time to talk about the role of the medic. While Naruto is technically training as one too, his shadow clone jutsu and heightened stamina give him more options when it comes to our philosophy. Beginning to pace, Shizun fixed Hinata in place with a look, the suddenness of the action nearly caused a poor girl to lose control of the exercise. Hinata, the purpose of a medic is to protect his or her comrades. However, you cannot do that if injured or out of chakra, so much of your training will involve dodging, avoidance and deflection of attacks. You will learn to heal with your chakra, your mind, your supplies and your wits. The first objective of the medic is not to take out the enemy, but to heal your squad mates. Do you understand? Nodding rapidly, Hinata tried to make eye contact while maintaining her balance. Appearing to cheer up, Shizun picked up a pebble. Now then Hinata-chan, we're going to start the advanced water walking exercise. I am going to upset the water's surface by throwing these pebbles, which will create small waves. For the moment, I just want you to concentrate on staying afloat, okay? Gulping, Hinata responded, H hi. Shizun-senpai. The technique was surprisingly hard, alternating the flow of chakra in response to practically hundreds of variations in the surface density while staying still was very taxing. Each splash varied in strength, timing and intensity, further complicating the sensation. Coupled with a workout from that morning, Hinata found herself feeling exhausted. However, Shizun refused to let up, and before they had realized it, nearly two hours had passed with no sign of stopping. All of the tension and stress began to build, making concentration that much harder, soon the little Hyuga was nursing a major headache from concentrating for so long. As a result, her focus began to slip, little by little, until she was on the surface only through instinct. This turn of events, however, led to an interesting discovery. Apparently pleased with Hinata's progress so far, Shizun reached for a larger stone to finish the training for the night. However, the deeper splashing noise startled the girl out of an exhausted daze, causing her to lash out instinctively with a jaikin strike. Unfortunately, this disrupted her control, sending the exhausted girl to the bottom of the lake. Before submerging, Hinata couldn't help but notice that the wave of water that almost struck her was cut in two. When I concentrated chakra into my palm, it focused into a beam to slice the water. I wonder if I could replicate that effect. Sighing ruefully, Shizun called out, okay, Hinata-chan, let's call it a day. You've got to dry off before Naruto sees you. We don't want the kid to die from blood loss. Blushing to the roots of her hair, Hinata forgot about the odd phenomenon. For the moment. Sakura had always avoided Ichiraku Raymond like the plague. First, it was to conserve her figure, no one liked overweight girls, then she didn't want Naruto or Sasuke to think her presence constituted a date with the dork. Also, looking at how Naruto survived on nothing but Raymond all day every day made her somewhat queasy. However, the first time she had agreed to join her teammate there to discuss Asuke's curse mark, Sakura had noticed the kind words and pleasant atmosphere of the stall. She had to admit the quality of the noodles and broth was exceptional and very comforting. Therefore, after guiding her distraught friend from the house, they found themselves sitting at a familiar counter looking at the menu. As silly as it sounded, Naruto was right about one thing, Raymond could actually make you feel better. It was an odd flash of brilliance, but something to consider for the future, comfort was rapidly becoming scarce in their respective circles. Smiling at AM, Sakura ordered a small pork ramen, while Ino asked for a seafood bowl. Nodding abruptly, the ramen server turned to prepare the orders with barely a word. Nonplussed a bit by the treatment, Sakura turned to Ino, alright, Ino, I think that we need to think a bit about what to do from here. First of all, will you get in trouble for talking about the judgment with me? Shuddering at the memory, the normally overbearing princess eyed, I shouldn't, those kinds of meetings are done to establish the clan's opinion on an event. While most of the members were not happy about the results, they should have been made known. Otherwise, the whole exercise would be a waste. I haven't left my room for days, though, so I have no idea about what people are saying. Nodding thoughtfully, Sakura began using her reawakened and sharpened intellect. Maybe we should try to find out what rumors are spreading before you make any plans to repay Naruto. I know you feel guilty, but we don't have enough information about the situation. If people are all outraged about the decision, I think that we need to find out why. I'm getting tired of hearing about my teammate going through this shit and not knowing the reason for it in the first place. Narrowing her eyes, Ino clicked her teeth in annoyance, you know. That's not a bad idea. Even when they were arguing with me about my defense, no one would spell out the flaws in the argument. I smell a secret and it's really beginning to bug me. Maybe I can clear his name to make amends. 
it's a place to start at least. Thankful that progress had been made, both girls looked up as their finished orders were set before them, perhaps with a little more force than normal. Snapping their chopsticks with a ritual call to eat, Sakura and Ino reached for the ramen, all of this plotting and scheming was making them hungry. However, with the first bite, both Kanoichi knew something was wrong, the flavors were the same, and the proportions were fine. But some intangible element was missing from the normally savory dish. Seeing how Am was gripping her knife while cutting ingredients, Sakura gulped, if she didn't know any better, it was almost like the civilian was putting out killing intent. Maybe she had heard something that the two of them had missed during their respective distractions. Clearing her throat, Sakura decided an interrogation was in order, Ano, oh Am san Could we ask you a few questions? Turning, the normally pleasant girl flashed a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. I will see what I can do, Sakura-san, Yamanaka-san, but if things get busy, I cannot guarantee my continued presence. Eyebrow twitching, Ino was getting nervous, that level of formality from the normally relaxed server usually meant she was really pissed off about something. What the heck happened now? We've been trying to find out why people have been attacking Naruto. Crack. Both girls' sweat dropped, seeing the cutting board nearly snap in two. Forcing a neutral expression, AM gritted her teeth. I would think that of anyone here, you would be aware of situations where Naruto-kun was attacked, Yamanaka-san, especially after giving your relative sanctuary for his crimes. Looking at the Raymond waitress in shock, Ino couldn't bring herself to answer. What the hell was A.M. talking about? Sanctuary. A.M.-san. Holding her hand up, Sakura squinted in irritation. A.M.-san, I've been training with a new team for the last week, and Ino hasn't left the house in days. What the heck are people saying happened to Yamanaka Kenshin? Blinking at the confusion in her voice, A.M. decided to ease up a bit, this whole week had been stressful enough without looking for trouble. Word around the village is that, after reviewing Kenshin's accomplishments, the Yamanaka clan sent him into isolation to protect him from further retaliation from the Hokage's office. There are people chatting about it all over town, celebrating that one of the great Yamanaka heroes is safe. Bapping, the two genin realized something very wrong was going on here. Grumbling at the sixth game of Chinese checkers, it was all Naruto could do not to scream. This was humiliating. While well, Hinata-chan got to learn a new chakra control exercise, he was stuck playing board games. Sure it was fun, even if he hadn't managed a win yet, but still. How was he supposed to get better control over his chakra with a game? Noting the Chunin's mounting frustration, Sanadi called a break, reaching over for some water. Pouring the liquid, Sanadi handed him the cup with a smile. Incidentally, this particular scene or variations thereof had been a secret fantasy of Jiraiya for decades. However after sipping his drink after a subdued thank you, Naruto continued to stew in his own frustration, a state of affairs that the blonde Hokage would no longer allow or tolerate. Bonk. Now, Bachan. Naruto grumbled, holding his head in pain. As far as Tsunade hits went, it was relatively mild. His vision would probably stop revolving in about 20 minutes or so. Snorting, Tsunade shook her head, oh relax, Naruto-kun. I know that this might seem boring, but this is only a warm-up. After I think that you have mastered this, we'll start playing Go. Rubbing his forehead in frustration, Naruto finally lost control of his temper, but Bachan. How's playing board games going to make using my chakra easier? Irritated with his attitude, Tsunade decided to bring out the big guns. Sniff. But Naruto-kun, don't you like playing with me? A teary-eyed Sanin pouted, biting her thumb in faux depression. Normally, Naruto would have called bullshit within seconds of such an act. However, still slightly off balance from Hinata's display earlier, the hyperactive ninja found himself tongue-tied. Noting the reaction, she smirked, yeah, this girl still had it. Poor boy didn't know what to do with himself like this, it would have to be one part of his education that they didn't correct too quickly. Teasing the kid was just so much fun. Sighing at the dumbstruck expression, Tsunade flicked his forehead. Oh chill out Naruto, there is actually a fairly simple reason we're doing this. Your mind has a lot of untapped and untested potential, but we need to ease into using it. From what I hear, Shikamaru spends hours sharpening his mental ability with games of shogi against Asuma, it's his form of meditation. Games like this might seem simple, but constantly practicing the tactical and focusing techniques required to master them will help develop your mental abilities. Stronger mental abilities will mean better focus when using your chakra control and less waste when employing your power, understand. Grumbling, Naruto moved a marble with a firm clicking noise. Then why aren't we playing shogi? Bantering his effort with her own, Sanadi calmly replied, shogi tactics don't reflect your way of fighting. Memorizing the specialized methods and techniques of specific pieces doesn't really fit your constant use of shadow clones. However, a game where every piece shares the same potential and only changes value based upon its position is much more suitable. The Chinese checkers is simply a warm-up to get you used to the mentality. 
while you master it, I'm also going to have you meditate and attempt basic chakra control exercises by the end of the month. Right now though, you are still recovering somewhat, so pushing too hard won't gain us anything. Moving another marble, she had to suppress a smirk. He might be complaining a lot, but each game was taking a bit longer to finish, if this kept up, she might have to increase the difficulty level a bit. Arming his face in frustration, Naruto gave into the inevitable truth, he was never going to get a sane, effective teacher in his lifetime. Although, after he got used to it, playing games with someone you liked was a nice experience. This was probably the first time anyone had ever bothered to take this much time for him. Shuddering at the unsettling thought, Naruto returned his full concentration to the board, deciding to make this game his first victory. It was an overly optimistic desire, he determined later, but a step in the right direction. Biba settled back into bed after his latest checkup. Apparently, the stab wound had healed cleanly and would be nothing but a memory in a few weeks. If all went well, he would be returning to active duty within the month. Despite the positive news, the dog ninja couldn't bring himself to celebrate that much. With Hinata gone, his pack and thus his family were incomplete. The only things keeping him at the hospital, instead of the training ground releasing some frustration, were the dual threats of further injury and an angry sister. Anna had come in to check on Akamaru nearly 20 minutes after his physical had started, clearly pissed about something. The ninja dog medic's focus was completely taken up by the puppy's injuries, but her own triplet attack squad gave away a furious state of mind. Nervous twitching and pheromones assaulted Kiba's senses worse than the time his special reading material had been discovered in the spring cleaning. The Inuzuka liked to think of themselves as a family first and a clan second, so worried about this state of affairs, the hard-headed Genin attacked the problem with his normal focus and ability, hey sis, what's eating ya? That is to say, a complete lack thereof. Forcing herself to drop Akamaru's paw before causing injury, Hana threw a glare at her annoying little brother. Seeing the flinch, she forced herself to breathe, this actually wasn't Kiba's fault for once. Sorry squirt, but the clan is pissing me off right now. This might be the last time you see for a bit, I'm petitioning the Hokage for some extra missions on the side to get out of the village. Blinking, Kiba had to keep from falling off the bed in shock, Hana hadn't taken missions regularly since attaining her veterinary license. Why would she want to leave the village in her practice? They were her life. Sis. Sighing in frustration, the elder Inuzuka stood up. Fine, if you must know the clan has decided that we need to be a part of the Achiha breeding program. But I refuse to be put out like a bitch in heat. Blinking, Kiba stuttered, breeding program hearing about how the village was going to preserve the Sharingan, the ninja dog Jenin had to wonder if the mission's success was worth it. Just how many people are doing this crap? Leaning back against the wall, Hana felt her hackles rise, not that many at all. The Hyuga are not interested in the least, saying that there are too many issues with compatibility. The Akamichi, Nara, Yamanaka, and Aburam are all citing a lack of appropriate candidates. The Kurama clan is hesitant to put their heir through the pregnancy in her current mental condition, and the last pure-blooded Senju is out of the village. However, a lot of the Inuzuka think that the Sharingan would work wonders with our ninjutsu school, so mom's putting pressure on me to accept, as if my first child is going to be the spawn of a traitor. Helping, Kiba tried to stay small and quiet, the first rule of the weaker animal is not to draw attention to oneself after all, and the aura around his sis was scary. Shaking her head, Hana forced a smile, things might be tense at home for a while Kiba. If I was you, I'd do as much training or missions that involved leaving the village as possible. You won't be up for a proper family tussle for a while. I'll check in with you when you're ready to get out of here, okay? Ruffling his hair like a rambunctious pup, she left, the triplets following in her wake. Looking over at Akamaru, he began to wish for a book or something. Being stuck in the hospital might have sucked, but being around two feuding Inuzuka women was just suicidal. He might be loud and a little dim at times, but Kiba was not that stupid. As Shizun stirred the pot filled with their dinner, she took a moment to reflect upon the day. For so many years, it had been just Sanadi sama Tantan and herself, wandering around the elemental nations for the next big score fight. She cared deeply for her mentor, but the constant travel had been wearing down on her soul for a while, as the activity was clearly not healing Tsunadi at all. Naruto had ended up saving her from the ghosts of the past, and she could never thank him enough for that action. It was a shame that, after all of that effort to return to Konoha, it has been undone by those old farts. However, this time the trip didn't hurt much at all. Tsunadi was barely drinking, she was teaching instead of constantly learning, and they had their own built-in soap opera to boot. Who would have thought that the Hyuga heiress would have fallen so hard for the village pariah? Hinata was really a sweet girl, but some of her actions concerned the brunette. Although she was no Yamanaka mind healer, signs of emotional abuse seemed to sing from every action the younger apprentice made. However, Shizun was not crass enough to bring it up directly. All she could do would be to help out as much as she could, while ensuring that the poor girl didn't take up any of Tsunade's methods for the problem. 
one drunken medic was more than enough, thank you very much. Unmindful of the speculative look Shizun was throwing at her, Hinata concentrated on her anatomy text with complete abandon. Unlike the studying she and Naruto had previously undertaken, this was completely new material. Each bit of knowledge would make her a stronger medic, thus more helpful in Naruto's recovery. However, although the Hyuga had some familiarity with the organ groups from her clan training, these terms and technical names were difficult to memorize. If she wasn't careful, they might leave her behind. That would not be allowed to happen. Of course, that was the point that Naruto got bored with the various ways of setting bones and decided to chat with the shy girl. Although they had been talking for the last few days with minimal issue, Hinata was still flustered by their close contact. Fainting would have commenced quickly if Naruto hadn't started commenting on her organ scroll. Soon, he was firing off question after question, forcing Hinata to concentrate on the talk before she could faint. Surprisingly, her natural inclination to focus on Naruto's speech and actions helped her review the text significantly faster than before. As soon as the hyperactive blonde took a breath, Hinata realized that the contents of the scroll had been fully memorized. It was all she could do not to break out laughing in relief. Naruto was just having a ball, despite his earlier protests, this was actually shaping up to be one of the best experiences of his short life. He had friends, senseis who would train him, as weird as their methods were, and people who believed in him. With all of the fun from the last few days, the nightmares hadn't bothered him in a while. Plus, with Hinata-chan's help, the academy made so much more sense. Suddenly, all of that time lost because of pranks or senseis telling him to wait in the hall or confiscating his books was made up in days. Instead of constantly feeling like an idiot, Naruto actually began to understand things. It was awesome. The only thing that was bothering him were these strange urges. Sure, he had always liked seeing cute girls, but lately it was getting worse. Sometimes he just wanted to grab Hinata-chan and not let go or ask Shizune-chan for a back rub. Even Sanadi botch and hugging went constantly through his mind. No one had ever explained these sorts of feelings to him and it was leaving the poor boy very confused. Most of the time he could suppress them, but if he couldn't train to burn off energy soon, the Jinchuriki knew he'd go crazy. The weird thing was, a laugh from Hinata-chan almost affected him twice as strongly as a smile from Sakura-chan. Looking into her sake cup, Sanadi smiled softly. So far, things had gone according to plan, Naruto was getting better by leaps and bounds, Hinata had the makings of an excellent apprentice, and Shizun was learning the joys of teaching. They would be staying in a peaceful country with only a few appearances of that stupid crone disguise. The whole thing was making her nostalgic. This is the sort of peace her first trip should have brought her. Sanadi might love Shizun like a daughter, but things were so much more fun this time around. Stretching, she went in to help with dinner. This was not a vacation, but a chance to heal and grow. Before they knew it, Naruto would be fully restored and deliberations over the next step could begin. Hamura and Kaharu wouldn't be going anywhere while the daimyo favored them, but knowing Jiraiya, Danzo should soon be an issue of the past. Hopefully, after things were fixed, she could meander back and keep things under control for a few years. If all went well, Naruto could take over before he was 20. She really was too old for that shit. Chapter 9. The Razor's Edge of Destruction. There are 5, no 6 birds and 27 trees to the right behind me. Therefore, there are a total of 37 birds, 156 trees and 29 squirrels within a 2-mile radius of my location. Relaxing her by Akugan for the first time in 25 minutes, Hinata rubbed her temples in pain. Hyuga endurance and concentration practice was always such a headache. Standing up on the surface of the lake, she started to head towards the shore, it was her turn to make breakfast, and Sanadi sama hated to be kept waiting. Besides, they had gotten some very nice sweet potatoes from the daimyo the other day, and the quiet Hyuga wanted to check them over for lunch. It wasn't a cinnamon bun, but nothing else really was either. After the last two and a half weeks in vegetable country, the group was finally settling into a pattern. Sanadi, or Shizun, if badgered enough, would don the disguise of the crone of the seed and proceed to the castle to heal patients. The remaining medic would put them through intensive workouts all morning, pushing them to the point that even Naruto would be dropping from exhaustion. When questioned about the intensity, Sanadi revealed that most combat that a medic ninja saw was expected to be performed without the use of chakra. Given the ratio of medics to normal ninja, we have to conserve every bit of power possible. If saving your life with a fireball means being unable to heal a stab wound later, the medic ninja has failed their primary duty. Thus, it became standard practice for the two medics to work them as hard as possible for hours, often going to bed barely coherent. However, the grueling pace was beginning to show results. Each day had them going farther, doing more, and growing faster in ways that never ceased to amaze the shy girl. Being the top medic in the world, Tsunade knew more about physical limits and development than anyone else alive, perhaps save Orochimaru. Therefore, each workout was carefully modulated to gain a maximum result with minimal effort. 
the efficiency of the training was startling, yet satisfying. In such a short time, Hinata was actually beginning to feel worthy of her title as Chunin. The Hyuga knew that she would never have become this strong on her own, and like everything wonderful in her life, she accredited it to a certain hyperactive blonde. Naruto had also flourished under the new training. With each exercise and treatment, he was showing massive improvement. Actions that would have sent him sprawling days ago were now done with ease and precision. Between the physical workouts, both Chunin proceeded with academic study, a subject where Naruto actually was helping her. Somehow, the previously dim kid would take every text that they were assigned and break it down into simple segments. Each time that they helped each other study, Hinata came away with a surprisingly large amount of improvement herself. Although Naruto-kun claimed that she was the only reason that he understood as much as he did, she thought the same thing right back. The day was a very special day in their training, though. After running test after test and playing games of Chinese checkers against Sanadi, Shizun and Hinata for hours on end, Naruto's mental development and chakra concentration was deemed stable enough to attempt his ninjutsu library. Hopefully, if their predictions about the shadow clone jutsu were correct, Naruto would be able to develop his chakra control much more quickly than before. As it stood, he still had academy-level ability with more than cage-level power, a dangerous combination for his continued survival. Shaking herself out of such depressing thoughts, Hinata automatically started to wash the rice. Training without eating was a disaster waiting to happen, and she would not be responsible for such an issue. Things had been going so well, and she wished for them to continue as such. For while she was more tired, scared, drained and stressed out than any other point in her life, the quietest Hyuga in generations knew one thing. This had been the happiest time of her existence, and she would fight to protect it. Heading into downtown Kanoha, it was all Ino could do not to scream. Everywhere she went these days people were acknowledging her with awe and respect, praising her clan for their bravery. The fact that most of the village civilian population was worshipping one of her relatives for mentally abusing one of her friends made the young Yamanaka angrier and increasingly confused as time went by. Why was Naruto hated so much, how did this happen? These questions had been plaguing her and Sakura for weeks. After straightening out the rumor mill with AM, Ino had marched straight home to find out what was going on. For the last week, the Yamanaka heiress had been wallowing in pain, misery and self-loathing, now she was just pissed. When confronted, Inoichi had admitted the modified rumors had reached him as well. However, his ability to fix the situation was limited by the will of the majority of the Yamanaka clan, many of whom were still angry about the initial ruling. Sometimes a leader must learn to compromise. Kenshin was punished, and the clan won't lead a revolt, that will have to be enough for now. But it wasn't enough, and Ino knew she had to do something about it or go insane with guilt. Simply countering the rumors outright would do very little. The Yamanakas were traditionally based in the village's information and interrogation departments, so any of her relatives could spin the situation to come out smelling pretty. Something subtle would be lost on the masses, though, because many thought the family could do no wrong. To make the proper statement, she would have to be careful, tactful, and methodical. Since that was not really her normal style, Ino sought out her childhood friend, Shikamaru. He might find her troublesome, but the lazy Nara knew his strategy. It turned out that Shikamaru had been kept busy for the last month as an impromptu ambassador for the Suna Genin team. Jiraiya had been given a simple agenda by Tsunade before her escape, and improving relations with their ally was near the top of the list. So, the Suna Genin had been introduced to the Kanohe Ninja Academy, marveling at the way their teachers managed to produce so many potential soldiers in such a relaxed atmosphere. Since he was a low man on the totem pole, Shikamaru had to do a stint as an instructor there to build his Chunin level knowledge and leadership skills. The two agendas aligned well enough that Shikamaru was constantly hanging out with a group during their classes while debating strategy and tactics with Tamari. Kankuro thought the whole experience was a blast, he didn't really have a lot of friends growing up, and Gara was still getting used to the idea of proper comrades. Therefore, it was four minds not one that Ino inadvertently picked once she located the lazy ninja. At first, Ino was hesitant to explain the situation while foreign ninja were present. Even if they were allies now, such matters could be considered an issue of village security and shouldn't have been spread around. Shikamaru had vouched for them, though, and that was good enough for her. Although, she could do without Gara Million Mile Stare. However, as creepy as the kid was, Gara was surprisingly clever when he chose to talk. Between the five of them a plan was formed that, if done just so, would provide the right message to both the village and her family. After tracking down Asuma-sensei at the bar with Kurunai-sensei for a supposed friendly drink, Ino had an appointment set up the next day. Clearly, if compromises and statements needed to be made, she would need the backing of someone in power sympathetic to her cause. At the moment, the only one who liked Naruto and might listen was Jureya-sama himself. Apparently, he had always had a weakness for blondes. Entering the Hokage's office, Ino felt an eyebrow twitch coming on. 
behind a mountain of paperwork Jiraiya Sama, legendary toad sage, was currently using the security crystal ball monitor of the village to peep on the hot springs. However, her killing intent must have registered because one blink later, the evidence was safely out of sight. Ah, Ino-chan. Asuma said that you had something to ask of me. Remembering her errand and the fact she needed the old pervert on her side, Ino calmed down. Hi, Jiraiya-sama, I wish to find housing outside of the Yamanaka clan. While this statement might seem innocent, it was anything but. Heirs to clans never left clan property on their own initiative unless they had major issues with family policy. Even then, they needed the backing of someone in power who could help to shield them from attack in case the clan sought to retrieve the rebellious figure to save face. If Ino did this, all contact with her family would be effectively severed unless the Yamanaka sought out Jiraiya as a go-between, an action that would only happen if they corrected the initial action that led to the separation in the first place. While somewhat shielded by her status as a ninja in good standing, Ino was still taking quite a risk. If enough pressure was accumulated, she might even find herself in front of a clan judgment for insubordination. Being a student of the Sandame and one of Kanoha's major spymasters, Jiraiya picked up on the nuances of her request in an instant. While he didn't blame Inoichi for falling to internal politics, Jiraiya was a little annoyed with the reverence that Yamanaka Kenshin was being spoken of. Providing Inochan with some support would go a long way towards paying them back for such actions, but it lacked a certain something. Thinking through a number of scenarios, the old pervert smirked. He might support Inochan's initiative, but that did not mean he couldn't add his own flair to the situation. Reaching into the monster stacks of paperwork, Jiraiya began to read in an overly pompous voice, Yamanaka Ino, a mission has been brought to my attention that you might find interesting. Over the last few weeks, a residence has been the target of repeated vandalism by varied groups of civilians. While ninja on site often intervened, the fact that 5D rank missions have been issued to repair the damage is a sign of inefficiency. Therefore, since your team is somewhat dissolved at the moment, I am assigning you a solo C rank mission to stay on site to ensure the safety of the location and repair any damage that it sustains. The duration is long term until such time as the original resident, one Yuzumaki Naruto returns to the location. Do you accept it? Eyes widening, Ino realized exactly what Jiraiya was playing at. By basing her in Naruto's apartment, a major message would be sent out to those paying attention. She did not support them and would rather side with Naruto the village pariah than agree with their methods. However, since it was an official mission, no one could censure her for acting within her ninja duties. It was the perfect win-win situation. Smiling brightly, Ino chirped, when should I move in? Jumping from side to side, Hinata kept her by Akigen focused on the targets. Soon, a splash sounded and the Hayuga's hands were a blur of motion. Not every mark had been hit, but nearly 20 more than the previous attempt were shattered. Powering down, she sighed, developing this technique was extremely draining, and if it wasn't for Shizun's help, her accuracy would be nowhere near its current level. Walking from the surface of the lake, she accepted a towel from the smiling brunette and dried off. The shyest Hayuga was more than ready for a break. Adding her fellow apprentice on the shoulder, Shizun beamed, that was very impressive, Hinata-chan. I could almost see the chakra hit the water. Once you perfect your control, I think that your new technique will be truly amazing. Blushing, Hinata couldn't help but remember how this additional training had developed. After a few days of advanced water walking, Hinata had thought back to the initial splitting of the wave with her chakra. Attempts to recreate the effect were difficult, but after several tries, she had managed to split the water with the precision of a laser. Explaining her efforts to the curious Shizun, an off-comment had been made about how, with such precision, she might be able to hit her opponents. That had brought her up short. Ayuga advanced enough in their technique to hit them were rare enough, but those who could do so while in the heat of battle were true gems. Niji had not been granted the title of genius for nothing. However, Hinata hadn't been pushed by anyone else besides Kurunai-sensei in years to develop her Hayuga abilities. Most of the clan had simply written her off as a failure and moved on to Hanabi's potential development. Therefore, Hinata only had the barest of ideas about how to perform the higher level techniques in her clan. Having stumbled upon a training method that might allow her to develop this neglected aspect of her ability was more than just welcome, it was a godsend. So, for every day since that initial discovery, Hinata would use at least an hour of the advanced water walking technique to practice the Jukin. Each resulting splash was mercilessly sliced with her chakra, increasing her control and precision. Shizun had been very helpful, not only in accommodating the unusual training, but with tips on targeting. Being primarily a needle user, Shizun was used to careful attacks and placement of weapons. Between the two of them, Hinata's control of the Byakugan had improved to the point where she was even beginning to see herself and others. This achievement left her breathless with excitement and contemplative about the future. While she knew the basic exercises of the Katen, Hinata was unsure if it would really fit her emerging fighting style. 
although useful against multiple opponents, it was primarily designed for straight combat. As an emerging medic, Hinata's primary duty was always going to be towards her patients and the injured. Therefore, she needed a technique that would allow an ultimate defense that could be guided to protecting others, as opposed to only her. It was difficult, but with additional training taking advantage of her natural flexibility, Hinata was on the cusp of realizing a new technique. It was slow going, but with the extra support she received, the normally self-conscious Hayuga was ready for the challenge. However, the skill would not come about just yet. Oi, Hinata-chan, Shizun. Come here for a minute, I think we need some help. Blinking at the irritated tone, Hinata immediately headed over to her instructor, curious about the concern she heard there, Hi, Tsunade-sama. Sipping her tea calmly, Kahara waited patiently for her guest. When Hamura walked through the door, a contemplative look in his eye, it was all she needed to read the situation, things were not going as smoothly as they had thought. Serving himself at her silent invitation, Hamura rubbed his eyes before sipping the calming brew. I imagine that you had as much luck as I did. Grimacing at his defeated tone, the ancient Kinoichi sighed. If by luck, you mean lower than average, then yes I did. It wasn't that the civilian population wasn't interested in the opportunity to produce the next generation of Ichiha. There had been any number of applicants, from single women to whole moderate civilian clans. Each saw the Ichiha abilities as a stepping stone to greater rewards or a necessary effort for the future betterment of their village. Both ideas had merit and were thus encouraged, happy mothers were healthy mothers after all. No, finding the number of bodies that Jureya had sought shouldn't be a problem at all. The issue was that the expected civilian bidding wars over the rights to the Ichiha name had not happened. This was seen as an opportunity, but no longer an honor. For while they might seem mindless at times, the leaders of the civilian population were far from stupid. Each saw the way the wind was blowing, and it was not in the favor of Sasuke's spawn. Some had even expressed concern over the stability of any offspring, both from their bloodline and their likely reaction at being made the focus of so much pressure. Well-placed civilian families, who made up the backbone of Konoha's infrastructure, were hesitant to invest. Already the ninja population was angry at the betrayal of both living Ichihas, and that attitude had begun to spread to the normal citizens of the village. Despite what either group might think at times, both ninja and civilians needed each other to survive effectively. So with that much anger, it was understandable that the groups they had sought to manipulate were slightly uncooperative. That did not mean that either advisor had to like it. 47 families approached, and only four expressed an interest in the breeding program. Of those four, the highest placed is a family of bakers. These possibilities are going to breed loyal Ichiha, but it will take decades for them to reach anywhere near their previous level of prominence. I am afraid that this is an empty path to power. Shaking her head in agreement, Kaharu sighed, I was lucky to get six interested parties. Most are rather pedestrian, but one was a former ninja clan that fell into obscurity due to a lack of able heirs. At least they might be salvaged with this farce. Leaning back, Hamura stared into his steaming cup in depression. At times like this, I cannot help but feel that Danzo has gone senile. Reaching over to cover her old friend's hand, Kaharu smiled wanly. Oh, he's not senile, just out of touch. Danzo has been hiding in the shadows for so long that he has lost track of the common people in the village. He's clever enough to adapt with some proper exposure. We'll just have to encourage him to get out a little bit. Shaking his head in remorse, Hamura looked at Kaharu directly. Are you sure of this path? All that seems to be happening lately is a lack of direction and constant infighting, Kanoha doesn't need that right now. Straightening her spine, the old woman sighed, it has to be the right path. We have fought for this village for decades and cannot allow the manipulations or threats from some youngsters stop us. Danzo has the resources that we need and has become our pipeline to the daimyo. Without his aid, Kanoha will fall because of our limited assets. Comforted by these words, the two old ninja drank their tea in silence. Their efforts might be for naught, but they wouldn't be able to face their sensei in the afterlife if Kanoha wasn't kept safe, if not by them, then who? Looking over the missive from the daimyo, Danzo suppressed a curse. That little toad boy was too clever for his own good. Shin's team had been forced to wait for weeks before the daimyo would allow an audience. This was not unheard of, but it tied up one of his few root groups for far too long. With the chaos surrounding Kanoha at the moment, he needed everybody he could get. While technically not a time of war, the daimyo's actions were at best foolhardy and at worst dangerous. Clearly, the man wished to send a message about the realities of their relationship, making the return scroll a mere formality. Ureya had managed to bypass the whole issue of waiting by using the Tsiratobi Brad as his messenger. Before any of the situations could be properly presented, Asuma had managed to get to the daimyo first, presenting the entirety of Tsunade's decrees and decisions clearly in black and white. Apparently, their conversation had been illuminating and angered the leader significantly. If not for the numerous guards and trained independent ninja, Danzu might have just had him killed and started over with his replacement. 
things had gotten much worse than he was expecting. The only good thing to come from the scroll was his continued allegiance. The daimyo still believed that Kanoha needed a more stable Hokage and thought using the advisor's counsel to keep things under control was a good idea. However, the loss of the strength of the slug Sanin and potential abuse of a highly visible Kanoha ninja was unsettling. Already, news of Tsunade's little holiday was making the rounds, stirring up international pressure and concern. If they could not keep a stronger leash on Jiraiya, he'd be forced to seek out other options. Growling, it was all Danzu could do not to throw the text in anger. He had been counting upon a stronger show of support than that. Hamura and Kaharu were already leery of further action without more well-placed allies, something he could no longer offer with impunity. What he needed was some sort of controller issue that would raise the need for his services, granting him a greater position of power. Leaning back in irritation, the Warhawk considered his options. Most of his personal spies said that Arachimaru had holed up in rice country, licking his wounds. Suna was provisionally being run by a council of Jonin, but would be tied up looking for the next Kazakiage for a while. Iwa was beginning to move in on Kanoha's business, capitalizing upon the disorganized situation plaguing the mission's office. Kumo was taking a wait-and-see approach to the whole mess, gloating about the possible opportunities. No one was moving, so he had no need to provide special off-the-books missions yet. Perhaps he was looking at this the wrong way. The last time a situation of this nature had occurred, he had tried a secret alliance with Rain to gather the needed support to take over the Hokage's position. While that had fallen through because of a bloody user, it might work this time around. Mind made up, Danzo made his plans. Once word had been received from Sai's group, feelers would be sent to manufacture an incident. The increased trouble would improve his own value, ensuring some needed pull to make changes. Nodding firmly, the crazy old man prepared to retire, fueled by images of war, power and revenge. When looking into improving Naruto's tojutsu technique, Tsunade was presented with two possible methods. Option 1 involved months of careful practice that would slowly integrate new and precise forms into his technique. The second was painful, difficult, slightly insane, but much faster. Since this was Naruto and time was a factor, it seemed like a perfect fit. Of course the hyperactive blonde begged to differ after the first few days participating, but that wasn't really taken into account. Thus, Naruto, angered with his previous attempts at ninjutsu, proceeded to begin his normal training, kick a tree hard enough to tear his muscles into place. This was also known as, 10,000 with the left foot and 10,000 with the right. Tsunade has decided that, instead of training his existing muscles, she would simply work him into the ground until they healed into the right shape. While effective, with his normal regenerative abilities, it took a truly massive volume number of strikes to accomplish anything. Something that Naruto was very happy about in his current state of mind. Nothing had worked. No matter how carefully he channeled his chakra or how little he put into the technique, none of the ninjutsu Tsunade Bachan had let him use had worked for him. Even his shadow clone was pathetic. Of course, finding out from Hinata-chan that he was dumping over 200 times the needed energy into each one was a little scary. Plus, Tsunade hadn't allowed him to use his summoning for fear of blowing their cover with Gamma Bunta. But no substitution, no henge, no shadow clone, that was practically his entire library. Now he knew what Bushy Brow felt like. It had been going so well, too. Each day Naruto felt stronger, went longer, and got more accomplished than his entire time under Kakashi Sensei. Between Tsunade Bachan, Shizune Chan, and Hinata Chan, he actually thought he would become a stronger ninja. But now, after all that hard work, it was like being back to square one. Until he could control this power, Tojutsu was his only option. It left the normally hyperactive ninja stewing in his own dark thoughts. Ozing at the sound of footfalls, he turns around to face his instructor. I didn't say stop, now did I brat. Shrugging, Naruto began to hit the tree again, this time with much greater force. Tsunade was silent, waiting for him to finish taking his anger out on the poor plant. Although, with the way the bark was cracking, she might have to hold him back soon. Silent, the two of them plodded through his exercises, finishing just before dinner. Collapsing, Naruto fell down and made no move to get up. Sighing, Tsunade sat next to him. You know Naruto, it's not that big of a deal. We just don't have the ability to test your stronger attacks just yet. Once we find an area that can handle the destruction, I'll let you summon a thousand clones, okay? Looking up at her worried gaze, Naruto was unusually solemn. I know Bachan. It just feels like things were going so well, and then this happened. What good is all this power if I can't use it? Ruffling his hair, the Sanin snorted, tell you what, kiddo. You might not have the control for a proper medical ninjutsu, but there is one technique I can show you. Let's grab some of Hinata-chan's cooking, and we'll work on it after dinner. Eyes lighting up, Naruto pushed himself off the ground as quickly as possible. The new always made everything better. Laughing at his sudden enthusiasm, Tsunade patted him on the back, see? Things aren't that bad. You'll be throwing around armies before you know it. 
Smirking, Naruto had a sudden thought. Throwing a sideways glance to the blonde Hokage, he drawled, you know Bachan, I don't think that I tried every technique I know. Raising an eyebrow, she cocked her head to the side, oh. What other technique do you have that won't flatten everything in a five mile radius? Making a quick hand seal, Naruto decided a demonstration of his patented cage killer was in order. Sexy Jutsu. Appearing in a cloud of smoke, a taller fuller Naruto joined Sanadi in the field, naked as the day she was born. At least this technique still works. She said with a pout, throwing a kiss. It was all Tsunade could do not to throttle him, so she settled for smacking Naruto upside the head. Rubbing his head in pain, Naruto dispersed the technique. Hey, Bachan, that hurts. It was just a little joke. Tsunade however was no longer listening, looking at her hand in shock. That was actual contact. How could he make a physical illusion of that complexity with his level of chakra control? Staring into the training ground in silence, Hiyashi sipped his tea as Hanabi practiced her forms. Things had once been so simple, Hinata was a failure, Hanabi would take over the clan, and another generation of Hayuga superiority would be ensured. However, recently he had come to question the validity of such beliefs, leaving him in an oddly contemplative mood. Well things haven't changed that much, enough was shifting to make him nervous. Unless dramatic action was taken, Hiashi did not see how the Hayuga could survive. It had started off slowly with the dissemination of Tsunade's order concerning the caged bird seal. While the main house was furious about this treatment, branch house members were beginning to show signs of tenseness and aggravation. Despite its subtlety, the Byakugan could discover much if properly motivated. Branch family members were beginning to chafe under their service, and the decree simply acted as an accelerant. Those who had given in to fate years ago seemed to exude hope for their freedom, a shocking development to the traditionalists in the family. Oh, he actually knew that the counter seal efforts were already underway. Word had reached him of Jurea's examinations of a recovering Niji, and given their possession of the Hayuga seal master, it was really only a matter of time. While no specific instances or information had been brought to his attention, it did not take a genius to determine the next path of action many branch family members would take. Once Jurea had a method in place to remove the seal, it wouldn't surprise him if petitions for emancipation flooded the Hokage office. While they would lose their family name and position, the Hyuga clan would lose the emancipated ninja's protection and financial contributions to the main accounts. Unfortunately, many of the interested parties would view this as a fair trade. What the Hyuga needed was a leader that would encourage the continued alliance of the main house and the branch house. Many of the branch house hated him outright for the sacrifice of his brother, the varied Hyuga elders had shown their abusive roots for years, and Hanabi was still too young and headstrong. Suddenly, a peaceful daughter who showed kindness and compassion, emotions normally shunned by the Hayuga, was a potential godsend. Yet even that avenue of possible control had been removed by a legendary Sanin, who had apparently seen something in Hinata that he had not. The cast-off had become the potential savior of the family, fate truly had a nasty sense of humor. The second, more pressing concern was the Hayuga family's status within the village. After the news of Yuzumaki's ceiling had leaked out to the general public, the Hayuga had been further elevated by the common civilian. While personally disturbed by this chain of events, Hiashi could not argue with the potential opportunity this presented. Many of the elders hoped to convert this support into pressure to reclaim Elder Shinji, nipping the destruction of the caged bird seal before it got anywhere. Despite his misgivings Hiashi was a logical being and capable politician and began to prepare such plans. Unfortunately, it was not to be. Within the last week or so, a second generation of rumors had begun to spread, undermining the support the three families had gained from the assault. The Achiha name had already been badly blackened with Sasuke's recent betrayal, causing people to question the nature of the entire clan. The Yamanaka heiress had apparently made plans to vacate the family property in protest of their sanctuary of Yamanaka Kenshin, using the Hokage as a benefactor. Both of these rumors were mostly inconsequential, seeing as there weren't any Achiha available to slander, and the Yamanaka were carefully placed within the information centers of Konoha and could thus run damage control. The rumors concerning the Hayuga, however, were far more dangerous. For some reason, the civilian population had begun to speculate that Yuzumaki was simply a test run. Stories about secret Hayuga plans to seal normal Konoha ninja to ensure their power had taken off like wildfire. Before, the Hayuga name garnered respect, if generally no affection. Now, people were viewing the clan with fear and mistrust, undermining their position within the village. Unfortunately, due to their attitudes and heightened position within the hierarchy, the Hayuga had few allies to come to their defense. If not stopped soon, this character assassination would ruin the entire family. Letting out a small sigh, Hiashi called an end to the practice. He needed to meditate on these events and formulate a plan of action. Without some sort of effort, the Hayuga might soon be shunned within the walls of their home. They were proud, but not so numerous that leaving Kanoha was tenable. 
unless a proper resolution to these issues could be found, he had no idea as to how they could prosper. Such was his fate and duty as a leader. Councillor Daesuk had served the daimyo of vegetable country for nearly 10 years. He was a fairly important person within the country's financial structure, managing the caravans used to export their goods. Capable, hardworking, and very well-liked, Daesuk was a model for other officials to live up to. Therefore, it would shock his friends and associates to the core to realize the councillor had his own dreams and ambitions. Both of which caused him to seek out a greater patron than a weak and pitiful daimyo. Therefore, walking near the border without escort, councillor Daesuk prepared to take a hold of his destiny. Coming upon the agreed-upon meeting place, the trader did not have long to wait. Three figures appeared, as if out of thin air. Each wore facial tattoos, had cropped hair, and exuded a significant amount of confidence. Looking into their eyes, it was all the councillor could do not to shake in fear. Truly, the Jannan brothers deserved their reputation with that sort of gaze. Looking down upon the simpering coward, Renga the eldest smirked. Have you approached your compatriots with our offer? Gulping, Daesuk nodded, many are interested in new leadership. The current daimyo is soft and makes too many concessions for peace. With him in place, we will never have proper independence and authority. However, the people love him, so officially removing him without a show of force is impossible. Several key figures, including myself, are fully ready to support your control of the country, especially with the offered concessions. However, there might be a small problem. Browning, Jig of the Middle glared at the little pipsqueak. What sort of problem? Your country has practically no military strength and maybe three active ninja. That idiot leader doesn't possess anything that can stop us. Sweating, Daesuk held up a hand for peace. Perhaps, but recently one of his old allies has reappeared, a powerful healer known as the Crone of the Seed. She is a legend in these parts, and many are hesitant to attack such a prominent figure. As long as the crone is publicly linked to the daimyo's patronage, his popularity will only increase. This, in turn, will decrease the likelihood of success and improve the chances of revolt. Licking his lips, Ruga the youngest smiled at his brothers. Well now, isn't that interesting? Seiranga, I know you wanted to wait for a little bit to gain more support and information, but isn't this a golden opportunity? The crone of the seed might just be what we're looking for. Remembering the notices of the snake Sanin's bounties, the elder Jajin brother nodded. Such a prize would not only gain the money, but the notice and potential patronage to hidden sound to boot. Originally, I thought we needed the extra time to move under the radar of Kanoha, they have a minor alliance with vegetables that we had to be careful about. However, they're in chaos at the moment because of some sort of power play by the Hokage. If there was ever a perfect time to attack, it would be now. Turning to their informant, Renga unleashed a full predatory grin. Now, why don't you tell us everything about this crone and your daimyo's habits, and we'll take care of the rest, na? Joining their brother in grinning, the Jajin brothers began to dream about their future. Soon, an entire nation would be theirs to control, with wealth and power at their fingertips. Shuddering at the potential for bloodlust in those eyes, Daesuk spilled every bit of information in his arsenal. With this selfish action, he sealed the fate of both his country and himself. Grumbling, Kiba headed towards the teammate training ground. Kurinai sensei had met with his doctors the other day, confirming the dog ninja was once again cleared for training. However, Akamaru was still recovering and wouldn't be able to work for a while. Hana had only been in once more before his release and had informed Kiba the puppy wouldn't be ready for nearly a month. Being forced to return to active duty without his partner or Hinata, all managed to put Kiba in a bad mood, the kind that only a serious fight would solve. Entering the clearing, he was treated to the sight of Sakura trying to land a punch on Kurinai sensei. Snorting, Kiba already could see the team was screwed with a Kanoichi like the pink-haired Banshee. She might be a little cuter with short hair, but Sakura's technique sucked, Hinata would have tagged Kurinai sensei within five minutes at that speed. Honestly, what could that simpering little girl bring to the team? She had no clan, no special powers, and apparently no grasp on how to fight. She'd be better off working as a civilian than taking on the trouble teammate had to deal with. Pausing, Kurinai held up a hand to stop the spar. Turning to face her third team member, she let a small smile escape, welcome Kiba, I hope you are ready to get worked into the ground. We have a lot of time to recover and much to do. Letting out one of his trademark grins, Kiba scratched his nose in mild embarrassment. Don't worry, Kurinai sensei. The docs patted me right up, once Akamaru gets fully healed, we'll kick everybody's butt so hard, they won't know what hit them. Shaking her head at the bravado, the Jinjutsu mistress gestured to the gasping Hirono. I assume that you are already familiar with your new teammate. Smiles became fixed, Kiba released a small snort, of course, who doesn't know about Sasuke's number one fangirl. Seeing the slump of Sakura's shoulders, he felt a little bad. However, because of this idiot's teammate, Hinata-chan was gone, Akamaru was injured, and the Inuzukas were fighting about using his sister as a Chiha breeding stock. 
Given Kiba's rather narrow viewpoint and limited exposure to the situation, his reaction was more or less expected. Sakura simply represented the easiest target for the dog ninja's current rage. That did not mean that Kurenai-sensei was happy about her observations, just that she understood why it happened. To rebuild the teammate dynamic, each member had to prove themselves to the other. As Jonin sensei the genin automatically followed her orders. The efforts of the last month had shown Shino some of Sakura's potential, while the pink-haired Kinoichi gained a greater understanding of the quiet aburum. Theoretically, if they kept up the current intensity of training, those two would have no trouble working together for a while. However Kiba still saw Sakura as the useless fangirl of Team 7 and, coupled with his current abandonment issues, would not bond with her even under orders. Likewise, after that last barb, Sakura would be feeling defensive around the Inuzuka, causing undue stress to the group. This situation had to be corrected before any proper progress could be made. Shaking her head in resignation, Kurenai hoped she knew what she was doing. All right, I think that a proper warm-up is in order to welcome you back. Sakura, I want you to cool down a bit and loosen up, once you catch your breath, both you and Kiba need to be ready for a full contact spar. Just be careful, neither of you are at full strength. Seeing the feral look in Kiba's eyes and Sakura's nervous gulp, Kurenai had to question her sanity. However, only a proper battle between the two could build the sort of understanding they needed. Orders could only go so far, the genin had to believe in each other for this team to work. Cracking his knuckles, Kiba grinned, ready when you are, Sakura. Wiping the sweat out of her eyes, Sakura firmed her resolve, she had to do this. Otherwise, how could she prove herself worthy of being a ninja? You're on, dog boy. Ureya smirked, reading the report, ninja toads had surprisingly good penmanship. After nearly a month of surveillance, the toad sage felt prepared to attack the Danzo issue at its source. He was the major problem at the moment, by gathering independent forces outside the Hokage's purview, Danzu was committing treason. While the advisor's council had official standing within Kanoha, Danzu worked so deeply from the shadows that no one was sure of his official position anymore. Unlike Hamura and Kaharu, though, he had resources and contacts sufficient to become a major threat to village security. That simply would not do. Based upon Kasuk's reports, Root was more than active, it was thriving. Somehow that old fart had gotten his hands on a very large group of orphans and was training them into the ground. While his actual number of battle-ready ninja was still small, in another two years or so he'd have an independent Anbu level force, causing all sorts of trouble. If this sort of thing wasn't taken care of now, Danzu might try to become the next Hokage, something that could not be allowed. Sending out a carefully modulated call to arms, Jiraiya prepared his briefing. The Anbu involved had been closely screened, so there shouldn't be any sort of treachery. Also, if the advisor's council happened to be in attendance in an illegally run independent facility, he might take out two birds with one stone. Hopefully, once this route was plucked, things could start changing around here. He was seriously missing his research, the stupid crystal ball just wasn't the same. Chapter 10 Part 1. Reign of Blood. Crowning, Jiraiya addressed the assembled Anbu with the focus and ability that could be expected of a legendary ninja. This was not the time for jokes, death would follow these men and women tonight. I have been alerted to a credible threat to Kanoha's security. A separatist faction within the village ninja force is acting independently to train unregistered soldiers for their own use. By the charter of Kanoha, the leader of this group is partaking in treasonous activities that undermine the unity of the village. For that action, his life is forfeit. This mission is beyond rank, it is a fundamental aspect of your position. Are you prepared for the information? Standing at attention, the 20 elite Anbu agents did not even flinch. One did not gain the rank through stupidity or arrogance. Their training took care of such things, if their records did not. In fact, that was one of the reasons that kept the Hyuga presence within Anbu extremely low. These men and women were here to serve Kanoha, and as acting Hokage, Jiraiya had their full trust by definition. Nodding at the silence, Jiraiya began the briefing. The target's name is Danzo. At one point, he was a possible candidate for the third Hokage, but was deemed inferior to the Sandane. Instead he was put in charge of developing the Black Ops branch of Anbu, codenamed Root, training soldiers that would accomplish the darkest and dirtiest acts for the village. However, his methods were deemed too inhumane, and his unit was disbanded. Recently, evidence has been brought to my attention that he rebuilt that unit out of a group of loyalists and orphans. Right now, his numbers are manageable, but if left to develop it could be a disaster. Your mission is to incapacitate and restrain his subordinates for questioning. However, while his presence would make the information department's job a lot easier, Danzo is free game. Unless he surrenders, I want that man dead before sunrise. Is that understood? They were true Anbu, the answer was obvious, hi, Jiraiya-sama. Smirking as a show of respect, Jiraiya decided he needed more subordinates like this group. Having such a strong, respectful reaction to his orders was a nice change of pace from cries of pervert or Irosenin. 
That was definitely a project to work on once Sanadi returned. Clearing his throat, Jiraiya started making hand signs. Now then, it's time to introduce you to the intelligence officer who has managed to infiltrate Danzu's forces. Summoning Jutsu. They were Anbu, fearless and loyal, but many would state in later years that getting debriefed by a giant purple toad was the oddest point in their respective careers, at least, until the next couple of Hokages came along. Adjusting her hood, Sanadi sipped from the sake cup in satisfaction. There was nothing like relaxing after a long day with an old friend. Although the disguise was a little irritating, that was the price you had to pay for politics. With the return of the crone of the seed, everyone from nobles to farmhands seemed to be getting sick. Of course, living up to her reputation, Sanadi healed most of the issues with minimal trouble, only adding to the legend. Being the politician that he was, the daimyo was quick to capitalize upon this action and publicly patronized her efforts, gaining greater support within the country. Although she found such games distasteful, Sanadi couldn't really begrudge him the political capital. Without his sanctuary, Naruto would probably still be tripping over his own two feet. Instead, the little punk would be ready for dodging practice before too much longer. Of course, part of solidifying that support was to be associated with him as the crone. So while they shared a simple dinner as old friends, the blonde Hokage was forced to don her disguise. The whole experience was embarrassing, especially to a woman who so strongly valued her image. Appearing young was one of Tsunade's small vices, like her gambling or drinking, and being stripped of that little security blanket was almost painful. The daimyo's amusement with the situation was not helping matters at all. Really, Sanadi sama it's not that bad. So you have a few wrinkles and a bit of grey hair, it looks rather distinguished all things considered. Draining her cup, Sanadi held it out for a refill. Don't you know the rules of getting old, Daimyo-san? Men become distinguished with grey hair, while women become withered. At least I don't have perverted patients trying to grope me like this. Tuckling into his own sake, the Daimyo shook his head in admiration. What idiot would be stupid to grope you during treatment? Smiling in nostalgia at the thought of breaking pervert bones, Sanadi countered, you, my old friend, have obviously never dealt with Uraya. Before he could reply, the two were rudely interrupted by a loud crash. Getting to their feet in concern, the Daimyo and Sanadi were treated to the sight of the royal ninja flying through the door. Sanadi mentally threw out a thank you to Naruto for his help with her hemophilia, with the amount of blood and broken bones present, the attendant was obviously dead. So sorry to interrupt, but I'm afraid an official appointment was simply impossible to get. The man entering the room was clearly a ninja. Each step was confident, bordering upon arrogant, despite his slight frame. While the clothing bore no symbol, and the three purple triangle tattoos on his face were unfamiliar, the look in his eyes said it all. This was a man who enjoyed killing, power and fear. Whoever he was, the unknown ninja was definitely in trouble. Bowing in a mocking fashion, the man smiled sinisterly. I am Renga of the Janin, soon to be Daimyo of the Land of Vegetables. Remember that name Crone, for I am to be your new master. Narrowing her eyes, Sanadi prepared to strike the arrogant pup down. Oh. What makes you think that I would take orders from trash such as yourself? Cracking his neck, the sinister smile didn't even waver. Well, a little birdie told me that you have a special patient you're looking after. My younger brothers are currently going to acquire him or her and any possible guardians. Perhaps their screams will bring you to heal. If not, there are some interested buyers out there for healers at the moment. Forming a fist, Sanadi scowled, this little punk had just signed his own death warrant. Enjoying her meal after training, Hinata smiled in contentment. Soon, she would be able to utilize a brand new technique in combat conditions. Shizune Senpai had said her preparation should be ready for a test run in the next week or so. Once this move was perfected, the Hayuga failure could help protect Naruto-kun. She couldn't be happier. Biting a mouthful of rice, Hinata stiffened, what was this feeling? Ayakigan. Looking up from their own dinners, Shizune and Naruto frowned in concern. Hinata never casually activated the Byakugan. It was a taboo among the Hayuga household to utilize the technique without reason. Apparently, so many people questioned the morals of the clan that very strict rules about its practice were enforced. If Hinata was using it outside of battler training, something very bad must have happened. Eyes widening in shock, Hinata cried out, there's a dust cloud rising from the palace. Also, two strange chakra signatures of high Chun and to low Jonin rank are approaching from that direction. We might be under attack. Crowning, Shizune focused her own senses. While not as inclusive as the Byakugan, all medical ninja were forced to develop their chakra sensing ability to a much higher degree than normal. Shizun, the apprentice of Tsunade, was of course no exception to this rule. However, as she focused her senses, Shizun couldn't help but let out a gasp. Hinata was right, they were about to be attacked. Rising quickly, Shizun reached for her weapons pouches, removed after their afternoon practice. Hinata, you and I are going to intercept them in the field. We are more familiar with this territory from our training over the last few weeks. 
It's not ideal, but both of our styles rely upon facing an opponent in an open area. Naruto, you are to stay here and if we fall, run towards the castle to get Tsunade Sama. Jumping up in anger, Naruto snarled, like hell I am. I can fight just as well as you two, and three on two is much safer than two on two. I won't just abandon either of you. Blushing, Hinata was moved by his passion. Unfortunately, Shizun was not. Naruto, you have barely gotten a hold of your chakra, and your hand-eye coordination still needs work, let alone your tojutsu. Hinata and I have worked together extensively since your training began and know each other's style sufficiently to stand a chance. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, but in your current state you would still get in the way. Please stay here and escape when you can, your safety is our first priority. Activating her by Akigen, Hinata frowned, the enemy was almost upon them. Shizun senpai Seeing the stubborn face that had mastered the Rasengan in a week, Shizun sighed, please forgive me, Naruto-kun. Quickly forming the hand seals, she leapt at the surprised Jinchuriki, hand outstretched. Before he could do a thing, Naruto found himself prone on the floor, jerking uncontrollably. Shaking her head, Shizun looked at the young ninja in sorrow. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, but this is the best that I can do. This is the same technique that Tsunade used against Kabuto, scrambling your nervous system temporarily. It's not as strong though, so you should be able to move around in about 20 minutes. As soon as you regain your motor control, please run to Tsunade-sama. Either we will have dealt with the problem by then, or we will need her to rescue us. Let's go Hinata. Looking at her crush in concern, Hinata followed Shizun with a frown on her face. Exiting their home, Hinata and Shizun were treated to the side of the opposition. Both were dressed in a similar fashion, possessing a clear family resemblance. The shorter one was stocky, with red claw-like tattoos covering his face. The thinner subject, though, had two teardrops and a blue triangle on his chin. However, both exuded a strong bloodlust and arrogance that shook the Kanoichi to their cores. Clearly, they had a serious fight on their hands. Cracking his knuckles, the shorter ninja stepped forward without fear. Greetings ladies, I'm afraid that you will be going down for the glory of the Janin brothers, right Ruga? Twirling a tonfa menacingly, the taller one smirked evilly. Of course, Jiga, they will fetch a fine price, injured or not. Let's show them what we can do. Afterwards, we can look through their scrolls and possessions without fear. Thinking of Naruto-kun, trapped in the house helpless, Hinata leapt forward without hesitation. There was no time to think, she had to protect him. Running through the hidden tunnel system, the various Anbu agents couldn't help but be awed by the scope of the complex. To construct such a facility without the standard forces finding out was a monumental task. However, keeping and maintaining its very existence as a secret was downright frightening. If Danzo had the connections, personnel and resources to pull off such a feat, he was someone to respect if nothing else. Clearly, this was not going to be an easy assignment. Following the information provided by Kasuk, the squad of Anbu split into groups of ten. The first group proceeded to mark each known entrance to the underground lair with barrier seals. No matter what happened today, what this operation route would be finished. Of course, they hoped that this last resort would not be needed, but as Anbu they had to plan for any possibility. The second group gathered around the primary entrance to the lower levels. This was where the training and development of Root was carried out. This was where the threat would be finished. Two of the Anbu seal masters stepped forward, preparing their tools. With practiced ease, a three-part matrix was quickly inscribed over the entrance. One part negated any radiating elements from the entrance, preventing security seals from activating. A second level effectively turned the entire door into an exploding tag, allowing quick and easy entrance. The final level, however, focused and directed the force of the blast, preventing injury to the attacking force. Signaling their preparations were complete, both stood back, waiting for the operation to start. Four of the remaining Anbu began making hand seals, staying silent. Soon, twelve clones made from mud, and another four made apparently from wood, stood next to their counterparts. With this initial force, they could maximize their efforts, despite their limited numbers. Plus, with Tenzu's special abilities, capturing enemy ninja without killing them would be significantly simplified. Positioning themselves near the entrance, both Tenzu and a cat-faced Anbu, leaders of their respective squads, signaled to begin. Nodding, the seal masters made a series of hand seals before slamming their palms against the intricate brush strokes. With their action, the entrance did not so much explode as disintegrate. Moving quickly, the various clones proceeded to act as vanguard before the Anbu followed, leaving two members as a final line of defense. As soon as the other group was finished with their preparations, the infiltration team would have their backup. However, this assumed that nothing would go wrong. Moving quickly, the Anbu began sealing rooms and looking for targets. They were soldiers with a mission, and no matter what the odds, nothing would permit them to fail. Blood would spill, lives would be lost, but Kanoha would not fall. Dodging from side to side, Shizun wondered how things had gotten so out of control. 
Hinata had taken a preemptive shot at the shorter ninja, while she was left with the skinny one. Although somewhat reckless, dividing their strength was a valid battle tactic, so there was no major issue with the younger girl's behavior. However as the resident Jonin, it was her responsibility to ensure the two Chunin safety. Therefore, not being able to deal with them quickly was grating on her nerves. Tsunade Sama's state was barely a concern, she was a Sanin and could handle herself. However, as a medical ninja, straight combat was not her strength. While Shizun was technically more powerful than her opponent, he clearly outclassed her in killing intent and offensive technique. Most of her Tejutsu knowledge and medical techniques were negated by his Tanfa, while her projectiles were dealt with by his secondary elemental abilities. Spitting out another stream of poison needles, she bit back a curse at the streams of water deflecting the attack. Despite her irritation, the medic had to applaud his unique skills. Such a technique required specialized ninjutsu, A, or absurd control training. Jumping in close, Ruga smirked sinisterly at the brunette. Aren't you getting tired of fighting the inevitable? Neither of you two are a match for us, so you might as well give up now. Once our big brother gets your mistress, we'll have all the time in the world to figure out what to do with you. Not to mention the fun we could have with your patient there. The longer this goes on, the more creative we will be inclined to be. Shivering at the look in his eyes, Shizun released a cloud of poisonous gas, causing the younger brother to back off, cursing. Betting some distance, Shizun narrowed her eyes in anger. Listen here scum, there is no way I am letting you anywhere near us, or Naruto-kun. So either surrender or I will be forced to end you. Do I make myself clear? Sighing, Ruga lifted his tonfa in resignation. Of course the patient is a guy. What else could he possibly be? Very well you little worm, prepare to die. Swinging the weapons as dosing rods, the younger Jan and brother directed water projectiles at his opponent with abandon. So what if she died? The little medic's corpse could tell nearly as much as her mind could. Cursing, Shizun thanked Sanadi sama for her training and dodging. Any good medic learned how to avoid attacks, if only to conserve their strength to heal patients. While the attack was fast, she was able to bend and flow around the rhythm of her opponent's technique with little trouble. More importantly by being focused upon his attack, Ruga left his defense open. Drawing her arm holster into position, Shizun released a barrage of needles, breaking his offensive with another curse. This action left the two at an impasse. Shizun was a mid to long range fighter, with a limited arsenal of short range attacks. However, the amount of time they took to perform made the techniques untenable in this fight. Ruga was a close to mid-range fighter, with excellent reflexes that negated most of her offensive weapons. However, his techniques lacked the speed and precision to take Shizun out. With their respective techniques cancelling out one another, a stalemate developed that neither side wanted to deal with. Focusing her chakra, Shizun prayed, stay safe Inada, Naruto. This fight is going to take a while. Focusing on their task, Jiraiya's Anbu team sealed another room with Tenzu's molten techniques, the enemies knocked unconscious. Any root operative so far had been mid chunin at most, thus easily subdued. Mindful of the threats of traps and security measures, each opponent had their chakra network sealed temporarily, before being bound with wire and a force sleep ninjutsu. No, these paltry forces were no problem for elite Anbu. The other residents of the complex were another story. Every other room seemed to hold injured, discarded bodies of failed root trainees. Most had been left to die, lying on cots with blank expressions. These surviving children could not have been more than 15 at the oldest. Often, they suffered from advanced chakra burns, broken bones, and severe lacerations. Many had not received food or water for days. Those were the lucky ones. The unlucky ones ranged from 10 to 17 years old. Their rooms were significantly colder, and their injuries less obvious. Many seemed peaceful, almost smiling under the preservation seals. These were the dead failures, kept for spare parts or convenient models for medical studies. Unfortunately, to ensure no surprises, each room of corpses had to be studied and searched before they could proceed. While well, these were Anbu, soldiers who killed their feelings and emotions for the good of Konoha, many of them had never seen horror on such a scale before. However, the number of medically trained Anbu was so small it was criminal. While many of them knew a few basic medical procedures, none of the Anbu had the chakra or stamina to fulfill the mission and save the root failures. The best that they could do was put them to rest and seal the entrance to protect the injured. Knowing the realities of life, the majority realized that, by the end of the mission, many of those injured kids would be dead, and there was nothing to be done except move faster. As they proceeded, several of the Anbu pondered the honor left in their village if such atrocities were supported by one in power. While they would follow orders to the letter and were completely loyal to the Hokage, only now did many of them begin to understand Sanadi's decision. If she or someone she cared for were threatened by such a man, it was only good sense to remove themselves from the battlefield. If those in power followed allowed such actions, then they would be her sword to remove them. Burrowing into the core of Root, these soldiers made a decision. 
a leader who called for the destruction of such horror was one they would support with their whole heart and soul. Be it Sanadi or Jiraiya, they would remain loyal to their Hokage. Helping the development of a Jinchuriki was a small quirk, all things considered, and easily endured. However, no matter what tricks Danzu might try to pull, that bastard would end this night. Seeing the more experienced root members gathering to attack, the clone squad moved as one. The sooner that this mission ended, the sooner they could bring medical help and bathe. After something like this, any ninja would feel unclean, and were not. Taking a deep breath, the pink-haired Kinoichi centered herself after taking a soldier pill. Kiba might be strong and dangerous, but he had lost to a sealed Naruto and didn't have Akimaru. If she managed to maintain her cool, this match might not be a total slaughter. Although weaker than the dog ninja, Sakura was most definitely smarter and knew it. She couldn't afford to lose after all of that hard work. Boy, are we going to fight? Or do you need to put on some makeup? Glaring at the smirking boy in front of her, Sakura cracked her knuckles. That little runt was going down. Staring at the two opponents, Kurinai again questioned her sanity in promoting such a fight. It might simplify things for the team, but sending a Genin team member to the hospital so quickly after getting them was bad form. Kiba would win, but victory wasn't the point. Proving that Sakura had some potential to the other team members was. She wouldn't be a true replacement for Hinata, but Sakura was all that they had. If the team couldn't function because Kiba or Shino thought she was weak, none of them would manage a D-rank mission, let alone progress to Chunin. So, sitting with the Aburam, the Jinjutsu mistress waited for the fight to begin, calculating the odds with both success and failure. Apparently tired of waiting, Kiba decided not to waste any time. Focusing chakra to his legs, the Inuzuka launched himself at the pink-haired fangirl with about half his full speed. That was about four times the intensity he had seen Sakura struggle with mere moments ago and should end things quickly. In fact, if he hurried, he might even manage to get a proper spar out of Shino. This fight wasn't going to accomplish anything except waste his time, so why go all out? Imagine his shock when Sakura dodged easily. Surprised, mutt boy. Kurinai sensei has been sparring with me for nearly three hours. After a quick recharge, I can go a lot faster than what you saw. Snarling at the insult, Kiba increased his speed accordingly. No one talked down to him and got away with it. Sakura kept her cool, though, and quickly formed hand seals. Three clones formed right next to her, before the group each removed a kunai. Splitting up, each Sakura seemed to send Chakra to their legs, accelerating around her opponent. This was the same trick that confused Ino in the Chunin exams, except, in the forest, Sakura was free to send both herself and the clones to jump off the various trees around the clearing. The tactic was simple, elementary and very effective. In fact, about half of the graduating class might be fooled for a minute or two. Kiba lasted 10 seconds. Lashing out with a vicious haymaker, Kiba caught the real Sakura under the chin, launching her across the sparring space and dispelling the clones in one move. Please, Sakura, that was just sad. I'm an Inuzuka, you stupid bimbo. I could smell the real you within moments after that was completed, so don't even try such weak techniques against me. Unfortunately, due to a negligent sensei, those weak techniques were all that Sakura had to fight with at the moment. Hearing Kiba launch himself at her again, Sakura executed a quick replacement technique, hiding in the tree behind his last position. Seeing the tree branch rip to shreds in a second, she pulled out another kunai. This was going to be a long fight. Lying on the floor, all Naruto could feel was betrayal. He had worked so hard to get stronger, but Shizun Nichan wouldn't even give him the chance to prove himself. Sure she might know more about fighting than he did, but that didn't mean that he was a burden. Growing up, the blonde ninja had never felt so strong or confident. But what was the point if those he cared for didn't believe in him? Well, actually Hinata-chan seemed to want my help. But Shizun Nichan overruled her. Naruto had always been alone and often had trouble relying upon others. Learning teamwork under Kakashi was actually one of the most difficult things he had ever accomplished. Day in and day out growing up, he had to take care of himself to ensure his survival. Sure, the Hokage might treat him to Raymond occasionally, and Ichiraku was always a special home to him, but no one else seemed to care. More importantly than the status he had given him, Naruto loved being a ninja because it meant he had comrades to rely on and those who could rely on him. Shizune Nichan's actions seemed to say she couldn't trust him and that hurt more than he could have believed. However, he wasn't the most unpredictable ninja of Konoha for nothing. With all of the stress and the inability to move, Naruto was forced to use a recently discovered power. He actually began to think things through. Okay, so she said that the technique would wear off after 20 minutes, right? That means that it's just a chakra thing, not a permanent thing like those limiter seals. The time limit is probably from the amount of time my own chakra will take to break down her technique. So maybe, if I focus my chakra, I can get up faster. So let's see. It was hard, but like Kabuto before him, Naruto quickly tried moving every part of his body to figure out the rewiring. 
Trying to move the left leg shifted his right hand, his right knee twitched his right foot and so on. While he didn't have the controller experience to use his full range in battle like Kabuto could, that wasn't what he was aiming for. Figuring out the right combination of twitches, Naruto managed to form a seal and began focusing his chakra. With his advanced training, intense focus, and unmatched will, Naruto broke the technique within 15 seconds, a full 10 minutes early. Readjusting his senses to normal, the blonde ninja grabbed a kunai. He might not have the raw chakra control to summon one shadow clone, but if there was an attack, summoning a thousand of them would probably be alright at this point. Heading towards the door, Naruto stepped through the front door ready to fight, an action that would change his life and those around him forever. Hinata was outmatched and she knew it. Although he looked rather pudgy, Jiga of the Janin was actually quite fast and extremely strong. Despite her ability in Jukin, the normally quiet Hyuga was hesitant to get in close after seeing her opponent crater the ground with his punches. Trying to get some distance, she threw a brace of kunai and shuriken to buy some time. That was when she made an unwelcome discovery. Skin changing color, Jiga simply held up an arm and all of the weapons rushed to attach themselves. Changing back, the various projectiles fell to the ground without leaving a single scratch. Noting her shock, the ninja smirked, surprised, you little ant. I've been eating iron since I was a boy and can control any iron with magnetism as a result. Your weapons are useless against me. Looking through her by Akigen, Hinata saw the level of chakra manipulation the technique took and was shocked by its efficiency. Jiga could maintain the magnetic field for hours without a major strain and could switch it off in an instant. While his defense could technically be breached by the Jukin, his body was reinforced by the existing iron in his blood, minimizing the damage he could accomplish. Even locking the technique on or off could only last about 20 minutes and wouldn't accomplish much in a field full of flowers. What was she going to do? Seeing the fear in her eyes, Jiga began to laugh. Breaking spirits, gaining power, generating fear, these were the true wonders of being a ninja. Now to twist the knife just a bit more and watch that fear become despair. Ah, so you're one of those famed Hyuga fighters from Konoha, aren't you? God you're pathetic. If this is the might of the Hyuga, we probably could have taken over Konoha instead of this backwater. Ah well, once you and your friends are taken down, who knows what the future might bring. I'm sure that once we capture your patient, you'll be much more pliable and a perfect specimen to sell to Kumo, especially after the little jerk starts screaming. Anada had been degraded for most of her life. Told to give up, that she was weak, that she was useless, insults against her world hat by now. However, Jiga made a mistake in his taunts. He threatened the safety of Naruto, the one person that Hinata cared for above all others. To threaten someone who doesn't care for their own well-being is one thing, but to threaten their most precious person on top of that. He clearly had rocks for brains. Seeing the determination in her eyes, Jiga scowled. Where had that come from? No matter, he would simply have to wipe that look from her face in one blow. Channeling his magnetic abilities into one arm, Jiga punched into the earth before drawing a lump of metal nearly one meter in diameter. Well, if you think you can beat me, try this on for size. Earth style. Great iron dumpling. Using the extracted iron with his chakra, Jiga threw it at the startled Hyuga. Once she dodged, he could simply zip behind her and knock her out during the distraction. Anada saw the incoming projectile and knew she couldn't hold back. It might not be ready, but if she gave in now, Naruto-kun would be hurt. That could not happen. Channeling her chakra, she began to sharpen and focus the energy into her palms. Moving faster and faster, a solid web of energy seemed to form in front of her. Knowing that would not be enough, Hinata poured her entire heart and soul into the technique. A second before the iron ball made contact, she desperately called out the technique's name, praying for success. Guardian 8 Divination Signs, 64 Palms. The iron ball tried to force itself past her defense, but couldn't manage to overcome the focused rotational deflection. To the shock of Janin, his own attack was sent flying right back at his face. Instinctively, he activated his magnetic abilities, but the kinetic force was too great. Despite the armor-like properties his metallic skin gave him, Jiga was still knocked off his feet by the intensity of the impact. Gasping in exhaustion, Hinata dropped to one knee. The Guardian technique was one designed to repel or deflect attacks from prone targets. Since the force was so focused, the deflection force was actually superior to the traditional Katen rotation. However, the required chakra control and flexibility were insane and had nearly ripped her arms from their sockets. But the moment to recover, though, she should be able to fight again at full strength. Unfortunately, ninja battles were rarely so kind. Getting back up, Jiga was murderous. Reaching into his pack he withdrew a set of kunai, flinging them at the Hayuga with reckless abandon. Forcing herself to stand, Hinata began the deflection technique once again. However, there were two problems with this action. One, the kunai were not aimed at her, they were aimed at her legs. Two, each kunai knife had an exploding tag attached to its end. 
the resulting force blew Hinata off her feet, almost knocking her out on the door of the hut. Glaring at the wide-eyed bitch, Jiga growled, you think that I'm going to forgive this? Forget what Big Brother wants. I'm going to get in there, find this guy, and rip him to pieces right in front of you. Then, we'll sell you to be a baby factory, right after ripping your eyes out to sell separately. That'll teach you to mess with Jiga of the Janin. Blood pounding in her ears, Hinata focused her by Akigan with everything she had. Even as blood vessels popped, she did not care. This, this thing was threatening something precious to her. Even if she failed at everything else in her life, the normally shy Hayuga would not fail now. This wasn't for her, or to keep the Byakugan out of Kumo, she had to defeat this monster to save Naruto-kun. Even if it cost her life, Jiga would die. Seeing the ninja in front of her moving, once again protected by his metallic skin technique, Hinata concentrated every ounce of vision on her enemy. Getting to her feet, she once again focused her chakra to her palms. Breathing in deeply, the normally shy Hayuga rushed forward, moving faster than any other point in her life. Interestingly enough, with the normally 359-degree vision of the Byakugan focused upon a single point, each pathway of the opponent's chakra network lit up like the sun. She could almost determine Jiga's actions from the subtle flex and shift of his energy to feed the metal skin. Although if she could read his movements, then she could stop him. For the first time in her history, Hinata unleashed her full rage at an opponent. Never before had she fought with such hatred, and for a single moment, she wallowed in it. Getting under Jiga's guard, Hinata accidentally developed a new technique. Pity the recipient was in no position to admire the beauty of it. Growling with each hit, Hinata sent out beams of chakra, forward this time to attack, instead of using them to deflect, striking the pathways around the herd directly. You shall not touch Naruto-kun. Die. With each enraged word, Hinata unleashed a deadly attack that liquefied sections of the heart's chakra pathways. Five hits completely destroyed the organ, while the sixth and final attack blew the remaining gore through Jiga's back like a squashed tomato. Staring at nothing, the Iron Ninja fell, shaking the earth with his passing. Dropping in exhaustion, Hinata could barely breathe. Before, she had always managed to disable any opponent she faced or allowed her teammates to deal with them. But this time, she had fought to kill and enjoyed the act. With her new power, the normally kind Hayuga had managed to defeat her enemy with precision, even if it lacked the emotionless mints that many Hayuga sought. She had lost control and had taken her first life. She felt sick. Hinata-chan. Forcing herself to stand, Hinata turned, seeing a surprised Naruto standing in the doorway. Naruto was shocked beyond normal speech and with a kid like him that saying something. When he had opened the door, the normally hyperactive ninja had expected a situation where the others were winning but needed some help. However, watching Hinata-chan deflect a metal boulder into her opponent's face was just shocking. Yukin had never seemed so violent, even when Niji used it to beat him senseless, and the technique was not something he ever thought Hinata-chan could pull off so easily. She looked really amazing, and he couldn't help but notice his heart beating somewhat faster. However, the second technique made her first attack seem like nothing. With only six palm strikes, Hinata had literally blown her opponent's heart to pieces. Now as a ninja, Naruto was used to death and had dealt with it several times already. Even acknowledging Hinata as a nice girl, he didn't fail to remember the truth of their shared profession. They were ninja and would be expected to kill. Perhaps her method had been a little bloody for a Hayuga, but Hinata's killing of the enemy didn't really faze him. It was the fact she did so well screaming she would protect him. No one had ever killed to protect him that he could remember. Oh, Naruto had seen others fight for his safety. Hiruka had nearly lost his life against Mizuki, preventing him from dying. Sanadi had taken a sword to the chest to protect him from Orochimaru. Even Sasuke had taken hits for him, both from Haku and Gara, But each had their own motivations and ideals outside of just his life, and that tempered the feeling somewhat. Hinata, however, had fought to kill not because they were comrades, but because he was Naruto. It shook him deeply in the core of his being and unknowingly pushed Hinata forward on his list of important people. It was easy to die for someone, killing for them was an entirely different Balgam. Keenly aware that Shizune Nichan had just finished off the second opponent during that moment of surprise, Naruto started slowly walking towards the Hyuga heiress. Calling out her name again, getting a feeling for each syllable that defined one of his now dearest friends, Naruto was jolted by her sudden attention. The girl was nearly as short as him, appearing so frail and delicate, stared at first her hands and then his eyes. The happiness held there at his presence startled him, bringing only one word to his mind. Beautiful. Stepping forward herself, the tired Hayuga let loose a smile that seemed to blow Sakura's out of the water. Naruto-kun. Oh thank goodness you're safe. Cutting off, the little Kanoichi opened her mouth in almost comical surprise, before falling forward like a puppet with her strings cut. Oops, maybe I should have waited a moment. Looking over to the edge of the clearing, Naruto couldn't quite grasp the reality at hand. Hinata, someone who had already done so much for him, had fallen with a kunai on her back. 
arms still outstretched, a final enemy appeared before the two remaining ninja, his evil smile at odds with the number of apparent injuries he sported. Well, it looks like my luck just improved. While my idiot brothers might have fallen, I still get a healer's apprentice, an unsealed Hayuga, and a hostage. Not to mention any scrolls that stupid crone kept here. Stepping forward, the taller ninja barely spared a glance at the fallen comrades dispatched by Shizun and Hinata. I think that it's time to take charge of the situation, na? I hope you enjoyed the warm-up because compared to those weaklings I, Renga of the Janin, am much more dangerous. Done, done, done. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.